folk, whom, despite his faults, had still died with his honor intact. Could any of us really ask for more, Balis? Death, my lord, or duty? The valet had begun to run a bath, a pleasant steam rising off the surface of the water. Thin of frame and face, Balis had the plain features of a commoner, but there was nobility in his bearing. An old man now, greyed around the edges, he still went about his service with alacrity and purpose. Either, both, I'm not sure I discerned the difference. Regara had stripped down to his uniform leggings and shirt sleeves, the rest of his attire slung upon the back of a chair for Balis to tidy and iron. As the tub slowly filled, Regara reached for his gadulka. He held the thin neck of the instrument pinched lightly between the fingers of his left hand, its bowl nestled into his lap, the right hand taking up the bow. Would you mind? he asked. It will carry across the camp as you go about your duties. Far from it, sir, Barlis replied with genuine enthusiasm. You play beautifully. You're my valet, not my flatterer, Barlis. It's true he said. I have little ear for music. Regara laughed and felt a lightness that had eluded him for weeks. Balis bowed, removing the major's uniform from the chair and taking it with him as the lilting refrain of the gadulka played him out. As Regara plied the bow across the strings, he teased long, lingering notes into the evening air, a sorrowful legato to echo his mood. I never tire of listening to you play. Though he looked up at his unannounced visitor, Regara did not stop. He maintained the pitch, the shifting of his fingers and the angle of the bow, a careful choreography that drew out a gentle threnody for the dead. Barbastian took a seat and patiently waited for the musician to finish. I am out of practice said Regara gruffly, placing the instrument in its case. It takes me back, though, Vasquez, to the old days. He had a bottle and two goblets. Regara raised an eyebrow. Is that the fifty-five? Part of a commemorative batch distilled for Slado's interment as war master from De Vere's private stock. Well, well, Philip. Regara took a proffered goblet and let Barbastian pour a measure. Regara inhaled deeply, relishing the flavor, and held up his drink for the toast. Old friends, said Barbastian. His eyes flashed in the firelight, gratefully reunited. Regara nodded, a little reluctant but relenting. Old friends. He took a pull, smacking his lips and sucking through his teeth. He blew out a breath. That's bloody magnificent. I thought you'd approve, Barbastian gestured to the bath. I'm not disturbing you. The door was open. Not at all. Balis leaves it that way. He knows I like the night air. He gestured to the steaming tub. I think he must use a flamer on the water, though. It's bloody unbearable, unless I let it stand for an hour first. Barbastian laughed. It was a good sound. A fine valley. He is, Regara agreed. Been in my service for decades. A long time. And that is why you're here, Philip, to recount old times? I don't really know why I'm here, Vasquez he said, getting up out of the chair and walking over to where Regara's phonogram sat on his desk. I have one of these. He slid his fingers across the polished wood, tracing lines and angles. I've heard they're popular amongst the officer class. Barbastian half turned to look at Regara. Have you ever recorded anything on the cylinder? Speeches, briefings? That sort of thing. He smiled. Your music? Regara shrugged. Now and again. There was a moment of companionable silence between them before Barbastian said, I have missed this. Then his expression grew more serious. And 
I am sorry for the deception. Ah, said Regara, leaning back in his chair. So we come to it then. An assuaging of guilt. If that's the case, you can leave the bottle. Take the bloody bottle for all I care. Hit a nerve, didn't I? You're an obstinate man, Vasquez, and you hold a grudge like a damn greenskin. Regara did not deny it, but his feigned insouciance faded. I seek amends, that's all. Barbastian's sudden edges softened as he lifted his goblet. A friend in the war. You remember those? Barely. He chinked his goblet with Barbastian's and felt the bad blood between them ebb. Would you play another, a little less mournful, perhaps? Every man is a critic, Regara replied, but a wry smile pulled at the corner of his mouth. He began, a frenetic staccato that saw the bow dancing like light across the strings. And then they heard the explosion from deeper in the camp, and all thought of music ended. Grice staggered as his head snapped sideways, blood painted canvas in a red arc. He dodged the next blow, a hammer aimed at his bludgeoned face. One eye had swollen shut, gummed with blood. He reeled, frantically backpedaling, trying to find room. Drake and Resk hollered from the sidelines, shouting instructions, warnings. He tried a counterswing, but his impaired depth perception saw the blow cut air. His opponent's reply was savage, pummeling the body until it resembled tenderized meat. Grice tried to use his arms to shield himself, but they sagged like leaden weights, and he fell. One knee hit the floor, and he made the fatal sin of using his hand to support his weary frame. An overhead swing crashed into his shoulder like a pendulum, and he crumpled all the way down this time, until his face touched blood-stained canvas. Kulkis had stopped halfway through the crowd, more like a baying mob by now, a sea of roaring blue bloods urging their man to rise, to fight, for honor, for pride, and all that hollow sentiment that soldiers cleave to in their darkest moments. Kulkis had become entangled by it, wading through the bloodthirsty throng. He heard Rake, a shout like the peal of a bell, so singular and loud that it pierced the static. It made him turn, stop. Grice had fallen. Thrown, he looked like hammered shit, his black and purpled flesh marking out continents of pain on the map of his battered body. He considered turning back, or heading for the ring itself. Hanmar had left his seat, the corpsman reacting by instinct. An injured man, a comrade, in need of his arts. They had to drag Grice back into his corner, a stumbling, punch-drunk mess that refused to yield. They fed powdered stims up his nose, and he brightened fiercely, a sudden jolt that tripped his heart like a circuit and got him on his feet again. Hanmar was arguing with the others, Rake holding the corpsman back, whilst Dresk shouted into Grice's ear, but the large man kept shaking his head, determined to carry on. It was more than just the fiftieth. It was the blue blood's honor that was on the table. Volponi glory. Stop this, Colchis murmured, and even the crowd around him had simmered as if sensing something. The Agrians roared all the more, and a few Volponi began shoving their mouthy arrivals, turning their impotence for the fate of their kinsmen into anger. The cooler heads of the line officers wisely intervened, but the thread binding the two sides together was fraying. The clarion chimed. Grice got three steps out from his corner and stumbled. His opponent looked unscathed, the brawny Cossack like a pillar of rockcrete, tan skin like beaten leather, a beard that trailed down his chest like a hangman's rope. He had a foot or more on Grice and several inches across the shoulders, an anvil of a man, and just as unyielding, just as pitiless. He had tempered Grice, the Volpone's champion, and now he would break him. Ensnared by the spectacle as much as the men around him, a terrifying thought seized Kulkis by the throat and made it hard to breathe. What if it's revenge? 
Uzra's death had not been atoned for, and no culprit had been found. The Agrians wanted justice, but they would take retribution instead. It didn't matter whom. Searching the crowd, Tulkis found no sign of Makali, so he had no idea if the Golover had orchestrated any of this. Finding anyone in the unruly mass would have been difficult. Even De Vere's had been swallowed by it. Grice fumbled his footing again, a slip that saw him almost fall. He got up by himself, but unsteadily, his eyes apparently far away as he looked to a horizon only he could see. After one further step, the referee intervened with a hand on the sergeant's chest. Grice scowled, ineffectively batting away the referee's hand with sluggish sweeps of his gloved fists. The Cossack, meanwhile, waited patiently, a killer dormant in the oak of his body, poised to act. Colchis found himself heading downwards, whilst the tension grew below as it did above. He reached the ring quickly, making far better progress when not fighting to cut across the tide. It was hot under the lights, and men sweated in their stripped-down uniforms. The stink of blood and body odour was heady, nauseating. Grice was swearing, but slurring his words like a drunkard. Emperor's bloody mercy, Rake, Colchis snapped. How did you let it get this far? Rake and his cousin Dresk looked pale as Valhallen snow. He's stubborn when his mind is made up, sir. Taming a Balgren would be easier, Dresk cut in. Colchis ignored them, moving on to Hanmar, who had managed to get Grice to sit down so he could assess his condition. He's barely sensible, Grice was murmuring, incoherent. Up close, the punishment to his body looked much worse. He was stitched together with thread and scraps of ruddy gauze. But he pleaded, in the fleeting moments of lucidity, the one eye he could still open, saying, Please, let me fight. Kulkis laid a hand on the big man's shoulder. It was hot like fire to the touch, and gently shook his head. Any more of this, sergeant, and it'll be the morgue, not the medicae. I can't allow it. Honor be damned, said the lieutenant. I'm ending this now. He turned, about to call over the referee when Captain Aramis intervened. I propose a substitution, she uttered simply, having made her way down from the upper tiers during the furore. The referee frowned. Take him out, sub me in, said Aramis, elaborating on the point. She had begun to unbutton her uniform shirt, revealing a vest underneath. Only now did Kulkis realize she had brought her adjutant with her, and he had a pair of padded gloves hooked over his shoulder by the strings. Ioni, he started to say, but she cut him off. You address me as Captain, she said firmly, but without anger. Captain, Kulkis corrected. You can't mean to do this. Aramis spoke to Colchis, but looked at the referee as the adjutant started to wrap her hand. Militarum Pugilism Code states that if the opponent agrees, then a substitute may stand in for another fighter if they are unfit to participate. Substitution is usually before a fight, not during, said the referee, clearly awkward at being spoken to by a woman officer. That's not explicit in the code, said Aramis as her other hand was bound. The referee looked to Colchis, desperate for some help and unsure how to handle the situation, but the lieutenant had no leverage. Please reconsider, he said. Aramis pulled on a glove, her adjutant lacing it. I do not require rescuing, lieutenant. She donned the second glove and it was pulled tight. Not by any man. Then she stepped up, tying her hair back, making her intentions clear to the Agrians who watched with amusement. Well then, the referee shrugged, effectively putting the question to the other side. In a rare moment of emotion, the hulking Agrian smiled and nodded. Aramis entered the ring with a deft sort of grace that suggested she was born to it. Her second, a man Colchis had since learned was called Hennessy, looked calm but had an edge of apprehension, like he was holding his breath. Grice had been wheeled away on an old ammo cart, rake and dresk pulling, 
Han Ma staying with them all the way to the Medicaid. Up in the stands, neither De Vere's nor any of his cohort had made any sort of move. Kolkis sensed the general wanted this as much as any of the Volponi stunned into abrupt silence. Even the Agrians had simmered, though a few made snide comments, gesturing to the obvious mismatch in the ring. She had to crane her neck to meet the Agrian's gaze, a child regarding a giant. It was like a fable brought to life. But Aramis looked far from intimidated as the referee laid out the rules of the contest. They broke apart, Aramis calmly retreating into her corner. Kulkis caught her eye. He must have looked deathly pale, and she winked at him. He'll kill her, he thought. He'll kill her, and all this will turn to madness. The clarion sounded. Aramis quickly advanced, body low to present a smaller target. She weaved aside from a desultory right hook, planting a trio of rapid body blows into the Agrian's left side. He weathered them with barely a grimace, a shoulder barge pushing Aramis back onto her heels and off balance, so she barely dodged the follow-up swing. Kulkis saw the veneer of quiet confidence slip. Seizing his advantage, the Agrian pressed his attack, a flurry of blows that rained against air, but one glanced Aramis's shoulder and she staggered. A roar erupted from one part of the crowd as the rest held their breath or looked to their officers to intercede, but there was nothing De Vere's or any of them could do. They had allowed Aramis to commit to this course. She would have to see it through. The Agrian moved well for such a large man, his long strides covering the expanse of the ring easily and quickly. It severely impeded Aramis's advantage in speed, though she slipped in close to land a pair of jabs to the right flank. He let out a grunt, his movement slightly stiffening, but otherwise appeared unaffected. He flung her back, using his bulk and superior strength to boss her around. She was ready for it this time and danced away and out of danger. A haymaker veered close, its passage disturbing a strand of hair, a second swing followed the first, the Agrian putting in more effort, his face pinched with pain and then turned to stone again. Maybe she did hurt him. Then came a third swing, a thunderous cannon of a punch that Aramis had to use both forearms to block. She cried out, skidding backwards on the canvas, half slipping on Grice's still drying blood. Scenting weakness, the Agrian came for her, an overhead followed by an uppercut that she barely dodged. A rapid return jab caught him in the solar plexus and elicited a sharp grunt. He backed up a step, breathing hard. A cut above Aramis's left eye bled a jagged line down the side of her face, but she kept her eyes on the Agrian, who came on again as relentless as a storm, exerting his strength and superior size just as he had done with Grice. Unlike Grice, Aramis didn't try to compete in an arena where she was obviously outmatched. She ducked away again, skipping sideways, looping under the heavy blows that rattled like pistons, trembling the air. She landed another jab, finding a way inside the Agrian's immense reach, sharp and quick like a sting. He winced, a bruise rapidly blossoming in the place where she had struck. She darted back before he could counter. The clarion sounded, ending the round. Aramis returned to her corner, breathing hard and beaded with sweat. Hennessy mopped the blood off her face and tended to the cut above her eye. You've made your point, said Colchis. Stop this. I don't much care if you outrank me. What will it prove when this ends in your death? What part of I don't need saving did you fail to understand, Colchis? she said, staring down her opponent, who looked a little ragged himself. As his seconds rebound the wrappings on his hands and lathered unguents on his bruised ribs, Kulkis could tell the Agrian was reappraising the other fighter. You've played your cards now, Kulkis continued. You won't be a surprise to him any more. He knows what to expect. Aramis held off the cloth, wiping the blood from her face, so she could turn and look Kulkis in the eye. Who said I had played any of my cards, Lieutenant? 
Colchis shook his head. This is insane. You're going to get yourself killed. And then this entire place will go off like an incendiary. Then you'd best be ready for when it does, she replied, as the clarion sounded again and the second round began. The Agrian swept in hard with a flurry of jabs that Aramis struggled to weather. She evaded well. The one punch scraped her shoulder and she dropped it just a fraction. A savage cross sailed by her head again, but rather than backpedal out, she crept in, inside the Agrian's guard. His arm pistoned like it was spring-loaded, but wrapped across the back of Aramis's neck, a wet slap of flesh instead of the bone-shattering impact he had aimed for. She shuffled around the Agrian's body, letting his momentum carry him off balance with the ferocity of the failed cross. And then she struck, unloading a flurry of heavy jabs into the bruised ribs so fast it made it hard to count. A yelp of pain escaped his lips, panic slowly contorting his features. Aramis chained her punches, the flurried jabs blending into a sharp cross that struck her opponent across the jaw, opening him up as his guard collapsed, and a viper-fast hook hit his face even as it was turning from the first hit. Another cross, low to the body, something snapped, releasing a pinched cry of agony. Then another hook into the stomach, his body jackknifed, surrendering to the pain, and as his chin dipped, Aramis unleashed a brutal uppercut. Bone cracked, and the jaw bent sideways, the left cheek bulging to accommodate a violent dislocation of the mandible. He didn't fall straight away, the mind too slow to heed what his body was saying. He faltered for a few seconds, listing this way and then that, before the legs bowed, then buckled, simian arms hanging limp and ineffectual. Canvas trembled, a felled oak brought to ground, his unconscious form unmoving. Utter silence reigned in an arena of over four thousand. A single shout stirred the tumult that followed. Volponi glory! Then they were all shouting it, a cry of disbelief and pride, but not Colchis. He looked to the crowds, to the Agrians who felt cheated, twice slighted in their eyes, denied justice and now vicarious retribution. In the end, it was too much. After what happened, no one would remember who threw the first punch, but a brawl broke out amongst the spectators. Agrian and Volponi, heathens against the genteel, though to Colchis's mind, the barbarity was equally apportioned. De Villiers called for order, but even his voice found little purchase on minds given over to fury. Grusman and a squad of guardsmen went with him, heaving men bodily as they strove to reach the heart of the violence and put an end to it. No one saw Rensaint stumble into the agora, disheveled, a gash upon his forehead. They saw his quarry, or at least Colchis did, a blood-stained man in slate-grey fatigues and a black vest, first son, Tempestus Sion. Raving, madness in his eyes, he plunged into the throng of warring men. He broke a wrist attached to a hand that tried to hold him, then crushed a nose in the face of one who got in his way. He snapped the neck of a third, so fast Colchis was still processing what had happened, as he choked a fourth with a savage blow to the throat. Slow realization wormed its way through the crowd, and some of the brawlers stopped fighting, suddenly alert to this new threat. Sent to uh, me. The raving became words, but none that Colchis knew. He was moving to, making for the crowds, wishing he had a pistol. Sent to uh, me. An object in the science hand, small and innocuous. De Vere's headed to the cause of the commotion, Grussman and the others a step or two behind him. Sentua me! The object was a frag grenade, its priming light blinking red, red for danger, red for fire. Rensaint fired a gun, an old stubber that discharged thunderously into the air. It echoed, rolling through the agora, and soldiers turned to see him take aim. 
and what an emperor blessed shot it was, a single bullet, a heart shot that dropped the scion where he stood, and for half a second, Colchis dared to breathe. During his exhale, the grenade exploded. Chapter 21 They were laid side by side and in two rows. A grubby white sheet covered the bodies in lieu of a funerary shroud, barely hiding the disfigurements of their deaths. Twenty-nine dead, seventeen killed instantly, the rest dying of their injuries and only holding on long enough to beseech the emperor for his mercy or to wail for the loved ones they would never again see. Cold seeped into Hauptmann's bones as he regarded the quiet dead, who retained the shapes of men under that coarse fabric, but who would go to the throne absent limbs or facial features. An old salt store served as a morgue, the stone and its contents a natural preservative, but it couldn't rob the air of decay entirely. He hadn't been a part of the revels or seen the fights. He had been writing letters, facile words designed to soften the pain of grief. Strong drink helped to numb the hypocrisy of it. And he did that alone, too. He found no comfort in company, not even his own unit, though there were precious few of them left anyway. His citation for bravery had arrived from the office of the general, a piece of platinum in the shape of a two-headed eagle, a note written by an aide, but stamped with the bismond seal, declared the general was looking forward to his presence at the feast. Hauptmann had left it in the Pardus barracks, together with the medal, discarded on his bunk. This, though, this he had to do. Hauptmann didn't mind the dead. At least they kept their peace and their own counsel. Ever since the earth had turned to glass, and the world around him turned into noise and fire, Hauptmann had felt nothing but absence. He became an empty thing, and so sought out other empty things. Closing tired eyes, he watched them die all over again. Roper thrashing as the fire caught on his clothes, a Promethean spill lighting him up like a pyrotechnic. His cries cut short as he choked to death on the smoke from his own burning flesh. Garrison upended from his mount, raging and kicking as the beasts fell upon him, then screaming as they started to feast. Mathis, annihilated in the blast, turned from a man to a grainy shadow where a man had once stood in the beat of an eye blink. Only Lennox left, a young man no more. A plume of breath shuddered from Hauptmann's chest, fogging the air, just another pallid ghost amongst all the rest. He held a crumpled picked. Fire had seared its edges. He crushed it close, standing in the salt store with his head bowed, and wept for everything and everyone he had ever lost. A light burned in the half-dark, bringing him to his senses, a blade of sodium brightness cutting through shadows and alighting on those shrouded faces in still repose. As the light found Hauptmann, he squinted, holding up a hand to ward off its beam. My apologies, Sergeant, said Aramis, her voice familiar enough to identify her. It is late, or rather early. I didn't think anyone else would be here. No need to apologize, Captain but I'd be obliged if you would stop blinding me. Yes, of course. She doused the light and came to stand by the cavalier's side. She walked stiffly, trying to mask her pain. He had heard about what she did during the fights. Back when we ran scouting missions, we would often be called upon to venture into enemy-held territory, Hauptmann said. We couldn't use lamps, and every bit of chrome or metal was dulled. The engines baffled to limit noise. No light, no sound. We were phantoms. You had to learn to adapt, see in the dark. Old habits, I suppose, when amongst ghosts. Unquiet souls, Sergeant? You think these men are ill at rest? I think they are dead, Captain. 
and it doesn't much matter either way to the living. A few moments of silence passed between them, until Aramis said, I never had an opportunity to speak to you after... Her words trailed away like a road abruptly cut off. Little to say. And are you... Have you seen the regimental priest, or... So many trammelled paths, leading to nowhere. I don't think I ever left that fire, Captain, he said, voice thick with emotion. I close my eyes and I see it, feel its heat on my skin, then the screaming as their flesh burns and runs like wax, until all that's left is ash. He turned, his eyes moist in the ambient light. Have you ever seen anything like that? The dead can't hurt us, Hauptmann. No, they only remind us of our failings and regrets. I make it a point to have neither. Hauptmann laughed, not bothering to hide his scorn, but his laugh became a racking cough shuddering through his body like a mortar barrage. Aramis made to help him, but he held her back with an upraised hand, his bitterness winning out. Spoken like a true aristocrat, he said eventually, and could almost feel the air bristle around Aramis. Her concern turned to irritation. Wealth and standing has its own burdens. You don't even see it, do you? he said, choking back the phlegm and wiping his mouth. The privilege. She became indignant. I won't be held to account for the place of my birth or heritage. It's right in front of you. On the back of every servant, every flaunted luxury, every advantage you're given. I don't have every advantage, she countered, but Hauptmann would not be persuaded. You think you are different, Ione. Yes, I know your name. I learned it out of respect should I ever need to use it. Can you say the same? Anger contorted Aramis's features, anger that warred with shame, anger at herself. I cannot. Vilas. It was my father's name and his father's before him. And my son, too, is Vilas. He is my legacy. I have no lands, no title, no privilege. Just him. And I should feel guilty for mine? No. But at least open your eyes and recognize it for what it is. Hauptmann left, checking his chrono. He had a duty to attend. Wings up in forty minutes. He patted his pocket, checking it was still there. A packet of parchments wrapped in twine rustled to his touch. Thrown, he felt bone-tired, hot and cold at the same time. He walked from the salt store, past the dead in their ragged shrouds, and then past nine other bodies. Only these had been draped in silk, with a laurel wreath anointing every brow, clutched in the outstretched claw of a gilded griffin rampant. The lamps burned low, casting little light, and feathering the edges of shadows. They hid him for the most part his skeletal visage rendered grey by the light and his pallor still visible, but split in darkened symmetry. The darkness hinted at a large room, finely appointed with exquisite furnishings, but any detail bled into nothing beyond the warm corona of light surrounding the bed and its decrepit occupant. A claw reached out from beneath the bed sheets wizened like a dried twig, the skin wrapped over it like old paper. Merciful throne, Regara made the sign of the Aquila. Since the attack, the transformation was arresting. De Vere's had lost much of his former vigor. An emaciated thing lay in his bed, bone sharp and gaunt. Regression, the medics had said, brought on by physical trauma, after what must have been centuries, his rejuve had reached and surpassed its restorative limit. The years were literally catching up with him. A polished wood cane, vintage and expensive, lay propped against a padded wing-back chair near to the bed. 
Glancing at the door sentries arrayed around the general's quarters, Regara sat down in it. He had heard the explosion, heard it, and ran to it, as did so many others not in the Agora that night. Upon his arrival, he had found panic and carnage, dead men blown halfway to the hells, limbs and other parts estranged from the greater whole, a war zone, which had struck Regara as profoundly ironic in a bitter sort of a way. Medics scrambled, rapid triage was enacted, and then he had seen De Vere's, wounded but alive, a pale imitation of the vital figure Regara had known. Perhaps his health had been failing before then, the truth of his inevitable decline hidden in the shadows of the machine yard and shielded by his entourage ever since. Grussman had dragged him away in short order, and between that moment and this, De Vere's had shrunken to a cadaverous version of his former self. At first he appeared not to realize Regara was present. The rebreather strapped to his face, covering much of his expression. But then he slowly turned his head, as if the bones might crack or crumble to powder. Rumi eyes narrowed as they aligned on the Major's face. A hand like gnarled, brittle oak pulled away the mask, and De Vere's let out a shuddering breath. Only in death, he rasped, his choice of words as chilling to Regara as they were appropriate, given he had spoken their echo to Balis not hours before. Is it heresy to admit I loathe that aphorism? De Vere's smile cracked his skin like it was emaciated leather. Not to a dying man, he said. Regara conceded with a nod, but could not reconcile the man before him with the one he had seen on the stage back at Ankishburg. How is this even possible? he asked. I have lived beyond the years of most men, Major. Even the miracles of Mars must bow down to nature at some point, and a cluster of shrapnel in the side is hardly conducive to a long life either. I admire your pragmatism, and is that all you admire? Even on his deathbed, he sought the adulation of his audience. Is that really why you summoned me here, sir, to flatter you? I am surprised Colonel Grussman is not present. He makes a better flatterer than I. A phlegmy chuckle hissed past De Vere's withered lips. That he does, and does well. I am sorry, sir, for whatever worth that has, it is no way for a man of your standing to perish. Ah, should it have been in fire and death, eh? A golden aquila gripped in my fist, a banner snapping in the wind, a thousand clarions proclaiming my glory. He drifted, suddenly wistful, and Regara wondered if his mind, as well as his body, had succumbed to the cruel vagaries of borrowed time reclaimed. I won't lie, Major, that would have been a fine end, but we are seldom given what we deserve. I have regrets, he said, eyes wandering again as if imagining another time, another life. Grossman, said Regara, in an attempt to bring De Vere's back to the moment at hand. Leadership will pass to him, I assume. It will, but it should not, said De Vere's, his candor disturbing Regara almost as much as his appearance. Grossman has been a friend to me for many years, but he is a blunt instrument, effective but unsubtle. He will need steering from his more reckless impulses. Another folk thought Regara disdainfully, arrogant and overreaching. Of how many of the more esteemed houses of Volponi could the same be said? Heredity could be a curse, but one that blighted others rather than the bearer. 
then I pray for us all, for I find him an unworthy man and less than worthy officer. De Vere's laughed, a death rattle cough that racked his body in spasm. A medic began to encroach on the scene, but was sent away with a stern look, the general having lost none of the potency of his influence. After a few seconds he recovered, bloody spittle drooling from one corner of his mouth that he made no effort to clean away. That's why I like you, Regara. Conviction. How liberating it must feel to be so bold. How limiting. Am I to hear all of my shortcomings, sir? No, said de Vere's, his mood abruptly serious. I would ask a favor of you, Major. Name it, sir. After a brief silence, de Vere's licked his lips. He spared a look at the guards, but they were statues all, ears as stone to any words he would utter in this place of death. Thin fingers ferreted around the rumpled bedsheets, searching, and pulled forth a scroll of parchment emblazoned with the house Bismond seal. An official document. Regara took it as it was offered, his thoughts reeling, but still utterly unprepared for what de Vere said next. I would have you hear my confession. A man would die tonight, Colchis knew this with absolute certainty as he moved through the camp. He had tried the barrack houses, the officers' quarters, the makeshift taverns, even the chapels, but found no sign. Ahead of him, a black slated silo that served as camp armory, one of several magazines Regara had seen established throughout Lodden. A pair of guards wearing slocan uniforms stood outside, stern-faced and tight-lipped. Colchis would interrogate them anyway, try to find a lead. If that failed, the Medicaid tents still had a large intake. The Slocan medic Morgan, he thought, had seemed reasonable back in Ankishburg. Perhaps he would know something. It hardly mattered now, as a glance at the sky saw night graying towards dawn. Another would have to be called to be witness, it sat poorly with Colchis, though he knew militarum law, specifically that of Volponi. The dawn brought death, unjust and ignominious. It was no way to reward a hero. The law be damned, thought Colchis, saluting as he approached the Slocan guards. An hour before dawn they took him from his place of confinement. He went accompanied. Shackles placed upon his ankles and his wrists, a ragged smock to sheathe his body that did nothing to arrest the scything of the wind. Had he felt it, it would have chilled him, but his mind and his flesh had long since grown numb with the gradual acceptance of his fate. They had waited for the revels to end, not wishing to taint the celebration with the unpleasantness of what was to come. How civilized of them! But come it had, and five days after he had stood in the ruins of Lodden with a banner in his hand and shouting for glory, Darian arrived at the site of his execution. Ithor stood like a revenant in a bare muster yard, his boots muddy with the sodden earth from the rain that had begun in the early hours. He wore the black of the commissariat, so sleek and shiny it looked like darkly glistening skin. A peaked cap with its silver skull hid his eyes, but not the ghoulish smile curling his thin lips, the wizened flesh like that of a mummified corpse stretching to accommodate the twisting of facial features. He stood apart from the four-man firing squad, arms folded neatly behind his back. As his jailers took him through the archway that led into the yard, Darian saw the rest of his court. Schiller, of course, an eager look in his eyes, a heavy cloak slung across his broad frame to ward off the weather. Raindrops plinked tunefully against his helmet. Colonel Grussman, too, a ninth generation of the royal house of Ermentine, wouldn't have wanted to sully his hands with a deg's execution. Good form must be observed, however. Two officers in addition to witness the deed, 
Isaac Schiller doubtless first to volunteer for the assignment. His second had yet to arrive, an irritation the captain did not possess the decorum or self-awareness to hide. He fidgeted, rising up and down on the balls of his feet, flipping the catch of his pocket chrono in a vain attempt to make the hands turn faster. By the time the other witness marched through the archway, Darian had been pushed onto his knees with his head down. They left him shackled, the metal biting into already red-raw skin. He glanced up through lank strands of hair, the rain grown heavier and running in rivulets down his nose. Captain Ione Aramis of the 86th, fifth generation, a relatively young house, matriarchal. Her grim expression suggested she had no desire to be here or let this draw out. Darian could not blame her, nor did he. Schiller's wide-eyed expression suggested he had not been expecting her. The court of execution assembled. Commissar Ithor began the remarks of condemnation. We are brought here to this place of judgment in accordance with the tenets of militarum law and commissarial justice, he said, voice like a dry breath escaping a corpse, in accordance with the articles of Valponian military conduct, the accused has been found guilty of larceny and the impersonation of a soldier of the Imperium. The sentence is death by firing squad. Rough hands pulled Darian to his feet, ushering him firmly to a worn wooden post, the only feature in the barren muster yard. He saw other figures watching him from across the way, a pair of Agrians, a female officer, the one he had seen at the quarter in Ankishburg, and a hulking Cossack. Purplish bruising covered his face like a rash of birthmarks, and half-sewn cuts would leave scars. They didn't bother to hide, but stood in the open, their feelings inscrutable. A glance at the wooden post before he was turned and tethered to it revealed fresh burn marks, and Darian wondered who else had been executed that morning. He should rail against it, shout indignant protests at the injustice, but he knew Volponi, and he knew the men who cleaved to an antiquated code made to keep serfs in their place. Darian had stepped out of his, and his temerity would be severely punished. Have you anything to say before sentence is carried out? Four troopers wearing visored helms, and in full regalia stood to attention, their weapons shouldered, poised to be readied, then fired. Darian stared at them, examining the instrument of his death. I serve the Emperor, and meet him with honor, Schiller snarled. You have no honor, Deg, he looked at Ithor. Be on with it, Ithor gave a slow nod. He signaled to the executioners who snapped their las rifles into firing positions. The movement practiced and as one. Four priming capacitors sounded in unison, a shrilling chorus escalating towards a lethal crescendo. Crimson beam energy coalesced down the barrels, four sparks of light preparing to emit. They took aim. Darian closed his eyes and thought of Lena. I am his worthy servant. Wait! A stentorian voice rang out, and when the prophesied death did not come, Darian opened his eyes. Major Regara had entered the yard, clutching a roll of parchment. He had come alone, but in a hurry, judging by his pained expression and reddened face. He exchanged the briefest of nods with Aramis. Explain yourself, Regara, Grossman demanded. Sentence is imminent. Read it, Colonel. He held out the parchment, which the colonel took with a displeased glance, and proceeded to read after he had broken the wax seal. He hesitated just before unfurling it, noting something significant on the seal. But it was deftly done and scarcely noticed. Silence fell as the colonel digested every word, Schiller growing more agitated by the second but powerless to intervene. When Grossman had finished, he read the letter again and looked up. He had paled in the cold weather. A stiffening of his posture that had grown so taut his spine looked ready to snap. Is this everything? he asked. Regara nodded. 
everything he gave me. This is impossible. I heard it from the general's lips himself. His signature confirms it. But his son? Regara nodded. Darian felt struck, a sudden lightheadedness making him glad he was bound. Thoughts spiraled off, only to return and cascade into one another. His son. Grusman ruminated, as if chewing at some old piece of food recently dislodged that he didn't like the taste of. Cut him loose, he said curtly, as Darian's mind reeled and stalked from the assembly yard without another word. An old shrine, like those often found at a roadside, stood in the lee of a gnarled, ankish oak. A winged statue of a primarch was its only feature. A ring of candles arrayed around it, worn down to the nubs, their wicks extinguished. It was far from the main camp, right at the edge. Colchis had only found it, because a few of the troopers he had questioned had told him they had used it themselves, a place of quiet reflection, solace for the mind. One can never know the travails of others. It is seldom obvious in a look or a word. Such things are hidden, because they are made thus. Weakness is a form of heresy to some, a failing to be papered over and false resolve painted atop, Layer upon layer of denial, a dam against the horrors. So when Colchis looked up and saw the stout branch and its burden, he wondered at what horrors the dam had held back and why it had broken so thoroughly. A man had died tonight, but not in the executioner's yard. He had died here, alone and in the shadows, hanging by the neck from a gnarled, ankish oak. What horrors, Colchis thought, looking at the fear etched so profoundly on Archivold Brandreth's lifeless face. Chapter 22 Darian sat on a bench in an old grain house, eyeing the dusty floor, his hands down by his sides, they had taken him here after his reprieve and left him, doubtless trying to decide what to do with him. He was alone, a flickering lumen lamp on a table, the only light source, the darkness a blanket across his thoughts. He barely registered the knock against the half-open door when it came, a crisp, clear rap and a silhouette suddenly standing in the archway. Son! For a moment, Darian dared believe his father, the great and vaunted general of the Volponi, Orator Donesk de Viers himself, had come to explain his newfound heritage and answer the myriad questions swirling in his mind like a gas grenade. But it wasn't him, and the speaker realized Darian's disappointment. Hanma, he said, canting his head by way of apology. Darian recognized him from the barrack house, an olive-skinned man, possibly from the Punab region of northern Volponi, with a dancer's poise. He brandished a neatly folded uniform in his arms. Brought you some clothes? Belatedly, Darian realized he must look like something of a state, clad in little better than sodden and dirt-encrusted rags. Thank you, he said, accepting the gift. There's a decent pair of boots, too. Hanma added with a glance at Darian's mud-black bare feet. Should fit well enough. Why is this happening? asked Darian. Why am I here and not dead? Your father, Hanma ventured awkwardly. I thought you knew that they had told. They did. I don't understand, though. The clothes sat on the bench untouched, the boots on the floor next to his cold feet. I'm not sure I am the best person to provide an answer. I can try to find the lieutenant. He'll... My mother, Darian began. She never told me about him. Never said. She was a camp follower, a... Uh, I think the polite term is courtesan. 
and knew what she did, what she had to do to keep us alive. I never judged her for it. I loved her, but I wished she could have told me, said something. I'm sure she would have wanted to. Were you young when she died? Darian nodded. Her name was Meris Armitage, a low-born daughter of a low-born man. I never knew my grandfather, but I knew he had little, just as we had little. She got sick. An illness of the blood, said Darian, his gaze drifting back to the haze of pre-adolescence. I remember the sisters of the chapel taking me away through dingy corridors that smelled of counterseptic and death. I think I knew then what was going to happen, that I would be left alone. I still feel alone. I can't speak to any of that, said Hanmar, but I do know Lieutenant Colchis, and that he is a good man, and if he vouches for you, then that is good enough for me, and it's good enough for Grice and for Dresk and Rake. We'll take you in. I know what it's like being an outsider. And what if I'm rejected? If I have no place amongst you, or my own kind, what then? Some will, said Hanmar, frankly but not unkindly. They won't want to see a lowborn wearing that uniform or carrying a las gun. Some may even hate you because of what you represent to them. But I promise you this now. If you fight for us, embrace us as your brothers, then we will do the same and you will never be alone again. Darian nodded, tears in his eyes, and looked at the bundle of clothes. Hanmar unhooked a scabbard from his belt. It was ornate, well made, and antique. See this, he said, and edged out the blade a few inches. The silver plating shimmered in the light, refulgent with tongues of captured flame. This sword is an heirloom. It has been in my family for generations, handed down always to the eldest son. I have a large family back in the Puna. I'm here fighting for them. And I had six older brothers, all dead. This blade came back from the war, and they did not. I had hoped to be a scholar, but I knew when I set eyes upon this sword that it was mine by birthright, and that I had no choice but to join the tithe and the crusade. I left my home my family, everything I knew, forever. I felt alone, but I found a brotherhood, and so will you. We're all orphans here, Darian, complicated or not, and we fight for each other, for everything we hold dear, he said, reverently sheathing the blade and reattaching the scabbard to his belt. This reminds me of who I am and why I am here, for his own reasons, your father has spared your life. You can question that, or you can use it. He smiled, warmly and compassionately. Now get dressed. You're supposed to report to the drillmaster for basic training. You wanted to fight? You're going to get your chance. Hanmar left, leaving Darian in contemplative silence. For years he had known his place even though he railed against it sometimes and looked on the royals with envious eyes. At least he knew his part and how to play it. No more. The ground had shifted, his once firm footing teetering at the edge of a precipice into the unknown. A hundred or more questions, the fog obscuring his path. But Hanma was right. He could either let those questions devour him from the inside out, or he could use the second chance he had been given. I want to fight. Darian got to his feet and started to strip away his old clothes, like a skin that no longer truly fit. Much later they moved through a low mist that clung to the ground like sulphur. Ahead, a forest of shorn trunks, the trees beheaded in some cataclysmic blast from earlier in the war. Stumps remained, hefty and fire-blackened, rows upon rows of them. 
Darian took position behind one, the shattered old oaks large enough to hide a fire team if they crouched. He kept his head low, Laz's rifle pressed up against his chest, listening in the eerie twilight. The air smelled of churned earth and loam, with an overly ripe aroma of wet mulch and leafy matter that made him feel sick. He thought about reaching for the rebreather hung around his neck, but none of the other soldiers wore theirs, so he held off, wanting to fit in. A little peaky there, Private, said Rake, a playful tone in his low voice. His cousin Dresk not two steps behind, a heavy stubber slung over his shoulder like a piece of swaddled lumber. Hanmar slid in beside them, a comradely glance in Darian's direction. His three chevrons marked him as acting sergeant in Grice's absence. Four days in the Medicae, and he was still not fit to carry a rifle, despite the lieutenant's assertions that he would make him, broken fingers or not. This Darian had learned in the Chimera's troop hold, in the long transit through Mireland. The convoy had managed sixteen miles through mud and swamp before they had reached the dead forest, the sundered bowls too wide and too thick for the Pardus to cross. A centaur support tank had attempted to uproot a stump with a dozer blade and tow cables, but it was slow and effective work. Sappers had been deployed instead, shoulders slung with axes and blasting charges to remove the hindrance. Godsword effectively covered any approach, the Martians having restored and re-blessed the ancient weapon back to function. Though visibility was greatly obscured, so any assurances the rank and file drew from that were minimal. There had been no cause to use it, though. Every outpost, every settlement the forward scouts had found was either abandoned or destroyed. They are pulling out, Grusman had said, an overheard conversation between officers around a map table in the middle of a scratch camp ten miles into Mireland. The bastards, we have them on the run. Not everyone agreed with that assessment. Dissent came from eyes and exchanged looks, not mouths. But Darian had seen it all the same, as he had passed the officers returning to their regiments after the briefing, him snagging crisp salutes at every gaze that fell his way. They recognized him, or some did, those that bothered to look. Disdain, respect, cool disregard, all came his way. A few mistakenly still thought he was Unsworth, who had raised the banner at the victory of Loddon and become a hero. Darian didn't feel heroic. He was just relieved to be alive and in a uniform. He felt cold and wet as the mist sank into his bones. The stench, he said, grimacing. What is it? War, said Rake glibly, hefting the ammo box he carried onto his shoulder to keep it from the groundwater amassing underfoot. That's how it smells, like death and shit. Thick enough to chew, is it not? said Anmar with a smile. The olive-skinned corpsman ever urbane, even in this wretched swamp. It will be worse further in. He patted his rebreather mask. Then you'll need this. You have been appropriately oriented in its use. Darian wasn't sure if appropriately was the right word. His training had been cursory and hasty from the regimental drill master, but he felt he had retained most of it. In truth, he had always felt born to this, to soldiering, to war, and in the last few days that had turned out to be accurate. He had yet to meet his father, though he suspected he had encountered him without his knowledge at the time. The memory of the mysterious visitor to his cell returning often during the night hours. Rumors persisted of the general's failing health. Many asserting a shrapnel injury from the tragedy in the Agora had laid him low and catapulted Colonel Grussman to overall command. Others suggested a heart attack. In either case, he was not on the field and received no visitors, nor asked for any. His absence left a curious hole in Darien, one he still wasn't sure how he felt about. On Monthax, second tour for the 50th, we fought for six straight days in dense jungle, said Dresk, his voice reasserting the present. 
mud and filth and undergrowth, like wading through wire, lagoons as far as the eye could see, foul, brackish waters, insects as large as your hand and hungry as the hells. Mean bastards. Remember that, cousin? I thought my feet would never be dry again. Air that tasted of rank sweat, worse than grice after a long march, so thick it actually shimmered and heat like a heavy cloak. As I recall, your complaints were vociferous, Rake. Colchis crept back into formation, having slipped out to confer with Regara and Command, who occupied a refused position sixty feet from the line. He patted Darien on the shoulder. You'll adapt. It's the guard way. Darian nodded, only slightly reassured. He liked the lieutenant. Kulkis had a firm, fair manner, just as Hanmar had intimated. A second son of an esteemed house, he was known for his handsome looks and good humor, but demonstrated strong leadership and tactical acumen that Darian had come to respect in his short tenure as a soldier. Not everyone fostered the same opinion. Several dirty looks had come their way from the Agrian sappers they had been charged to protect as they cleared a path for the tanks. Directed, Darian was sure towards Colchis. Rake and Dresk had spoken of it a little. The two troopers loose-tongued, especially after a few glasses of Vresk. A feud, they had said, a slight not forgotten, related to a dead Agrian hetman called Osra, that Kulkis had locked horns with on a couple of occasions. The grudge festered. A bird call arrested further introspection, echoing down the line, and saw Kulkis give the order to advance. Two platoons moved as one, their pace steady but unhurried, put at ease by the all-clear from the forward scouts. Darian felt far from easy, though, as he waded deeper into the mire, the mist thickening around him. The Orek ranged ahead, disappearing into the banks of mist as the Volponi followed in their wake. As soon as he had set up sentries, Kulkis issued commencement orders to the Agrians, and a horde of labor gangs descended with pickaxes, debt cord, and sticks of explosive. They worked efficiently within the guard cordon established by the Volponi, all eyes outwards as the diggers toiled in the swamp heat. Almost all. A pair of Cossacks, two he recognized from the Golliver's retinue, sent their ire his way. He would speak to Regara about it when he had the chance, but command was stretched after Brandreth's untimely death. His agonized face still haunted Kolkis, like so many other dreams of darkness he had accrued. A surfeit of horrors he would gladly be rid of. He rubbed at his leg, the injury sustained to the wirewolves, for he could not think of the creatures dispassionately enough to refer to them as K-weapons acting up in the damp. A faint chuckle passed his lips. In idolizing Regara, he had hoped to be like him. Suffering from a similar injury had not been what he had in mind. A round of charges went off, splitting a wide tranche of stumps for the axemen to rend. Steel plating followed, evened out with sandbags underneath, and so a makeshift roadway formed. A hetman whistled, signaling his approval of the work, and the Pardas vanguard rolled out. They moved slowly and ponderously, their weapons turning in lazy arcs, the tankers jutting from the turret hatches wary and quiet. A few chewed on thick cigars and puffed aromatic smoke that only partly obscured the reek of the forest. Colonel Ganza led them out, barrel chest outthrust as he surveyed the land ahead like a fearless explorer bound for the unknown. He nodded to Colchis in passing, a king upon his war altar, deigning to acknowledge his subjects. Let him feel superior. His most recent meaningful action had been retreat. Colchis saluted him anyway, in concession to his rank. The Agrians had almost finished. Kulkis engaged comms. Garno! A momentary bout of static preceded the Master Sergeant's voice on the other end of the box. Nothing but mist, my friend. Is there an end to it? 
I hope so. I can no longer feel my feet. I have spare boots in the Chimera, about three miles back. I think your boots might be a little small for me, eh? Though your officer's cap would be plenty big enough. Mine is leaking. Pity. I'm already using it. Perhaps we can share it, Lieutenant. It is, how did you put it, camaraderie. Kulkis gave a wry smile. A lofty word for a shared hat. I tell you what, Orek, I'll give you the name of my haberdasher when we're both back at camp. I swear if you had just insulted me, I would not know. Kulkis laughed, finding solace in Garnu's good humor but felt Schiller's eyes as the captain prowled the back of the guard cordon. Hurry it along, lieutenant. You can fraternize with the commoners when we're out of this bloody swamp. Colchis cut the vox, lingering only long enough to confirm his platoons would hold until the OREC had scouted ahead. They're here, you know, Colchis, said Schiller, having moved close enough for the smell of his alcohol breath to pervade. The Pact, a damn battalion somewhere in these woods. He stared into the mist, as if trying to find them. It's a large region. Our paths might not cross, Captain. Like two leviathans drifting through the same ocean, Schiller said, quoting a line of Volponi poetry by Sturk, his voice briefly far away, as if softened by remembrance. It was a slim hope, thought Colchis, lost in his own thoughts then, and the road ahead was long. The gloaming made shadows of men. Even the tanks looked like slow-moving rocks, grinding laboriously through a river of mist. Regara's gaze found Darien amongst the throngs of troops moving carefully through the sundered forest. A son of an esteemed royal of Volponi, the Bismond House of Konisberg, no less. It beggared belief, but the proof of it was before him in Volponi Grey, a praxis pattern lasgun in his hands. It had stirred grievances, the pardoning and subsequent commission, and not least of those was Grussman's, who had always hated the Degs, but was loyal to De Vere's. It had tied him in knots, and still did. He masked it with duty, devotion to his newly attained rank and position, a blunt instrument determined to beat the war into submission. That thought terrified Regara more than any wirewolf or traitor Astartes. How many miles, Major? Regara turned at the naming of his rank, a scowl on his face at the slow progress of the army. Two, sir. He had taken to calling Grossman sir, for though Regara despised him, and recent engagements with the man had not persuaded him otherwise, he would observe the appropriate manner and measure of respect. His breeding demanded nothing less. They stood in close proximity, in the back of a command salamander, peering out over the armoured lip of the forward glasses. Heathens, Grossman cursed under his breath, Liquid oafs. Commissar, he snapped at Ithor, the desiccated corpse of a man turning towards the inquiry. Muster the discipline, masters. Let's push the lash to them. See if that doesn't hurry things along. Whipping the Agrians will only antagonize them, said Regara. Grussman raised an imperious brow, but Regara wasn't about to give him another, sir. One was more than enough. Nonetheless, the colonel still expected an answer. Our alliance with the natives is thread thin as it is. We need them on side and willing. Grussman was about to object when Rensaint interceded. I've observed these people, General. They are proud and would not take well to humiliation. Very well, Grussman uttered at length, a slight sneer stretching and deforming the scar across his cheek earned in the agora from the frag grenade that had killed over twenty men and injured dozens. How else to stir them, I wonder? Regara had yet to ask Rensaint what he knew of the attacker, but apparently the man had got loose, 
and begun babbling before the killing started. Sentiwa May. It was not to the knowledge of the Lex Savants, at least, one of the arcanate languages or dialects, but they knew so little of it, and understood even less that this was hardly a definitive statement. Something had overcome the scion, broken him, and his death had sent several others to the morgue. Regara, said Grossman, a cruel smile turning his features again as an idea formed. I want you in an advance post alongside the troops. His eyes widened with sadistic amusement, knowing how the damp and moisture pained the Major's injured leg. Keep order. You have a way with the common born and their like, and even the diggers respect rank. Inspire them. Regara saluted his assent, his expression studiedly neutral as he was about to climb down. An adjutant made to follow, but Grussman's words stopped him. The corporal, I will have use for him. As you wish, sir, Regara replied, exchanging a meaningful glance with Rensaint. He's all yours now. Remarkable, isn't it? uttered Grussman, loud enough for the major to hear as he departed. How a deg can become a gentleman and escape a firing squad but for a lucky chance. I wonder, he continued, his voice slowly fading as Regara got further away, if the position could be reversed. Tugging his collar up around his neck, Regara strode into the forest and only breathed again when his hand had left the hilt of his sabre. Chapter 23 The Valkyrie flew with engines baffled, running dark and staying just above the cloud layer like a nightbird gliding on the wing. Hauptmann had rolled back the side hatch, clipping in to prevent any mishap should the aircraft need to bank or maneuver suddenly. But the skies were clear, the Veduak patrolling elsewhere or having quit to some other part of the island entirely. It was a mercy for the Arcanate air carder were ruthless and tenacious. He closed his eyes, letting the wind buffet him and fill his senses with white noise, a voiceless thunder that smothered his thoughts and left his mind a peaceful blank slate. No screams, no smell of burning, at least for a while. His hand found the clutch of parchments in his uniform pocket, and the dead returned, as if summoned by the ink on paper that told of their ending and offered hollow consolation. Old feelings of loss resurfaced, like bodies left over long in a river, bloated with regret. The crumpled Pict wormed its way into his gloved hand without Hauptmann realizing, and he thought of Chari, her hair swept back on a frontier wind, their son cradled in her tanned arms. I drink, said a voice from the hold interior. The tunnel rat, 19th Talper. Hauptmann thought his name was Pick or Pack or something like that. Remarkably, he wore a lieutenant's badges, and Hauptmann wondered briefly if he had stolen the ragged jacket to which they were pinned. I beg your pardon? The Talper had a greasy flask in his cloth-wrapped mitts. A sloshing emanated from within, the liquid redolent of physaline. Hauptmann politely refused. Good for forgetting, said the Talper, scratching at the tattoo on his cheek, a mournful shadow passing across his dirty face. And blindness, thought Hauptmann, but kept that to himself, smiling instead. Oh, I smoked the kappa. He bared licorice black teeth. Neither vice sounded particularly appealing. Hauptmann spared a quick glance to Lennox, hoping for moral support, but the sniper had his feet up on a bench and was snoozing peacefully, an easy smile on his face. Oh, to be young and less burdened. He showed the Talpa his picked. My family, he said. The Talpa stared at the faded image for a long time, eventually nodding. Tis good, he said. How so? That you are here and they are not. No place for a family, this war. 
Hauptmann found no argument there, but it didn't ease his grief. A grubby hand hastily wiped on grubbier fatigues came his way. Pack, uttered the Talpa. Hauptmann, Hauptmann replied. The Talpa smirked. Funny name, and swilled back his illicit grog. It took six more hours to find the Loke Beacon, one of the first suns pouring over the signal returns on a radar unit that turned his face the color of sweaty emerald. Here, he said curtly, his counterpart Scion in charcoal and black sitting up and hurrying over to the dulcet screen. Hauptmann had learned their names were Zarek and Venator. Apart from their hair, one fair, the other dark, they could have been forged from the same mold, their ruthless edges left untrimmed. There was a potent physicality to both men, even more so than the blue bloods, who had thoroughbred bodies like slabs of perfectly wrought muscle. This wasn't breeding, though. It was grown, actually crafted. Hauptmann could almost smell the stim sweat wafting off them. They had not elucidated about rank, or much else, really, beyond the fact that Zarek was in charge of the operation and Venator his second in command. The remainder of the seven-man team was made up of a pair of slokens in warm crimson and silver carapace armor. These two didn't speak much at all, though happily conversed in their own tongue, often sharing a joke that more than once Hauptmann had thought was at his or the Talpa's expense. Confirm reading said Zarek, his chiseled face rendered like green marble in the radar light. The ping from the unit perpetuated, getting steadily louder. Venator corroborated the loke ident and nodded, his eyes fierce and exultant. Throne, we have him. Zarek turned his cold eyes on the others. Even Lennox was stirring. Arm up and be ready. We move as soon as we're down. It appeared they had found Lieutenant Sacker. Eddies of swirling dust obscured the departing Valkyrie as the troopers marched out. The first sons took point, Zarek out front, a tempestuous volley gun held in a low grip. Venator was at his shoulder, clutching a hell gun. They moved fast and smooth through the rugged terrain, almost like automata, and further dehumanized by their rebreather and visor-masked helmets. Hauptmann's own rebreather hung around his neck, the sergeant preferring a scarf to ward off the grit on account of it feeling less claustrophobic. A breeze had kicked up from somewhere, its catabatic zephyrs sending dust in all directions like a lazy sandstorm. It chafed, but was otherwise no more than a mild irritant. He coughed, surprised to find a little blood flecked on the edge of his scarf. Everything all right, sir? Hauptmann nodded to Lennox, the lad a few feet behind him and to his right. Must have bit my lip. Lennox had brought his sniper rifle, but it was piss-all use on the move, and in these conditions, Serge remained slung across his shoulder, a combat shotgun favoured instead. Park roamed the other side, his position similarly refused. He had an axe, a pick hooked to his belt, and a shit shovel of a las carbine on a strap that he carried one-handed. Possessing neither rebreather nor scarf, he kept his head low against the wind. Rear guard was the two slokens, both trailing crimson cloaks that had yellowed at the edges from the dirt, the heavy-armored bastards like small tanks and wielding siege-grade autoguns in their gauntleted fists. Each man wore a fright mask, a snarling death visage meant to inspire fear. They did not look so fearsome slogging through the dirt in their ornate panoply. A hand signal arrested the march abruptly, Zarek's clenched fist apparent to all. He gestured ahead, a hand just above his eyes in a silent instruction to look. It took a moment, Hauptmann peering into the mustard haze, just the faint song of the wind lamenting in his ears and then a structure began to appear, an outline at first, but then more detail, as he discerned architectural characteristics from mere silhouette. An old fort. It had dilapidated crenellations, the merlins and embrasures of the walls sunken down to rubble in places, in spills of tired old rock. 
despite the disrepair. It appeared solid, a combination of stone and metal, bleached starkly by the elements. No outer wall, no gate, just a roundish tower jutting from the earth like a sword. No sentries either. Looks deserted, uttered one of the slokens, a brutish sort, dark eyes glittering behind the anonymity of his mask. The voice came out distorted, a feral resonance worsened by the inbuilt breather. He and his compatriot had moved up from the back ranks to stand upon the edge of the shallow defile that looked down on the fort like all the rest. Zarek stared a moment longer, a handheld Orspex scanner pinging softly before turning to Hauptmann. Bardus Mechanized is a scout unit, isn't it? Hauptmann nodded, amongst other things. Not any more, said Zarek, and it took all of Hauptmann's resolve not to strike him. I need you to reconnoiter that fort. Draw out any trap or sentries, you mean. Call it what you will, soldier. That's Sergeant Cavalier, Hauptmann replied indignantly. Not here it isn't. He gestured for the Pardus to move out. Hauptmann obliged. It was either that or kill him. Puck started after him, head low against the wind. Where are you going? asked Zarek, but he didn't intervene. Stretch my legs, he looked around the barren wastes. Nice weather for a walk, he said, and followed Hauptmann into the defile. Stay close, Hauptmann murmured, Puck trailing behind him, and glanced up to the edge of the defile. The first suns and slokens had spread out across the ridgeline, but a sniper sight watched every step the scouts took, Lennox waiting patiently at the other end of the scope. Hauptmann gave a small nod to his friend and countryman, that easy smile again in return. You think it's deserted? asked the Talpa. No, I do not. They trudged on. The drifts had gathered here collecting in shallows of dust and grit that rode up to the ankle as Hauptmann approached the fort. A round wall presented itself, an iron-bound door the only entrance. It wasn't sealed or even properly shut, and banged gently on its frame, hinges creaking like scraped piano wire. He nudged it with his boot, Puck observing keenly and as silent as a shadow. He nodded to Hauptmann, his readiness unspoken. No pressure plate, no trigger cord. The door opened, revealing an unadorned circular chamber and a lozenge-shaped metal hatch in the ground. Faint ambient light caught its edges. The hatch led down, and it was sealed. Hauptmann used the Vox. Bring blasting charges. A few minutes later, and everyone stood around the hatch, a few feet back, hugging the edges of the room with the exception of Venator, who was rigging a line of debt cord. A bandolier of crack grenades hung off his body as he stooped, but they wanted the hatch breached, not the fort collapsing. He scurried back, eyes on the group, and counted down with his fingers. Three, two, one. A plosive spurt and the hatch fell loose, shorn from its frame. After a few seconds, it hit the ground below, the noisy clang echoing back up a narrow shaft. Zarek's stab light strafed the darkness, revealing a ladder leading down to a grated deck plate and nothing else. He waited, listening until long after the echo had faded. Still nothing. Venator had the Orspex now. Its signal returned silenced, but an urgent screen pulse indicating the Loke Beacon's proximity. He gave a shallow nod. The Slokens went first, heavy armor to the fore, auto guns slung on their backs as they descended rung by painstaking rung. It took over twenty minutes for everyone to traverse the ladder. Hauptmann arrived second last, just ahead of Lennox, who was a few feet further up the shaft as the Sergeant Cavalier's boots touched metal. What became immediately apparent was how much larger the footprint below was compared to that above as a vast subterranean chamber spilled out into seemingly endless darkness. Cold, hissed one of the slokens, breath pluming. Stab lights ventured outwards, their grainy beams crisscrossing and overlapping in a gulf of blackness. 
Eventually, one found a wall, the condensation on it shining like glacial ice. They left Lennox at the ladder, guarding the only known egress, and he gave Hauptmann a look as the sergeant cavalier glanced over his shoulder as he was departing. Watch yourself, it said. Using the wall, the rest followed the periphery of the chamber, but when they found nothing, it became obvious they needed to move inwards. After several more feet, Venator checked the Auspex. The dull light barely lit the screen, its soft pulse quickening like a heartbeat in cardiac arrest. Venator panned the device, but static rippled across its face, the depth fouling the signal until it cut out completely. Deeper in, and the darkness began to feel almost residual, its soft tendrils clinging like it was darker than it should be, or the stab lights were losing power, but Hauptmann thought it just a quirk of the chamber, which was metal throughout like a ship's cargo hold, or a meat locker. They reached the centre, and it felt pretty far from where they had started. Hauptmann assumed they must have passed a column or support, because he had lost sight of Lennox. Guns up! whispered Zarek, and the company obeyed as one, a flurry of ineffectual stab lights preceding their advance. The light barely reached ten feet. One of the Slokans wrapped his lamp's casing, but Venator hissed a warning and he stopped. The beam flickered, as if passing through a patch of interference, but stayed on. Old burn marks seared the metal underfoot, which rose up in a wide and expansive platform. How big is this place? Hauptmann heard a Slokan murmur. He had been wondering the same thing, and tried Lennox on the Vox, but the signal was dead. He made this known to the Scions, who exchanged a stern glance with each other. I saw no Valkyrie in the vicinity, offered Venator, still baffled at the blank auspex. Maybe Saka shed his Loke beacon, and he isn't here. He sounded worried, which sent a chill through Hauptmann and an urge to bolt that he fought down. Zarek stared wide-eyed, caught on the threshold between decisions, before moving them onwards. Streaks and blemishes on the metal continued, but appeared too thick to be made by fire. Puck stopped to run his finger through one. It came back dark and glistening faintly. Shang, he said, sniffing fervently like a rat sensing danger. The air grew colder, freighted with a wet copper odor. They came upon the first of the machines shortly after, disused, dormant, like nothing Hauptmann had ever seen not Mechanicus, edged and spiked, a metal frame with straps and articulated limbs, like a torture rack. Saka was bound in one, bloodless, emaciated. He had the stillness of the dead. His neck had been arched back, a studded iron circlet across the forehead, preventing movement. Both arms were strapped down too, and the ankles. Two metal limbs extended from the back of the machine, and ended in three articulated talons that attached to Saka's eye, pinning the lid open. Venator had been about to move in when Zarek put an arm across him. He was looking at the ground, his lamp straying to something daubed on the deck plate. Sentiwame, or more precisely, S Sentiwame. I. An outstretched hand lingered at the light's penumbra. Hauptmann swept his lamp over and revealed another of Saka's men, dead, stripped back to fatigues and vest. His head had lolled on the side to reveal over-wide eyes that would never close. The rest of the missing scions lingered nearby, trapped in the machines, heads back, eyes held open, looking upwards. Puck craned his neck, and Hauptmann followed the Talpa's gaze and found his own face staring back at him. A mirror ceiling arched above them, huge, vaulted. It was made up of shards, mismatched flecks of glass fused together into a patchwork mosaic. S. Sentiwa Ma I. I am a witness, said one of the slogans. The truth of the message revealed. In reflection. A witness to what? thought Hauptmann. To the all and the everything.
the darkness answered. Chapter 24 Vauga, the Imperium called him. Regara had read the man's file, thin as it was. A Damagawa, he had a reputation for sadism and ritualistic murder, not uncommon amongst the pacted. But Vauga also registered on the assignment, though his actual rating on the Morianic scale had been redacted by the Ordos. According to Militarum Intelligence, he had occultist ties to a minor sanguinary faction called the Tongues of Cherish, and was allegedly a former student of Heritor Asphodel, or a petty imitator. Claims differed on that part. Though the late Magister had been slain during the Vergast conflict over twenty years ago, a war in which the Blue Bloods had played a significant role, men like Vauga ensured his legacy endured. Vauga had come to Nostis, and his army stood between the Volponi and passage through Myerland, and the first Regara knew of it was the red swathe. It crept under the mist, a veil beneath a veil, heavy at first, then rising as a bloody fog. It unfurled across the army with eager virulence, like rippling red fabric. Anorek died first, choking on the poison before he could lift his mask. He fell back as if shot, his death caught at the edge of Regara's magnocular lens. The major turned, only quick enough to see the scout's splayed fingers swallowed by the swathe. Others followed, gurgling and rasping their last breaths, a dozen or more by Regara's count, before the order sang out, Masks! Masks! It resonated through the ranks. Men dispersed amongst the severed trunks, relaying fear down the line as sure as any contagion. A gas attack, that insidious horror, and the promise of an ignominious death. Fingers trembled, some slipped. Regara pulled on his rebreather and heard the quickening of his fear rebounded back at him through its plastic confines. Already stifling in the sundered forest, it only grew worse behind the partially fogged lenses he now looked through. He raised Kulkis on the internal Vox. Sound off, Lieutenant. Vox good, Vox good, sir. It came back crisp, close. That was something at least. He reached the platoon, took command. Schiller had third and fourth platoon, and huffed across the closed system Vox, slurring his vowels. Bloody gas, the blackguards! Regara's response was curt, as it needed to be. Captain, signal the advance! A horn blast rang out. Schiller's breath filtered through a facial vent. Then two more. Then they were moving to engage, quickly adapting from guard to assault positions the well-drilled Volponi doing what they did best. The Agrians fell into disarray, many fleeing the gas attack, their masks standard issue and only partially effective. A few strays collided with the Volponi units, who barged them aside, putting their well-nourished physiques to harsh effect. Others rallied, a handful of Cossacks and their Golliver maintaining order. In either case, the diggers were in retreat. Regara pushed on, unwilling to be distracted, his only instinct was to push forwards and engage. The world had feathered around the edges, sound and light dictated by rebreather mask, perception shrunk to a pair of ocular lenses, and the death rattles of men too slow or too ignorant in the face of danger. He couldn't find the enemy at first. The air was too thick, too red. Lazfire whipped out, ending all that. Sporadic at first, it chimed against the armor of the Pardus tanks, leaving burn scars but little else, then intensifying like gentle rain that grew into a deluge, irresistible once it peaked. Then Regara saw them, edging from the mist, the red swathe parting like some gossamer veil of hell, admitting its demons unto the world. Brutish, scarred, they wore iron helmets and spiked metal cuirasses over ox-blood flak armor and uniforms. Grotesques glistened, the faces of old nightmares anointed with blood. The air had become an eldritch gloaming, soft light lending the pact's advance an eerie, unreal quality. Vanguard forces had engaged, some hand to hand, such was the suddenness and proximity of the attack. Mostly Orek and the scout carders, a few Talpa, 
the vicious bastards and some plucky Agrians caught on a limb when the attack hit. Cries ululated, dulled and flattened by the crimson fog, like men dying at the bottom of a well, or in some half-heard ethereal place abutting reality. They had to push up and reach the beleaguered vanguard, consolidate, fight back. A stray bead flashed Regara's shoulder, searing his uniform. He snarled. Return fire! Savage light erupted from the Volponi ranks, and the air succumbed to heat and fury. Regara sweltered, the mask sticking to his skin, adhering so tightly he thought it had melted, become part of him. He saw a private wrench off his rebreather, suffocating in his own terror. And then suffocating for real, spewing blood and matter as his organs liquefied and his flesh ran like wax. Others wizened, their emaciation evident in the concavity of their cheeks, reduced to husks before they fell. Every death held a different grim story. The red swathe funneled on, crashing like a dread wave against the militarum forces. A primal hunger drove it, a terrible animus that wanted only suffering and pain. It drank of it, expanding, reaching. Throne, it's coming for us, Regara heard Schiller over the Vox, willed him to gather his bloody wits. Fight them! he roared, urging on the blue bloods. Get to the vanguard, form up and make ranks, fight! He didn't know how many the pact had, but he doubted it was equal to the Volponi and their auxiliaries. The ambush leveled things, but only for a time. Restore order, retaliate with strength, and the battle was theirs. Gazing through steamed-up plastic, he saw his rallying point, the tanks, the Pardus had closed all hatches, hermetically sealing themselves up in their war machines, but they were strung out, too far ahead of the main forces and vulnerable. A few fired off sponson guns, but the swathe was fouling auto-targeters, and most of their shots skewed astray. Turrets boomed, as Ganser fought to make their artillery superiority count, sending spouts of dirt and water pluming, bodies too. Out of the fog, another threat. They ran low and fast, like rats. Lighter armored than the other pactors. Regara shot at one, but it jinked away as if presciently warned. Metal flashed, serrated and sharp. Scarred hands gripped a grenade. An explosion bloomed, the side of a battle tank blown out in a cascade of smoke and shrapnel. No one staggered out. The crew died in their seats, drowned by the swathe. Ganza pressed on his conqueror trying to forge a firing line, but the road the Agrians had raised was narrow. Tank tracks fouled on mud or ran up against hefty stumps and stalled. It was a mess. A second tank blew, fuel reserves cooked off. Regara threw a hand up to ward off the sudden flare of light, a powerful blast knocking him onto his back. He felt a hand grab his forearm and lift. Kulkis looked back at him, Eyes firm through the dirt-flecked lenses of his mask. To the pavis, grated Regara, still catching his breath. The tanks were being torn apart. Another explosion lit up the twilight, casting dead faces in monochrome. Long shadows stretched like rubber, only to recoil a few moments later. Aramis ran through the dark and light, her troops at her heels. She felt every ache anew, every blow she had taken in the ring. Thrown, it hurt like the hells to push herself. But if she didn't, then brave men would die. Her platoons ranged across the far left flank. The captain's hurried route, an intercept with the Volponi Corps. But they were too far out and needed to close. A few skirmishers roamed this far, but they were outriders, and soon fell back before determined imperial opposition. Aramis cut one down that had dared to loiter in her path, slitting them from crotch to crown. Burnt meat tanged the air, mudded through her breather. A squadron of sentinels advanced with them, the long-limbed engines better suited to the terrain than the bulky Apardas engines, but not as hardy. A missile struck the chassis of the forwardmost walker, turning it to scrap and leaving the dismembered legs standing ponderously bereft of their body. Underslung multi-lasers from the surviving machine stuttered in reply, raking the pactors and pushing them back. 
she heard a regimental priest shout a blessing to the emperor. Aramis kept pace with the walkers, her breath huffing inside her mask. It was hard going, slogging through the mire, boots splashing, slipping on mud. One man fell, impaled himself on a fallen branch. She didn't go back or even slow. They had to drive on, consolidate with the core. The ambush had come at the worst moment, as all ambuscades invariably do. The Volponi were strung out, disorientated. Coalesce, and they could mount a viable counterattack. Remain broken up as they were, and the enemy would take them piecemeal. Not on my damn watch, she growled, huffing through her mask. Then louder to her men, move, move! She had 8th and ninth platoon of the 86th, Hennessy at her side. Her men shot on the hip, Laz guns held low with one hand bracing the stock, chattering on rapid fire. Then she saw the flank of the enemy army revealed before her, and the robed magister at its heart, and her objective changed. She vox cast orders to all her platoon leaders and sergeants. Priority target in the field, on my marker, Volponi Glory! Kulkis knew these warriors, bastards every one. He'd fought them on Titus, and old memories of that war stirred in his gut like rotten oysters. Blood-packed grenadiers, Jaegens. Each one had a dead man's trigger, designed for shock and awe. Different by degrees to the more formal military stylings of the death brigades, the Jaegens roved in loosely dispersed packs and had more in kind with their ancestral hunter-barbarian forebears than most of the common pack did. Long blades for close work, akin to a dirk or trench knife, and a bandolier of grenades. Disorientate, terrify, fall back, repeat. Against the Pardus tanks they would wreak utter havoc. A Jaegen slipped out of the fog and he nearly missed it. An instinctive shot took the warrior in the throat. He went up like a tripped landmine, broken apart like kindling. Ten more feet of hoofing through the mud and first and second platoon reached the Pardus. Six more tanks had been destroyed, their hulls agape, the crew within shot or gassed to death. Twenty or more remained in the vanguard, left in train to defend themselves or in the throes of trying to escape. Colchis followed Regara through a graveyard of vehicles, their inner parts spilled from their mortal wounds like organs. Fires lit a false night, redolent with burnt flesh and hair. Risking a glance over his shoulder, he saw Hanmar and the others coming up behind, even Darian, the lad pale behind murky eye lenses, but his eyes fierce. Protect the tanks, bellowed Colchis, his voice muffled even across the vox. Then consolidate this position. A pack of Jaegens sprang into a side alley made by the flanks of two sundered vehicles, knives out and bloody. Kulkis fired off four quick shots, all mortal wounds. Another six made it through, and Darian got one, spearing it through the chest with his las beam. Regara took another, a bolt shell turning the grenadiers up a torso to blasted meat. The rest went for the major having spent their payloads and trying to take out an enemy officer. They hadn't reckoned on Hanmar. His antique blade danced like silver light, and it was over in a rapid flurry of deft sword strokes. Four dead Jaegens lay piled up around him. Seconds had lapsed, the merest distraction dealt with. They moved on, sixty men or more, weaving between the scorched black carriages, a hull-down labyrinth of narrow avenues and dead ends of torn metal. Other Jaegens roamed the cluster of tanks, too, darting away after delivering their devastating payloads. The Volponi rooted them out, firing snapshots down the false thoroughfares of adjacent vehicle walls. It took almost fifteen minutes before they cleared out the rest of the enemy grenadiers. A few scattered back to the lines, using the red swathe to their advantage but the fog was thinning, its integrity decaying. Rake and Dresk chased after them with rounds from the heavy stubber, but caught only a handful of stragglers. Really crawling out of the woodwork, Major, commented Rake, as he slammed another box mag into the heavy stubber's breech. Like roaches, only uglier, 
added Dresk, his eye pressed along his iron sights. As ugly as Grice, anyway, said Hanmar, and most of the men laughed. Regara didn't. Kulkis saw his face, as severe as hot iron, his gaze searing. A sortie, nothing more, he said, though the last storm had ebbed in recent minutes. The bulk of the enemy are up ahead. We have to push up behind the pavis. A hatch was thrown open, arresting further orders. Ganza leaned out of his conqueror, face flushed and angry. He spared a glance for the Volponi, but the colonel's blood was up, and he bellowed an order to advance on the main army emerging from the fog. Armor forward! Chest puffed, chin up. He had an aristocratic sneer to put any blue blood to shame. Enough makeshift road had been laid for three tanks abreast, and Ganza led the pavis like he was the point of their armored spear. He drew and leveled his sword, a fine silver-bladed spather with a chased gold hilt, evoking the spirit of a cavalry charge of old. Engines roaring, increasing pace, the conqueror rode hard, its battle cannon thundering in rapid succession. Hefty divots chewed through the blood-packed ranks, scattering bodies and turning men to mist. Amongst the infantry platoons, stork tanks roamed, and their pulse lasers lashed at the pavis armor, but found it hardy and near inviolable. He'll ride right through the major. Colchis had seen the fury in Ganza's eyes, the indignation. He was a proud man, and he had been battered for much of this war. Now he yearned to hit back, to clench his mailed fist and smash aside whatever was in his way. Get on his heels, then. We'll ride the cover the tanks provide, use them to reach the pact. On them! On them! The order rang down the line, and companies came together, pushing hard. Slowly, slowly, the Volponi and their allies started to consolidate. Schiller's horn clarioned, the infantry flooding after the tanks to exploit the imminent break through the arch-enemy lines and a moving shield wall. Colchis ran on, caught in the surging madness. The pact held. That was the thing that struck Aramis as she came in on their flank. They occupied a defensive position, a partially raised embankment with a low revetment ringed around it. Heavy shelling had ripped out sections. The craters swiftly filled. The dead either trampled or heaped up like makeshift sandbags. Razor wire glistened knife-sharp and bitter. Aramis reckoned on at least five hundred men, barring any losses from the Pardus barrage. Hit the flank at the same time as the core of the army, everyone coming together as one. Overwhelm in one swift assault, that was the plan. She had made good ground, her and her troops. She felt it in the burn of her muscles, the sweat down her back. And there was still that magister to consider. For now, though, her eye was drawn elsewhere, as the pavis came on with ironclad fury, thrown but Ganza raised down on them like the nine devils of Horus, his armored stallions given their head, voices crying thunder and death. Yet the pact still held, dug in but bleeding, weathering the storm. They replied in kind, heavy weapons chugging out rounds. One of the tanks suffered an unlucky hit, a blow to its tracks that turned it sharply and exposed its lighter flank. A collimated beam from a battery of Laz cannon skewered it and sent fire spitting into the sky from the resulting explosion. The rest drove on, glory in their hearts. A few stray volleys came her way, and Aramis gave the order to take cover and advance before her platoons took too much fire. She was not alone. A lieutenant, Fink, she thought was his name, had two platoons in his charge, nearly a hundred, and the priests in addition to that. The main thrust moving up behind the armor had five times that. Another hundred or more on the other flank, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Barbastian. God Emperor, it had looked simpler on a map. Three forces, two ranging wide, run the flanks, meet in the center, textbook. Here, in the mud and the terror, it was anything but. Fink sent a look her way, and she gave the signal to move up. 
We take their flank, she told Hennessy, needing to voice her thoughts, to hear something other than her rasping breath from the pain in her ribs. And keep on going, roll right across them, until we hit Regara's contingent. If Barbastian does the same on his side, we'll crush these bastards in an imperial vice. For pony glory, Captain, replied Hennessy, his face almost as pale as alabaster. Volpony glory, said Aramis, slashing down with her sword and ordering the charge. His legs felt leaden, his overtaxed muscles burning from the effort of hefting the four pounds of mud clinging to each of his boots. They never told you that, thought Darian, as the las beams zipped overhead like lethal fireflies, and he tried to keep the tanks between him and an early demise. The drudgery of war, the sheer mindless slogging before you even get to fight. Throne had seen soldiers die trying to cleave the mud off their boots before even raising a las gun. Ignominy, the reward for succumbing to the drudge. He had lost count of how many of the enemy he had killed. He remembered the first one in this fight, her grotesque smiling in parody of her savagery. She had guard fatigues, stolen from some corpse, or else she was a traitor, though he didn't recognize the uniform. Daubed in blood and unnameable filth, he doubted it resembled what it had once represented. He had shot her in the face, the split mask revealing she was female. Such hellish fury in her bloody eyes and mouth. It had made a mess of her, that first las beam, cauterizing skin and burning flesh. Parts of her lips had fused, but still she raged. A shot spat from her weapon, a bullet that whipped by Darian's ear, a high-pitched insect buzz that seared the lobe. His second shot killed her, the las bolt finding her eye and bursting it in a welter of vitreous matter. It cored out her skull, flash frying the brain inside. He'd barely had the time to register her death before he had killed his second and his third, and on they went. It felt different to Lawton. That had been frantic, terrifying, but it had had a shape to it, a scheme he could understand. God Emperor, he would never forget the traitor Astartes, the smell and heat and presence of it. But this was another thing entirely. He had heard the term meat grinder many times in his tenure as a mill server around the camps. Only now, in the sucking morass of Myerland, did he fully understand what that meant. The tanks were advancing at pace, Colonel Ganser exhorting his machines to charge. Everyone was charging, all running towards the packed army, towards death, hearts afire with glory and adrenaline. Darian felt it spike in his chest, that urgent thunder of it running through his veins. It overcame the drudge, kept his legs moving, gave him strength he didn't know he possessed. Through gaps in the armored shield wall, he caught glimpses of the horde beyond. They occupied a raised defensive position, ranked up in firing lines and giving the Pardus hell. At the center, surrounded by the stoutest defenses and a cadre of heavy armored death brigade, stood a robed figure. He had a mix of flak armor and mesh chain veil beneath, his grotesque, a much more ornate version of the ones worn by his cohorts. Every scrap of bare muscular skin bore the evidence of scarification. This man was a Damagower, an officer of the pact, and in this fight their leader. He climbed the reinforced revetments as the tanks began to close, seemingly unperturbed by the massive ordnance, which unerringly bent around him or simply dissipated into iridescent powder. Darian squinted, sweat in his eyes, his vision retarded by the smearing on his goggles. It must have been the smear that tricked him into seeing that impossible shimmer distorting the air, that unearthly radiance that negated every shell, withered every blast. Not a field of any kind. Darian knew what those looked like and remembered the ozone reek after every activation. It wasn't that. A force field left a mark, a sort of temporary imprint on the air, something that could be gauged and understood. Physics, 
This put him in mind of an opening, a doorway into another place, an unplace, like a reflection against glass. It remade the shells and energy blasts, or unmade them, as if they didn't exist, or had never been deadly munitions at all. It only seemed to enrage Ganza, who drove ever harder as the gap between the Volponi infantry and the Pardus armor widened. He wanted to crush them, grind the enemy's bodies under his tracks. Tank shock had broken heavy formations. Darian had read about it. But those were men, or Craven Xenos. The Damagawa had something unfathomable at his disposal. He inhabited both the real and the unreal. And he wasn't alone. A coven of hunched, robed women clambered up after him. They were tall, despite their obvious disfigurement, their thin frames mummified in form-fitting leather. Each wore a grotesque, like the rest of the pacted, but theirs were narrower to match the angle of their faces. A sickle-shaped opening just below the nose revealed a slash of a mouth the color of intestines. His acolytes... The Damagawa raised his arms, hands reaching as if clutched around some imagery globe. The witches emulated him. Lieutenant Kulkis cried out just as the Damagawa brought his hands together. Blood vein! Darian didn't know what it meant, but he figured it must be bad. Red lightning sparked across the Damagawa's muscled body, and the witches died as one, collapsing like empty cloaks that had slipped their coat hooks. The air resonated like a pane of glass about to shatter. The tanks disintegrated, pushed together like a concertina. Metal folded like paper, turrets collapsed, tracks crumpled. Crewmen were reduced to mulch and ground bone. It took a few seconds for the explosion to hit, a long, drawn-out moment that lingered like an opera singer's top note, dramatic and terrible all at once. Everything slowed in that sliver of a moment, Colchis springing off his heels to try to shield the Major from the blast, Drake and Resk throwing their bodies to the ground, Hanmar falling to his knees as he began to pray. Darian moved too, shrinking down instinctively, making himself small, turning his face from the firestorm. The infantry charge collapsed, the tanks were all but gone. A split second of silence followed, then a roar, so loud it deafened meaning. Then the earth fell away, plunging and shaking as a wave buffeted his body and cast him like a kite untethered into mist and shadows. Chapter 25 A shot whined over Hauptmann's shoulder as he plunged through the darkness. It struck someone behind him, a low grunt presaging the thud of a body hitting the ground. He gave a silent prayer of thanks to Lennox, the sniper's night sight watching them from somewhere ahead. He had little sense of direction. This place smothered it, but he ran anyway, the stab light on his weapon jerking spasmodically. One of the Slocans had died first. After that voice, the man had turned, heavy auto gun raised and about to strafe. His head disappeared. It simply broke apart like a grenade had detonated inside his skull. Hauptmann still felt the flecks of matter and bone chips clinging to his uniform where they had stuck to him. Venator let off a burst, hot laz streaking the darkness. He hit nothing, his beams raking metal and stone. More scorch marks to add to the rest. An impact to his chest spun him. He made an ungainly half-pirouette before Hauptmann saw the charred remains of his torso, like something had taken a bite out of him. As he collapsed, Hauptmann sounded the retreat. Puck needed little convincing, cracking off shots in indiscriminate panic with his shitty Laz carbine. The other Slocan tried to stand his ground, pride and a burning need for revenge fixing his feet. He got off two shots before the flames took him, and then he was just burning meat. Hauptmann caught a glimpse of them then, as the fire flared and faded, definitely packed, but of a different cast to the others, good armor, better weapons, and something else, long-limbed and hunched, lurking behind the warriors. They ran, because what else could they do? 
Another shot clipped the metal deck plate, clanging madly with his frantic footfalls, and Hauptmann changed direction. Puck went with him. Zarek was gone. Dead or alive, he didn't know. Then he saw the glint of a sniper sight, like a lighthouse beacon, and made for it. A slew of hard rounds pranged in front of him, forcing Hauptmann to turn again, but he had found his North Star now and rallied to it. They are trying to hurt us, he realized belatedly, as Puck got siphoned off in a different direction. Hauptmann called out to him but got no reply. He was on his own. Him and Lennox, cavaliers to the end, retreating to fight another day. Hauptmann was a pragmatist above all else. He'd take discretion over valor any saint's day. That glint again, and another sniper's bullet whipping fast and near. It put down another pursuer, the figure crumpling noisily to the deck. The ladder loomed ahead. Hauptmann could just see its edges and the narrow halo from the shaft. He ran harder, though every breath burned like a hot razor. Thrown, it felt like miles rather than yards. Another round coughed from Lennox's rifle, another kill. The lad had a knack and an iron nerve Hauptmann knew he personally lacked. Some men are made for killing. They're just naturally disposed to it. Others have it thrust upon them. The need to survive, forging something callous in them that enables the taking of another life. Hauptmann was the latter, but Lennox had a rare thing a soldier's cold instinct without loss of humanity. He fought for his emperor, as all good soldiers of the Imperium do, but he also fought for his wife back on Padua, for the sons and daughters he wanted to have, for hope and an end to war. Lennox was the kind of man who would put away his rifle when the fight was done and take up tools instead, create and not destroy. So young, so gifted, Let him have peace, thought Hauptmann. God Emperor, let us escape this hole and let him have peace. So close, the ladder resolved fully as if proximity to it, to what he knew was real and true, bled away the unnatural darkness. He didn't see Lennox and assumed the lad had mounted the ladder and was on his way. Hauptmann made for the halo beneath it. Another few steps and he'd be there. A light flared, so sudden and bright he staggered. The ladder disappeared for a few seconds behind magnesium brightness. When he had recovered, Hauptmann slowed and stopped running. They had Zarek. He was on his knees, hands bound behind his back, gagged. Puck knelt beside him, afraid, frantic. Then Lennox. His eyes held an apology, but Hauptmann gave the slightest shake of his head, The lad had nothing to be sorry for. A packed warrior was tying his hands, as another appraised his rifle, weighing up the spoils. Three more stood behind him, one for each man. They wore heavy armor, blood-stained and daubed in sigils that hurt to look at for too long, like the rest of the pack did, but better made. An officer stood apart from the others, his scarred hand on the pommel of his sword, A row of spikes crested his helm, and his grotesque gleamed like polished silver. He rasped an order. Hauptmann didn't understand the guttural dialects of the sanguinary tribes, but he knew an ultimatum when he heard one. Surrendering to the pact was ill-advised. He had heard stories, seen the cruciform bodies lashed to iron octeds. They hadn't killed them yet which meant they needed them for something. Hauptmann took no comfort from that, but alive at least they could still fight. It's not your fault, lad, he said to Lennox as he lowered his weapon. A rifle stock to the back of the knees put him down like all the rest. Rough hands yanked his arms back. Wire bit into his wrists as his bonds were tied. He wished Lennox had never come to this war, that he'd never left his young wife. Never the last ride, he said, just as his captor applied the gag. Lennox smiled that easy smile of his, like warm sun on a cold day. One of the pact had asked a question, the words a collision of hard consonants and cut vowels. 
the officer answered in low Gothic, so Hauptmann and the others could understand. We only need three, he said, and shot Lennox in the head. Chapter 26 The leg was severed. The old phantom pain remained, accented by fresh agony, as artificial sensors bonded to actual nerves fired off like flash flares in Regara's head. He glanced down, ears ringing, dimly aware he was lying on his back, surrounded by debris. A piece of shrapnel had missed him by inches. Heat still radiated from it. Others had been less fortunate. Fire crackled nearby, and the air was heavy with the smell of burning Prometheum. The realization of what had happened was beginning to dawn, when Regara felt himself lifted up, his bionic dangled by a stubborn wire, sparks sputtering from the ruined biomechanical interfaces, and dragged after him like a dutiful hound on a leash. Cut it, he growled through clenched teeth, biting down against the pain. Colchis appeared in front, his uniform torn and a gash across his left arm. This will hurt, sir. It bloody well stings a bit right now. He sliced through the wire with his bayonet, one sure blow. Unable to stop himself, Regara cried out, but at least the pain had ebbed. Are you injured, Major? said Hanmar, the corpsman at his side, as he jabbed a morphia vial in Regara's shoulder. Just the leg. They got him behind a chunk of broken tank armor and stopped. Lazfire whipped past, forcing Dresk to duck as he tried to set up the heavy stubber. Taking advantage of their enemy's disorientation, the pact had started to advance, moving up through fields of destruction to finish off what the Damagower had started. Beyond the scant cover, it was carnage. Every tank in the Pavis vanguard had been neutralized, many outright destroyed. Regara heaved himself up onto one leg, taking a metal spur from Kulkis as a makeshift crutch. We have to rally our forces, restore order. How, Major? Regara turned to fix Kulkis with a glare like ice. Any way we can, Lieutenant. The Volponi assault teetered on the edge of disaster, split down the middle by the destruction of the Pardus, scattered and broken. A few units had already started falling back, the Imperial forces hemorrhaging men as well as blood. Others fought on, but it was hardly coordinated. They had fought through the ambush, taken out the tank killers, only to fail anyway. Snapping his fingers, irritated, Regara called for the Vox. Schiller! Captain Schiller, respond! There were a few seconds of static before Schiller came back. Major, this is Schiller. We are royally shafted here. Bits of Pardus everywhere. Weapons fire rattled in the background from both sides. We are holding, for now. He paused, then asked, What was it, Vasquez? Psycho weapon. Vaugus on the assignment. Now we know why his rating was redacted. Schiller swore colorfully. At least the explosion had sobered him up. He sounded composed, alert, and afraid. Reports were coming through as the Volponi tried to string together some kind of response. Flanking forces under Aramis and Barbastian are on the way, Regara told him. Have you managed to raise Colonel Grossman? Not yet. We need those reserves. He'll commit them when he's ready. For now it's just us and the flankers... We need to coalesce our forces, get them back up the middle again, hit when the flankers hit. What's your fighting strength? Another pause, as Schiller consulted an adjutant. I can scrape up four platoons. Regara had three. Give or take a few men here and there, it would have to suffice. A gulf of fiery wreckage stood between one half of the Volponi army and the other. Of the Pardus tanks, there was almost nothing left. A few crewmen had managed to escape the destruction, but most of them crawled or lurched a few uneven steps before collapsing. In the panic to escape almost certain death, Darian and a handful of Volponi troopers had become separated from the main force. He couldn't even see Colchis or Agara. 
He heard the distant bellowing of Schiller some way behind him. That bastard. Darian saw the hatred in the captain every time he set eyes on him. The man's knuckles had not yet fully healed from the savage beatings he had dispensed. It didn't matter that Darian had royal blood coursing through his veins, that his father, a man he had never met, let alone knew beyond the propaganda reels, had acknowledged him out of some belated sense of guilt or reparation. To Schiller, he would always just be a lowly deg, unworthy of his respect. For hurting him the way Schiller had, Darian hated the man back. For hurting Lena, he wanted to kill him. God Emperor, Lena, he hoped she still lived. Retribution would have to wait. Schiller was busy mustering the platoons, trying to forge some kind of military strength to throw back at the enemy. They were moving, of course, the pact, seizing upon their sudden and devastating advantage. Darian looked to the twelve men around him. They had gathered behind a broken trunk, one tall and thick enough to hide them. An assortment from different squads. One of the men had a sergeant's rank pins and appeared to be in shock. Sergeant, Darian ventured, pulling a Laz carbine to him that wasn't his, but at least had some charge. Sergeant! A low fire exchange had already begun, but it was half hearted. The pact wanted to engage close quarters and gut the Imperials where they stood, scattered and afraid. The sergeant had a narrow face, blonde hair, and green eyes. Name of Crozer. He was gasping for breath a mask strung loose around his neck, cradling his sidearm in both hands. Sergeant Crozer, Darian crept towards him, careful to keep his head down. Sergeant, we need to... Crozer pushed the sidearm under his chin and fired. Several troopers recoiled in shock. Blood flecked the side of one's face. Darian took a moment to compose himself. Schiller was still way behind them, shouting orders. He glanced through a gap in the trunk, the tiniest aperture affording him a narrow view of the battlefield beyond. Ganza lived. Something was wrong with his legs, but he had raised himself upright on his elbow, ornate sword in the other hand, but without any leverage to really swing. Ahead of him were the Damagawa and his men, stalking their prey as the rest of the pack did, fanned out, hunting their own kills. Looking back, Darian quickly surveyed the troopers and found what he was after. Corporal, he said, I need that vox. The corporal returned his gaze, half his face washed with Sergeant Crozer's blood. He blinked, and the absence in his dark eyes fled, replaced by something else. You're Unsworth, he said. You fought at Loddon. A lot of us fought at Loddon, the Vox, Corporal. He handed it over, something like awe in his expression. And I'm a De Vere's, Darian corrected, taking a moment to familiarize himself with the boxy device. The son of Orator Donesk De Vere's. It felt strange to say it aloud, and even stranger to acknowledge the truth of it. Several of the troopers bowed their heads in recognition. Darin ignored them and focused on the Vox crackle as he got the thing working. Schiller barked at him immediately. Crows are wearing the shitting ass of Sebastian Thor, are you? Sir, Crozer is dead. This is Private De Vere's. How? Sir? How did he die and how are you in charge, Deg? Darian bit back a response reminding himself of the pressure Schiller must be under. Self-execution, sir. Schiller murmured something unflattering at the other end of the vox. Then louder, he added, Well, where's Corporal Ackner? Holding the vox. Then tell him to get his ass back to my position immediately. I need every man, Private, even you. We're pushing back, regrouping with Major Regara. Sir... It's Ganza. Who? The Pardus Colonel, sir. Are there any of those poor bastards left? A handful, sir. He's here close by, sir. If I don't do something, he'll die. And such is bloody war. 
Tell Ackner to get his ass back here and use sorry excuses for soldiers with him. You and I will discuss your conduct later. Darian knew what that meant, but he didn't let it distract him. Sir, it's the Damagower, sir. I can see him. He's right in front. I don't give a gentle shit if he's Horus himself. Here, now, that's an order, Deg. The Vox cut off, leaving Darian to rage silently into cold static. What do we do? Akna didn't look ready to slog back to Schiller, only to have to return. He looked like he wanted something else, purpose. And just like that, because he had picked up the Vox, they were looking to Darian for leadership. He glanced through the knothole in the trunk, Ganza framed by its ragged edges, and the Damagawa looming over him like in some classically painted imperial tableau. As Darian watched, the Damagawa grunted to his men, who pressed on, leaving him alone with the colonel. He had a ritual knife in one hand, the blade savagely serrated. It was only when he clenched the metal talisman around his neck and looked up to the churning heavens that Darian realized what the Damagawa intended to do. Ganza was to be a sacrifice, one meant to attract the eye of the gods. There was only one god, or so Darian had been taught, he who dwelt on terror in eternal watchful slumber over the souls of all mankind. He had seen things, though, heard rumors as all soldiers do of other gods, older gods that the blood pact revered as fervently as the Imperium did the master of mankind. And though the commissars would execute him for admitting it aloud, Darian believed these gods had power. He remembered what he had seen when the shells and beams dissipated before they had struck the Damagawa and his cohort, like a film laid across what was real, offering a faint yet terrifying glimpse into an else world, a doorway, one that opened out rather than in. Ganza is a colonel in the Astra Militarum, said Darian, knowing what must be done. It is our duty to try to save him. A pale-faced trooper spoke up. With a dozen of us, how can we... The rest of the army is coming, Darian pointed sharply behind them. Then let them rescue the colonel. He was young, the trooper, a shadow of downy hair framing his chin. They won't reach him in time. You're not in charge, the youth went on. Our orders were to fall back and regroup. Why should we listen to you? Because it's our duty, soldier, said Akna, and I have rank here. Captain Schiller doesn't have boots on the ground here. We do. He exchanged a look with Darian and gave a slight nod of respect. Devere's, you a vanguard? Lead us out. Darian saluted, a foreign feeling growing within. At once, Corporal. He realized then, as the men formed up behind him, that it was pride. Her charge had faltered. Having met unforeseen resistance, the pact galvanized after the humbling of the Pardus. She had given up on the Magister, having lost sight of him in the madness that followed whatever he had done to the tanks. Reserves had begun to move, but they were too far back to make a damn difference, and the rest of the tanks were trapped behind the burning mess of their vanguard and would not deploy. It was up to those on the field to wrest this back from the shit heap it had become. Aramis surveyed the ragged battle line through scopes, her myopic view unable to properly convey just how much trouble they were all in. One decisive blow had rendered the armor useless, split the core of the army in half, and hindered any immediate reinforcement. The flanks had been left dangerously exposed, a well-crafted pincer reduced to a scrappy, misaligned and failed assault. She saw men regrouping, and reckoned on it being Regara's doing, but it was slow, and the troops were badly scattered. As her gaze alighted on a figure estranged from the wrecked vanguard, she tightened focus. It was Ganza, crawling backwards, one hand on the hilt of his sword, the other clawing at the earth as he dragged his useless legs after him. The Damagawa followed, imperious, threatening. 
his robes caught in a breeze, flecked with ash and flaring chips of cinder, parting to reveal his military garb beneath. Chainmail armor, a pistol, blade in a leather sheath. She could only watch, her impotence a leaden weight in her gut. The pact had stepped up their aggression, and her platoons were being held. Several men were dead, caught in the open ground between both sides, some of them priests. The order to withdraw and hold cover had been bitterly given. It was that, or risk a total rout. A hand on her shoulder got her attention, but her eyes remained ahead. We're strung out, Captain, said Hennessy. Roughly a hundred men in uncertain condition. And, Fink, the lieutenant is still with us, holding on the right. He reckons on forty left in his charge. Aramis swore. Have him ready his troops for assault. Gans is out there, though it may already be too late. She lowered the scopes and looked askance at a kneeling priest. A large chain blade sat on a cloth in front of him. He prayed to it, the catechisms tripping over his murmuring lips like incantations, preparing his soul for the emperor. Can you feel that, Gavid? she asked, as soon as Hennessy had finished speaking over the vox with Fink. The air had changed, grown thicker and heavier, like in the moment before a storm. Clouds boiled overhead, tinted red in the strange twilight fallen across the battlefield. Hennessy didn't answer, but made the sign of the Aquila across his chest. Aramis had fought the Infernal before. She had seen what the witch kind could do on both sides. She thought of it as a well, a great and fathomless well, within which resided the power to bend and reshape what was known, to cheat natural law. She had no understanding of it and no desire to learn, but it was dangerous, and could be drawn upon in different ways, ritualism, for instance. She didn't need scopes to see Ganza's fate, as the Damagawa bore down on him a toothed blade in his hand. Ganza screamed as the knife bit. The Damagawa straddled him, knees pinning the colonel's arms, his muscled frame hunched over like a feeding predator. He carved, slowly, intricately, murmuring an imprecation with every deliberate stroke. Smoke exuded from the wounds, just a trickle at first, but thickening with every second. Ganza writhed, almost beyond the capacity to give voice to his agony, the proud man reduced to a wailing shell. He screamed, and it was as if an echo overlaid the sound, a second deeper voice uttering alongside the first, only slightly out of sync. Fifty feet or so separated the dozen guardsmen from the Damagawa. They scurried at first, Darian moving quickly but cautiously as he tried not to draw attention. Halfway across the wreckage-strewn earth and the Damagawa's head jerked up, as if warned by some unearthly prescience. He was not alone. Three heavy-armoured pacted lurked just below and out of sight until the Volponi had broken cover. They reacted now, as the Damagawa called upon them, his voice a reverberant basso of guttural edges. The air between both sides grew hot, threaded with killing light. Darian felt it sear his cheek, bit back the pain, and pushed on. A last storm engulfed the Damagawa, but splashed ineffectually against some unseen barrier like rain hitting a pane of glass. The pack did killed ten of the twelve Volponi before Akna finished the last of the bastards with a frag grenade. He died a second later, shot through the eye by the Damagawa's sidearm. Only Darian remained, close enough to stab with his rifle's bayonet. The blade shattered on impact, turned aside by the Damagawa's wards. A knife slash nearly opened Darian's throat, and he fell back hard, his enemy so close he could smell the blood on the man's clothes, his armor, his every trapping. The cloying stench of warm iron suffused Darian's senses. Overwhelmed, he gagged and would have died to a ritual blade had Ganza not rammed his combat knife into the Damagawa's side. A trembling of air, a sudden, near imperceptible shimmer of a warding broken. Ganza died, 
his neck slit so wide it yawned like a second mouth. Scrabbling, Darian found the hilt of the dead colonel's sword and swung it in the emperor's name. The blade hacked into the Damagawa's neck, an ugly cut lodged in bone. A muffled cry issued through the grotesque, resonant and metallic. Bracing a boot against the man's shoulder, Darian heaved the blade free and swung again. Red matter sprayed him, swathing the front of his uniform, his face, his hands. Still the head remained attached. He sawed it loose, releasing flints of bone, and at the third stroke took Vauga's head, and with it the Battle of Myerland. Chapter 27 Colchis stood amongst the dead, watching the priests dispense mercy to the wounded. An eerie quiet had descended over the battlefield, which not so many hours ago had rung to the sound of fire and fury. He found another lying nearby, face down in the murk, and rolled him over. Not him. Pain contorted the dead man's face, and made claws of his fingers still clenched in the throes of frozen agony. Please not like that, Colchis murmured. Sir, ventured Rake. Keep looking, Colchis replied, and on they went. Hanmar raised a hand to get everyone's attention. More over here. They had dispersed over a wide area, sifting through the blood-clogged dirt and ruddy channels for the dead. There were plenty of them, for the badly wounded a stretcher, and if not that, then the gentle peace of an ecclesiarch's silver athame. Summary execution, desultorily delivered, awaited the packed survivors, those that seemed worthy of capture. Most were not, and even those found ways to commit suicide before questioning. Vauga's death had broken them, and as the triumphant declaration of Volponi glory, Volponi glory clarioned around the field, the enemy had lost heart, falling into disarray and retreat. The berserkers fought on, too maddened to relent. Heavy weapons teams put them down like dogs. Colchis and the others had emerged from cover at the sounding of Schiller's war horn, and they had found a soldier on a ridge, a foreign officer's sword upraised in his hand and bellowing for victory. It appeared Darian had not strayed far from his father's noble roots. Though a bastard, the thickness of his blood and his courage was beyond doubt. It was quite the sight, Colchis had reflected at the time, the lad standing like that, his enemy dispatched at his feet, so armed, worthy of the propaganda reels. The charge that followed had been decisive and merciless. The reserves, though committed by then, had not been needed. It was a slaughter, and Myland was won. But at a cost. Ganza's body had been amongst the first removed, the last remnants of the Pavis forming an honor guard for their slain colonel. They wrapped a powder's flag over him to hide the horror of his wounds. One of the men took care to hold up Ganza's head. Rumor had it the neck had been all but severed. The wreckage of the powder's tenth's desolation was still being cleared. So utter had the destruction been that it would take days. Another task for the diggers, thought Colchis. He followed to where Hanmar led them, the urbane corpsman at odds with this drudge and filth, but taking it in his stride nonetheless. He stopped at a clearing, a clutch of bodies there. A few floated on their backs like driftwood, the barest traces of putrefaction fattening their flesh with corpse gas. They were Orek, all of them, a carder of scouts caught unawares by the red swathe. One had crawled, Another man lay beside him, his face shot out and gaping like an excised pit. His would-be rescuer remained face down in the mud, and Colchis stalked over to him, possessed by a sudden and all-consuming desire to know this dead man's identity. Hand shaking, he turned him over, and his skin grew cold at the sight. Colchis sagged onto his haunches, then slipped to his knees, as he met the face of Honogano, a look of quiet repose upon his features. 
if not for the lack of breath and the grey pallor in his skin, one could almost believe him asleep. Who was he? asked Dresk, as he came in to stand beside his cousin. One of the Orek, said Hanmar. A sergeant, I think. A friend, Kulkis corrected. Please, he said, rising to his feet. Help me carry him. The Volponi hesitated but a moment, then, with somber dignity, bore Hanaganu from the fields of the dead to his final rest. Fenk roamed the battlefield alone, far enough away from the orbit of priests and the other mercy killers. He knelt, careful to keep his uniform dry of the brackish water in the shallow trench, and closed the dead private's eyes with two fingers as they glided across his face. He did so without looking, instead watching Kulkis as the lieutenant and his men lifted a dark-skinned Orek from amongst the slain. He recognized him. Fenk had a good eye for faces, but didn't know the soldier's name. He watched as they carried the dead man from the field in solemn procession, struggling every now and then as a boot became stuck in the mire or rake stumbled over his own feet. How reverent you are, Armand, he thought. All that guilt you carry as well as that cold body. Fenk's eyes scoured the field, ever vigilant, but there was no one nearby or even getting close. No one saw him, an invisible shade haunting the sundered forest. His gaze alighted on a group of Agrians watching Colchis and his troops, a dark look on the natives' faces. He knew these men too, though not their names. They had such unusual names, the Agrians, that felt strange on the tongue. They were Cossacks, and one spoke quietly to his neighbor as the others looked on, apparently at their labors. A great road had begun to take shape that would ferry what was left of the Pardas tanks across the Mireland and further south into Agria. Shouldering hammers and picks, one with an industrialized nail gun, they made a possible attempt to appear engaged in their work, but in truth they were hunting. Fenk recognized the look they had. He had seen it before, knew it intimately. A desire for murder. As Colchis and the others moved out of sight, the Agrians broke up as if at some unspoken pact and left for other parts of the field. Fenk watched them go, quite happy in his little trench with the dead. He glanced down at the private, and a glint of something caught his eye, partly smuggled beneath a lapel a leaf-shaped pin from Akastat, if he wasn't mistaken. The lad hailed from the Valponi Veda, the southern greenbelt land responsible for the majority of its crops. Fenk took it, and as he was rising, put the pin absent-mindedly into his pocket. The wind stirred, flecks of rain chilling the air, and Fenk pulled up his collar and canted down the visor of his cap. He couldn't leave, not yet. The grey host was calling, and he was powerless to do anything but answer. Chapter 28 Word had spread swiftly around the camp. Darian returned weary from the battle, wanting nothing more than to bathe, then sleep, if he could. Men stopped him as he walked, they wanted to shake his hand, clap him on the shoulder, as if he were an old comrade reunited, bask in his reflected glory. A crowd gathered on the way to his barrack tent, soldiers he didn't know. They smiled warmly, sharing jokes and anecdotes. Darian was struck dumb by their adulation. He smiled, too, echoing the men around him, laughing when they laughed, falling silent when they grew solemn, it was a dance to an unfamiliar tune. They are saying you slew Vauga with one blow. It came from behind him, as the first of the crowds were dispersing, a woman's voice. Did you? she asked pointedly. She was tall, broad-shouldered. Her silver helm was cradled in the crook of her arm, long red hair bound up in a tight bun behind her head. She was striking, and obviously formidable. Darian fought to bring forth his words, 
awkward and slightly cowed by this woman. I can scarcely remember, sir, said Darian. She smiled a satisfied smile, neither warm nor cold. Some are saying, you are brave for what you did. I agree. The Blue Bloods need brave men. And women, she smirked. And women. Darian glanced past her, at a clutch of soldiers standing at the periphery who had not partaken in the theatre of histrionics. These men muttered under their breath and threw venomous looks. He knew what they called him, what they would always think of him. Schiller lurked amongst them, but didn't linger. Not everyone sees it as you do, sir. She followed his gaze in time to see the captain tromping off, ruddy-faced and doubtless in search of a drink. To them, I will only ever be a deg. His voice was bitter, his eyes narrowed and hard. I could slay Horus himself, and they'd still think that way. Prejudice is ingrained, and men of standing, justified or otherwise, do not like others encroaching on what they perceive as theirs. He knew then why her troops followed her. He would have followed her in that moment. She had presence and a worldly wisdom Darian found reassuring, inspiring. They would rather I be in the ground, another pauper in a grave, like all the rest. I am a cheat to them. My father's influence the only reason I am in this uniform. She laughed wryly. And how do you think they ended up where they are? Their ranks, their stations? She began to walk away. I think I like you, De Vere's. You have your father's unassuming charm, but none of his learned arrogance. Hang on to that. Darian watched her depart. She was Ione Aramis, an officer of the 86th. He didn't know her heritage, but her bearing was noble. He hoped he could aspire to it. A few of the soldiers still called his name as he passed through the rest of the camp, and he raised a hand in acknowledgement or gave a swift salute in reply. Unease fomented within him. I am no hero, he thought. He had watched Ganza die, throat opened like a kit bag, red as a sunrise within. He had taken the man's sword and killed the Damagawa, hacked off Vauga's head in three messy blows. His skin still itched with sprayed blood. It was far from triumphant or heroic. It was ugly and desperate. He had been trying to save Ganza. Afterwards, he couldn't stop shivering, and Kulkis had lent him his cloak. It still draped around his shoulders like some greater hunter's mantle. Only Darian knew the lie of it. The lieutenant and the others had gone back into the fields of the dead, looking for slain comrades, or else to help the priests give the dying a merciful death. Others had gone too, though by the feral look in the eyes of the Talpa, Darian wondered if they would not be scavenging instead. For every moral act, war gave up a base one to counter it. Cooking smells, faint on the air, drew him, and he found one of the few mess tents. Dingy lamps lit the interior, the atmosphere close and subdued. An OREC mess sergeant stirred a large drum of meaty broth, and even the Volponi were eating it, though it was a far cry from filleted steak and sautéed greens. Darian noticed Grice, the burly sergeant, eating eagerly from a large bowl. His face was bruised, and sutures cross-hatched his skin, but he was otherwise hale. Grice beckoned him over, and Darian was about to join him when a table of Pardus tankers recognized him and rose to their feet. They began to clap, though their expressions remained solemn. Others in the mess tent took note, turning to regard Darian as a murmured hubbub gathered momentum around the room. One man cried out, for the hero of Loden and the saviour of Myerland. Volpone glory, they rejoined. Volpone glory. Feet stamped, mugs rapped on tables. Volpone glory. Even the Pardus shouted now. 
Darian hastily nodded his appreciation and left. He headed away from the heart of the camp, not stopping until he reached the baggage train. Much had already been unloaded, the tents and supplies, clean water, victuals. Darian watched the servants work, his old life feeling more distant than ever. They kept their eyes down and on their labors. He might not be officer class, but to them he was still a royal, and thus a man to be wary of. A girl struggled, carrying a heap of sheets and blankets, the fine material marking it out as destined for Volponi barracks. She stumbled, half blind, face hidden behind the towering linens, and Darian reached over to help her. Steady there, he said, before he saw her face, and his heart caught in his throat. I apologize, sir, she uttered profusely, eyes downcast. Please, I didn't mean to touch you. I'd get on my way. Be more careful in the... Lena, said Darian, his voice a half-whisper. It's me. The girl blinked, her expression blank. I'm sorry, sir. I don't think I know you. He took off his private's cap. It's Darian. The scales fell from her eyes, but her elation swiftly faded, and she looked away. What you must think of me? Darian took the sheets and blankets, setting them down on the storeroom floor. Think of you? I have done nothing else, Lena. He held her face gently, turned it to look at him so she could see his sincerity. Tears rolled unfettered down her face. God, Emperor Darian, she wept. I thought you were dead. His face darkened briefly. I almost was, for a while, he smiled. I'm in the army now, Volponi 50th, she frowned. How? What happened? I don't... I tried to find you, but so much has changed. He licked his lips, choking back tears of his own. I have so much to tell you. But Lena shrank back, ashamed by her servile condition. You shouldn't talk to me, Darian. It won't go well for you. You're royal now, though I can't begin to fathom how. But know that no one is more pleased for you than I. Lena, please. He went to reach for her, but she stepped back again, the shadows of the storeroom enfolding her. He was about to step again when an overseer shouted at her. You there, girl! A logistician in Munitorum Olive Drab bellowed at her from across the storeroom. He had a data slate crooked in one arm, taking inventory. Pick those up, he began, but paled when Darian intercepted him. Sir... I didn't realize you were there, Darian berated him, tearing strips off the logistician, who quailed before his anger, apologized profusely, and left for some other duty, whether he had one or not. When Darian turned to find Lena, she had already fled. Chapter 29 The Med Tent reeked of chlorine and counterseptic. Regara's leg had been removed, or what was left of it anyway, his flesh stump cleaned and dressed. It had taken a couple of days to get him to visit the medics, his desire to see the battle through and manage part of its aftermath greater than the need for pain relief. A tech priest lurked nearby, his mechadendrites shaped like a pair of calipers, he had just taken the Major's measurements and sent instruction via Binharic Lingua Technis for a replacement limb to be made according to specification. Such augmetics were rare amongst the common soldiery, but not to an officer, and certainly not to a Volponi. A thing of chrome and gilded beauty would be forged, calibrated and fitted in relatively short order. Regara merely had to wait. Through an open flap in the tent, he watched the Agrians tramp into the field again, tools slung over shoulders, materials dragged on iron sleds as they took up axe and hammer. More rain today, though it was light enough, but with the sky's darkened promise overhead. 
a road would be built, regardless of weather, the wreckage of tanks cleared, and what was left of the Pardus would be able to advance. It had taken three days so far, and Grossman seemed none too keen to linger, but he had little choice, as he needed to regroup and plan. The loss of the Pavis was a blow, no other way to regard it. They numbered a handful of war engines now, idling in a dwindled pack, waiting for the miles of flackboard and steel plate to be laid and relayed. A second lieutenant called Bragger was in charge now, what with Ganza killed in action. They had burned him, as was their way. The shame of it, such decimation of their former strength. How they still held their heads up, Regara did not know. He glanced away, unwilling to share in their degradation, even vicariously, and alighted on the only other inhabitant of his med tent. You will get used to it, he said. A woman in vest and fatigues looked up at the sound of his voice as she bent and extended a fresh bionic in slow repetition. Gannica, isn't it? Regara went on. Ren Saint's aid. We met at the quarter back in Ankishburg. Yes, sir, Gannica answered, trying to make a salute with her arm but falling just short. She scowled. Regara smiled. It will get easier. I would give my body for the throne, she said, but I had not imagined doing so one piece at a time. That is how we serve in the Militarum. Didn't they teach you that at the Scholar Progenium? Gannica grimaced in what may have been an attempted smile, then gestured to his missing limb. Regara patted the stump. Nasadon, many years ago, when I was a younger man, still aches when it gets cold. Yours will too, probably. She regarded the bionic like it was a foreign entity. They said they'd calibrate it, the red priests. I dare say they'll murmur a few prayers, sprinkle it with unguents. Gannica cocked a brow. You sound disdainful, Major. Merely ignorant. The mysteries of the Omnissiah are profound and unfathomable to a man such as I. It is better to conceal one's knowledge than reveal one's ignorance. Barbastian strode across the camp, his half-cloak catching in the breeze like a banner. Or so I have heard it said by some imperial scholars. Tousled blonde hair trailed across his handsome face, and he swept it away with a velvet-gloved hand. He wore sparse armor, limited to a silver shoulder guard, and favoured a fine grey waistcoat under his uniform jacket, though the former looked reinforced. He had a quiet confidence, did the lieutenant colonel. A cultured man, he knew much about victuals and wine, music and art. He had more martial talents too, of course, swordsmanship, skill with pistol and rifle. The soldiers under his command followed him because they loved him, the equation was simple enough to fathom. Philip Barbastian had an air about him. He provoked hope. Deep down, most men in the guard just wanted to live, to survive the next battle. Barbastian instilled the belief in them that this feat was possible. He had sent men to their deaths. Regara had seen him do it. But they always went willingly, as if following the siren song. And which am I doing, Philip? Regara asked, and nodded to the man who accompanied him by way of greeting. Gannica sketched a quick salute, wisely using her flesh-and-blood arm. Rensaint ordered her at ease. A little of both, I'd say, the Lord Commissar answered for the Lieutenant Colonel. He wore his black long coat, a silver-headed walking cane in one hand. Regara noticed it at once. Having trouble, Lord Commissar? Caught some shrapnel during the incident. Hurts when I walk for too long. Incident? Ever politic, eh, Owen? I have a silver skull on my cap for a reason, Vasquez. He gave a wry smile. But they all felt the bitterness of memory, of sifting through the aftermath of the grenade blast.
It still defied meaning, as did the mindless babble of the man who had pulled the pin and unleashed death and blood. Perhaps they would never find out why. Regara praised them both, a motley pairing of Volponi dandy and avian perfectus. I assume you're not here to school me on philosophy, gentlemen? Ren Saint gave a sharp but surreptitious glance to Gannica, who left the tent and went on her way. The Red Priest had long since departed into the shadowy depths, chirping in fits and squalls of harsh ben Harrick, and so the three men were alone. Regara gave a thin smile. Not a social call, then, Philip? Barbastian looked down at Regara's missing leg. I always did hate that thing, the metal, the wires. It wasn't you. The old leg is dead dust, just like Nacedon. He waited patiently for Philip to elaborate, while Ren Saint quietly kept his peace. You're off the line until the leg is replaced. The fiftieth will be under Major Aramis, until further notice. Regara paled. He thought he'd be taken off field duties, but assumed he'd still fulfill strategic and command. Major Aramis, the female officer from the 86th, Field promotion, she's the replacement for an officer called Pallard, said Ren Saint. Pallard has been dead for weeks. The Lord Commissar could only offer an aphorism. The wheels of imperial bureaucracy grind ever slow. Granted, but where then am I to take up a post? asked Regara, carefully bridling his anger. The auxiliaries, said Barbastian. I'm sorry. Vasquez, I tried to dissuade him. That's the bloody diggers. Grossman, that bastard. He shuffled to the edge of the bed where he was sitting and reached for the metal crutch leaning against the frame. Barbastian gave him a despairing look. Throne, Vasquez, don't be rash. Regara slid off the bed, picking up his jacket and slinging it over one arm, the other draped over the crutch. I am never rash, he replied coldly, never, and proceeded to belt on his pistol and saber. The blade rattled with sympathetic anger in its sheath as Regara jerked it around his waist. He jutted his chin at Ren Saint. Is that why you're here, to stop me from shooting him? Are you? Am I what? About to shoot him. I actually came to offer moral support and see to my aid, but now you mention it. If he dies, he dies the Volponi way. Ren Saint stepped forwards, his expression serious. What does that mean, Major? Nothing, snapped Regara. I'm letting off steam. On Volponi, honorable men settle their differences with a duel. Ren Saint frowned, nonplussed. You'll duel the colonel? Of course not. It's a figure of speech. Barbastian crouched to help Regara with his boot, lacing and clasping it tightly around the major's ankle. It seldom comes to bloodshed, he explained pointedly, though his eyes were on Regara. Attempts are first made at reconciliation. It's rare for one man to kill another. You mean like I killed his damn uncle? That rare, Philip? Ren Saint's eyes narrowed. There's history between you. It was over fifty years ago. I was a reckless boy, said Regara. And there's history between most royal Volponi households. My father settled the debt. Blood wage was averted. The silence held an unspoken question, which Barbastian answered as he finished up with Regara's boot. It literally means balanced by blood, a vendetta. If an accord cannot be reached, one man cuts another's cheek like this. He mimed it, his thumb standing in for the knife. Just a nick, nothing deeper, to signal the slight is not forgiven. A duel follows. Yours is a violent culture, observed Ren Saint. Barbastian made a face suggesting you have no idea, before he got out of Regara's way. 
The Major limped purposefully from the med tent, bound for the camp interior. I promise I won't kill him, he said to Ren Saint, or you can shoot me yourself. Grossman was sitting at his desk when Regara entered the command structure. Major, the colonel began magnanimously, not looking up from his quill and papers, his brow furrowed as he reviewed a stack of reports, an auto-quill dancing lividly over a piece of parchment, consolidating all the pertinent information. What can I do for you? he added. I hope you're feeling recovered. You have revoked my command, Regara stated flatly. Grossman kept his eyes on his work. I have merely suspended it. There was a barely-touched bottle of Vresk on the table that looked like one of Devere's private stock. Regara wondered what else Grossman had pilfered. As well as the desk, there were cabinets, a hololith table, and several wall-mounted maps and charts. No phonograph, no books. The colonel was all business in his elevated role. He had a private weapons rack, an armature for his uniform, but that was all. And the field promotion for Aramis? asked Regara. Overdue, she has excelled. I have no disagreement with that. Grossman at last looked up, setting the autoquill to dormant. Then what do you have disagreement with, Major? His eyeglasses perched at the end of an aquiline nose, his hooded gaze as green and dark as an ocean trench. I am being sidelined. It was bold, but Regara was angry. You are recovering from trauma. I accredit your current behavior to this factor also. They're my command, the 50th. Aramis is a capable officer. She is overstretched. It is what's best for the regiment. You'll return soon enough. And when will that be, might I ask, sir? As he had made his way through the temporary array of prefab billets, munition silos, and cook tents, Regara had learned the Magos had been dismissed. Without his expertise, the fabrication of a replacement bionic would take weeks instead of days. As soon as you're back on your feet, sorry, foot, Regara caught the curl at the edge of Grossman's mouth, felt his jaw clench. A situation which would be dramatically expedited by the presence of our Magos. Ah, said Grossman, glancing at the chrono in one corner of the desk. An undertaking that could not be avoided delays the Magos. The lesser tech priests will stand in, of course. Until then, you're with the auxiliaries. I sent Barbastian to relay the order. I assume he missed you. Regara could tell by the quirk of Grossman's lips that this was a lie. He took a breath, unclenched his fists. The crutch dug into his armpit. It ached all the way to his shoulder and chest. Grossman had no chairs other than the one he was sitting in. Visitors were expected to stand in his presence. Regara's voice grated. There's no honor in it. And you are half a man, Vasquez. It was the first time Grossman had raised his voice during the exchange, but he softened his tone quickly as if suddenly remembering his position and therefore what was expected of him. I cannot have a Volponi officer invalided as you are on the front line. A cripple cannot lead men. They will not follow you. He smoothed his moustache, licking his lips as he glanced at the bottle of Vresk. Service to the Militarum and by extension the God Emperor himself is honor enough, he said, his voice placatory. But Regara could tell he was enjoying this. Or it should be. I understand your upset, Major, but I have to balance the needs of the army, not one officer. Regara wanted to say more, but it would be a pointless exercise. He'd done what he came here to do. Look Grossman in the eye and confirm what he thought was true. Anything else would be reckless and foolish. Of course, sir, he said between clenched teeth. I understand. My desire is to serve the Imperium. Grossman smiled, and there was something triumphal in the curve of his mouth and the narrowing of his eyes as he did it. Regara was careful to keep his hands firmly locked behind his back. 
The colonel glanced again at the chrono just as an adjutant appeared at the entrance to his chambers. Grossman shooed the corporal away, saying, Yes, I'm ready, then turned his gaze back on Regara. You might as well stay for this, Major. The door to the prefab command center lurched open, and several officers began to file in, Barbastian and Rensainter amongst them. Regara gave a curt nod, then looked away, his knuckles white behind his back. The entirety of the Volponi Upper Echelon Command waited patiently. At length, Grossman came to stand in front of his desk, facing the semicircle of officers, a king in his own court. He gestured to his adjutant, who engaged the hololith table, revealing the militarum offices of the Western and Eastern Fronts as flickering and grainy projections. It began prosaically enough with the reports from Colonel Stadish of the West Army Group. Vogner Stadish had replaced De Vere's when the Southern Front had been deemed of greatest strategic importance and the General's redeployment had followed. Stadish was a veteran with several campaign honors. He had the broad, well-nourished frame typical of Volponi stock and thick, dark eyebrows. Even without the hololith vox output, he was quietly spoken, hinting at some old injury that had ravaged his voice. Evidently, the man usually wore a vox amplifier, a grisly mechanicus augmetic that turned his face into a cybernetic horror, but the device wouldn't sync well with the hololith's audio. Raw scarification hinted at through the grainy resolution suggested he wore it painfully. Stadish spoke of a trying few months and little headway. Voke's missteps earlier in the war had left him with bare bones as far as fighting men were concerned. Compounded by further casualties to guerrilla attacks, the operations to disrupt packed supply and reinforcement had only been partially successful. Major Enghart of the East Army had a similar story though he expressed doubts at how reliant the packed forces were on resupply, seeing fewer and fewer forces of significant military strength, and citing that most of their engagements had consisted of frustrating and costly skirmishes. A younger man with a haughty disposition and a carefully groomed moustache, he punctuated his words with bombastic vim and vitriol, trying to catch Grossman's eye so he would perceive in him something others evidently had not. Given the East Army was largely confined to chasing down stragglers and overseeing the security of Imperial-held assets, then matters turned to the South Army, and here Barbastian took the stage. Our losses have been severe, he began grimly, not least of which the Pardus, the Pavis comprising the majority of our armoured strength in the region. He looked to Grossman, who stood like a statue, his face permanently stern. Despite the victory at Myerland, it is a blow, and a hard one to recover from, considering the road ahead. A few eyes went to Braga, the de facto leader of the Pardus remnants, and one of the few non-Volponi in the room, but the man kept his gaze just below the faces of the other officers, his expression pinched. Resistance is entrenched, light but well organized, Barbastian went on. I won't dress it up, General. Our resolve is at a low ebb. He flicked a glance at Rensaint at this remark, but the Lord Commissar gave nothing away as he listened pensively. Conventional wisdom would suggest we consolidate our gains and await reinforcement, offered Stadish, his voice ghostly through the box. Barbastian agreed and said as much to the general. There are reserves to the north and others on Nostis at large that could be called upon. Grossman shook his head, a gargoyle defying the apparent immobility of its own form. We broke them at Lawton and at Myerland. I won't countenance any further delays and waste this advantage. We must stay determined and end this war on our terms. Barbastian was quick to make amends. No one here disputes the military efficacy and commitment of our troops, Colonel. But those victories were costly, the loss of the Pardus alone. Grossman cut him off. I have spoken. 
No relenting. We push now, and we push them all the way to Carcass. That's it. If we let up, they will punish us for it. Aramis, freshly minted in her elevated role, spoke up. Gannard will be a much harder prospect, sir. Loddon was a battered and shell-blasted town, mile and a scrap of marsh, with a few hastily dug entrenchments. Gannard is a fortified position and will be well garrisoned. Are we to shirk every time we face stern resistance? asked Grossman, though he turned his mild ire on the room, not just Aramis. I won't deny the pact have given us the runaround, but to fight them man to man, our strength matched against their defenses? I would take that opportunity. To do otherwise would be to accept defeat before a shot is fired. No one here in this room is advocating that, General, Aramis rejoined. But as Lieutenant Colonel Barbastian asserted, she exchanged a quick glance with him, the morale of the men is low. They are fighting in dirt, dying in filth. War is dying in filth, Major, said Regara, the first thing he had uttered since the council had begun. He tried to keep his tone civil, but Aramis's askance look suggested he'd spoken with more bite than intended. In the end, Schiller rescued him. Not for the Volpone it isn't he said, a palpable heat radiating from his ruddy cheeks, the air around him thick with the smell of cheap amasek. We're above all that. Perhaps it's time we weren't, Aramis replied. Meaning? asked Regara. Meaning we've fed off our lessers long enough. I have no issue getting mud on my boots. Nor I, said Regara, engaging despite his better judgment. Have you issue with your heritage, Major Aramis? I once told a man I would not apologize for it, but now I am not so sure. Sympathy for the commoners is one thing, slurred Schiller, but surely you're not saying they're our equals? A few chuckles at this. Even Barbastian raised a wry smile. Bragger of the Pardus said nothing. We inspire said Regara, act as exemplars to our lessers. Grossman interjected, content at first to let the discussion play out, but eager now to press on. All the more reason to tilt hard at Ganad, he said. Victories inspire confidence, even more so once the Volponi standard is flying over that damn stockade. We have lost ourselves in the mud and filth. We need a reminder of what Volponi glory means. That begins with the end of Ganad. He turned his attention back to Barbastian. What's our strategic position? According to Militarum Intelligence, there are several minor outposts en route to Ganad. These will have to be sacked and cleared before we can press on to Vigath's Moor. And then... The bridge itself. Then we find a way, said Grossman flatly, temper just fraying at the edges. I do not care how. It must be done. I won't fail. We won't fail. We cannot. Our honor is at stake. What of God's sword? asked Schiller. Can that be brought to bear? It is a symbol and nothing more, Regara said bitterly. It doesn't have the range to reach Carcass. Barbastian nodded. Its purpose was to anchor Lawton and hammer the pact as far as Myerland, a purpose it never served. Do not concern yourselves with God's sword, said Grossman, a secret behind his eyes that he wasn't about to reveal. Tell me how we breach Carcass. Barbastian went on. We believe the pact have withdrawn most of their forces to Ganad and the border wall at Carcass. This will be heavily reinforced. We don't yet know why they have been pulling their troops back. Perhaps it relates to Scylla. But it's clear their plan is to bleed us slowly with feints and raids. If that continues, we will not be in a fit state to take Rakespeare. Which brings us back to reinforcements from the other fronts, said Stadish in a rasping vox crackle. 
Enghart looked about to contribute, having gauged his moment carefully, when the audio fizzled out and then the visual feed, much to the young officer's mute annoyance. The last sight of the Major was Enghart ferociously berating his staff outside of projection range. Barely anyone noticed. If we wait, we only give the pact even more time to dig in and fortify their position. We have the ascendancy here. Grossman smacked a fist into his open palm for emphasis, warming to his role as orator. Let us take it and send these bastards back to the hells. It had all the verve of De Vere's, but not the flair or the common sense. Grossman suggested a hammer, bluntly wielded, when they needed a careful incision into a place of weakness. Rensaint cleared his throat, the pipe he had been smoking cupped in the bowl of his hand and lightly smouldering. A glass spear, however well-tempered and thrown, will always splinter when it strikes rock. What by the nine devils is that supposed to mean? said Grossman, becoming increasingly exasperated. Only that we hold the glass spear and the pact are the rock. But I agree that we cannot wait. Cessation of hostilities will set us back months, even years. Beltane and Thrake, it could all end up being for nothing. I am not a military strategist, though I have the training. I do not possess the experience here in this room, but I understand the hearts and minds of soldiers and what motivates them. He paused, a clever moment to ensure he had everyone's attention. We must turn our glass into steel, he said, his gaze touring the room. And as his regard reached Regara, the Major caught a true measure of the man for the first time. Ren Saint's eyes caught the light and flashed with a vital luster. Now, let me tell you how. Chapter 30 It took a while before Colchis found the right barracks. Night had drawn in, after casualties had been tallied, and individual squads dissolved and absorbed into larger bodies to make them militarily viable again. Recognizing the old shape of the regiment had been almost impossible. It had been days, and still he kept getting lost. This was it, though, the part of the camp devoted to the 86th and 50th Volponi, a soup of some four and a half thousand men scattered across prefab barrack houses and tents. The light in Fenk's lodgings remained doused. Kulkis had been watching it for the last several minutes, ostensibly warming his ungloved hands on an electro-brazier. It wasn't a lie. Ice in the air gave it a bitter chill, and he tugged his collar up a little higher. An added benefit was that it also hid his face from any passing troopers. No one bothered him. He kept his eyes low most of the time. After a sufficient duration had passed, Kulkis pulled on his gloves and walked across the camp grounds. Upon reaching the barrack house, he paused momentarily to listen and then entered. Darkness met him, and he cursed as he banged into a chair. Eyes adjusting to the gloom, he made out a sparsely furnished room, neatly arranged and everything in its place. He'd need to be careful— and he worried briefly about the chair he had dislodged, but quickly dismissed it as paranoia. On the table there sat a simple shaving kit, the bowl and razor cleaned, the cloth graying with use but washed and folded. A metal mug stood next to a can of recaf, again washed and tidied to one side. Getting down onto his knees, Kulkis searched under the bed and found a standard-issue kit bag, Inside it were spare socks, a storm cloak, and spare uniform. A plastic case briefly aroused interest, until it turned out to be nothing more than a utensils kit. An ammunition belt and bandolier were slung over the chair back, but done so neatly, across the exact middle of the backrest. Empty, then. Kulkis stood, letting out an exasperated sigh. He sat on the bed, hoping a different perspective might yield something he had missed, 
and considered risking a little light from the sodium lamp on the table. Then he felt it, a creak of wood, certainly something yielding to his weight, not the frame, it was metal and sprung with wire. A thin mattress was upturned easily enough, but revealed nothing in its absence but the floor of the room. Nothing under the blankets either. But Colchis had felt it, hadn't he? As he had sat down, the frame had shifted, and... Leaving the mattress upturned and resting against the wall, he sank back into a crouch and proceeded to run his hand around the thick frame. He did it blind, his hand under the bed and searching by touch alone. When his fingers brushed against the wooden box, Kulkis knew he had found what he was looking for. Carefully removing the tape that had been used to fix the box in place, he brought it slowly into the ambient light. Even in darkness he could see it was ornate, volponi red oak like hardened vermilion. A simple brass clasp held the lid shut, also locked. It would have been so easy, his knife under the catch, a little pressure, but then Fink would know, and it might be nothing. He cursed, knowing there was nothing else to be done, and left quickly, only lingering long enough to put the room back in order. Everything was returned as he had found it, even the red oak box. Colchis only took his baseless suspicions with him. He had no proof, only a feeling, and one could not accuse a man, especially a fellow officer, on such a basis. He needed more. Colchis had been considering the means of accomplishing that, as he hurried back through camp when he noticed the Cossack in front of him. The lieutenant had taken a circuitous route in an attempt at maintaining his anonymity and had strayed into a part of the camp reserved for the magazine and munitorum stores. It was quiet and at this hour seldom travelled. The boxy silos created narrow alleyways and cramped thoroughfares from one store to the next. Colchis was caught between them. He hadn't thought to bring a weapon. Even his knife was back at the barrack house along with his sidearm. A glint of steel revealed the Cossack found himself better prepared. Colchis turned on his heel, too savvy to risk a confrontation in such close confines, and found a second Cossack behind him, similarly armed. He knew both men, of course, at least by sight, Osra's men, and they had come to kill him. Colchis backed up slowly, careful to keep both Cossacks in his eyeline. They advanced with deliberate menace, eager to draw this out, make him suffer, make him fear. After the wirewolves, Kulkis had no fear left to give. These men didn't scare him, but that didn't make their knives any less sharp, or his chances of survival much greater. I suppose it would not matter if I told you I had nothing to do with your hetman's death. Condemned men will say anything to save themselves. As emphatic a reply as any, Colchis murmured under his breath, tensing for a fight. He edged closer to the first Cossack, hoping to goad him on. The lunge was fast, the blade skidding across the lieutenant's midriff as he sidestepped, tearing his uniform and drawing a thin red line in its wake. Colchis winced at the sudden pain, but trapped the Cossack's arm and smacked his forearm hard against the man's wrist, disarming him. The blade clattered on the ground. His ally was already coming, though, having seen through the lieutenant's ruse a little too late. But not so late he couldn't slash at him when Colchis was off balance. Deeper this time, the cut raking his chest and eliciting a sharp cry. The second slash carved left to right, forcing Colchis to flinch back or be gutted. A well-placed kick to the armed Cossack's leg sent him howling, the kneecap shattered. Thick arms wrapped around the lieutenant's shoulders, and the air was punched from his lungs as the first Cossack tried to crush him. No, not crush him, hold him. The other Cossack might be lame, but he still had a knife. Blood rhymed the jagged edge, his blood. Kulkis pushed back, staggering the man holding him, but couldn't get loose. He kicked out at the aggressor in front instead, and the knife man reeled, his nose bloody. It won't buy you peace! Colchis raged. This is murder! Unlawful killing! You'll be hung! Neither Cossack answered. They didn't care about the rope. 
It was in their eyes, Kulkis saw it, the desire for a dress. One of ours for one of theirs. The arithmetic of revenge was banally simple. Kulkis struggled to die like this in some backwater place. He searched for a light, for anything, but refrained from shouting out. I will have my dignity, he said to himself, and thought of all the things left undone, of every regret. Then he saw the knife again. A flash presaged the Cossack, dropping the weapon in a hiss of pain and pulling his wounded hand against his body. The stench of seared flesh filled the air, the rapid burn and cauterization of a las gun, the telltale shriek already fading. Nice evening for a walk. Fink appeared from the end of the camp that led to the former battlefield of Myerland. He aimed a las pistol. His long, tapered fingers hung loosely around the stock and trigger. A gentle coil of smoke unfurled from the barrel mouth. He held it outstretched like a duelist, almost lazily, as if he knew he could kill these men as easily as breathing. Colchis tried to breathe, too, but a darkness lived in Fenk's eyes, an abyssal black reserved for deep-ocean predators on the hunt. He could not determine if he were now in lesser or greater peril. The Cossacks apparently felt the same trepidation, the one with the burnt hand didn't move. The other, who had his back to Fenk, tried to turn and lessened his grip. I thought I was the only one abroad tonight. He said this to Colchis before his gaze fell upon the others. No moons, no stars, he continued. Just the endless void above us. Fig off, uttered the Cossack with the injured hand, belligerent despite the gun in his face. No business of yours here. I have a fondness for knives, Fenk went on, as if the other man hadn't spoken. Yours looks sharp, that serrated edge. He sucked in an excited breath. I bet it really tears, doesn't it? Pears skin, flesh from bone, a filleting blade. I wish I had a knife like that. Something like avarice flashed in his cold eyes. All the while he kept the weapon trained. The effort of holding it must have been straining his arm, but Fenk showed no sign of discomfort. See this? The Cossacks exchanged an incredulous look. M.G. variant las pistol forged on Akatran. It's a heavy sidearm, high energy expenditure, very powerful, but no recoil. That shriek when the coils charge and release, the scent as it burns skin. I mean, you know, he said, nodding and smiling, goading the wounded Cossack to agree, then in a more sinister tone added, don't you? He reasserted his grip on the stock, grew still. At this range, a las pistol will flash fry the contents of a man's skull instantly. Have you ever smelled cooked brains? It's quite something. Rancid, of course, but something. The first Cossack released Colchis, a nod to his partner, and the two men backed away. Keep knife said the one with the shattered kneecap, his friend helping him to limp away. See for yourself how it tears. I think I might, Fenk murmured. As the Cossacks fled into the camp, he lowered and holstered his pistol. Did you find what you were looking for? he asked. Kulkis felt his heart lurch, acutely aware of the hurts to his body and not relishing the thought of taking on Fenk right now. He could have lied, said he was performing a patrol or getting some air. Not yet, Fenk smiled, an adder's mouth curling at the edges. It didn't reach his eyes, which remained predatorily cold as he stooped and retrieved the knife. That's a pity, he said, rising again. I don't think those men like you too much. They think I murdered someone. Oh? They have the wrong man, Fenk frowned. Is that so? They didn't appear to care overly. Fortunate I came along. 
And where were you, Lieutenant? Kolkis asked, looking past Feng's shoulder to the darkness at the edge of camp and the old battlefield beyond. Feng's smile returned, broader than before, but with less mirth. I've always liked you, Armand, he said, easing by the other lieutenant without a second glance. Always, he uttered, voice swept off by the shadows and the night, leaving Kulkis with his wounds and his life. Darian had eaten alone that night, uncomfortable with the attention in the mess hall. He didn't feel like a hero, far from it. He had managed to scrounge up a little grub from a clutch of Agrian natives, who seemed uninterested or indifferent to his name and ancestry. The anonymity was comforting. He wandered now, a full stomach still something of a novelty, roaming the camp. Sleep was a futile exercise in frustration, and in any case, whenever he closed his eyes, he saw Ganza begging for his life, and then that bastard looming over him. Three ugly blows, a messy execution, and they lauded him for it. He might as well have been chopping wood for his lack of efficacy. Mill serves hurried to and fro, their business in the night hours as well as the day. Perhaps that was another reason why he couldn't sleep. Idle hands. Ordinarily he would have been scrubbing or carrying or polishing. A ream of duties as long as any banner pole. To sleep, to have freedom, even leisure. It was a foreign country to Darian. Ill at ease with the skin into which he was born, and now the mantle of nobility he had inherited. Lena was not amongst the busy servants and finding her amongst thousands would be a difficult task, assuming she would even speak with him if he did achieve the impossible. Throne, her face like a scalded felid, terrified. Am I a foreign country to her now? Darian wondered bleakly. A victory party was in full swing, and its bawdy revels wrenched Darian from his maudlin thoughts. A barrack house, his barrack house, he had come full circle, and in his absence his comrades had decided to blow off some steam. He saw the culprit at once, Rake leaning against the doorway, a goblet in his hand. Catching sight of Darian, he beckoned him. The light was welcoming, and it would be easy to embrace it, the warmth of their camaraderie. But the dead wouldn't leave him and his skin wouldn't stop itching in a uniform he hadn't earned, so he turned on his heel and walked away. Wren Saint stood in his way, like a crow perched in the street before him. It doesn't rest easy, does it? Lord Commissar? Fame, prestige, take your pick. It is unsettling, Darian admitted. That will change, believe me. But make no mistake, Darian, you showed everyone the measure of your courage at Meyerland. I see great things for you, great things, if you would allow me to guide you. Darian hesitated. But he wanted this, didn't he? The chance to serve, to be worthy. Why would you do that? because each of us has a purpose. Mine is to instill greatness, or help men find courage when they lack it. I see a purpose for you, Darian. You have but to grasp it. I want that, said Darian, as a sense of longing stoked within him to belong, to be someone. More than anything, Rensaint smiled, cold and piercing. Then let me teach you. Chapter 31 The scent of clover wafted in through an open window, the heat and light of Padua's sun shimmering gently against the half-turned blinds. It was morning, and a warm bed cradled his body, the aroma of strong recaf on the air. Soothing murmurs came from the room next door, the clatter of dishes, a table being prepared. Chari, 
She was near, whispering softly to their gurgling baby boy, mother and son enjoying the fruits of a peaceful and intimate moment. Let me be with you. Outside the hab, a ship was coming. Engines vibrated on the breeze, growing louder. The blinds rippled harder, a rattling staccato that drowned out mother and son. Let me stay. A faraway drone became the shriek of landing jets and the churn of stanchions unfolding beneath a mustard yellow hull. Just a little longer. He could almost taste that bitter recaf. Chari always brooded too long. It reminded him of home before the reek of petrochem and physaline overwhelmed it. Then he didn't taste much of anything at all until the light flicker coming through the blinds faded and the soft lambency of the room drifted away, leaving only blood. Hauptmann jerked awake, half-choking, coughing into a red, raw throat, every inch of his body aching like pummeled meat. There was blood on the floor, his blood, a red pattern of coughed-up splashes. Something stroked his cheek. His fingers came back wet, and he realized they were tears. Hot stones surrounded him, a room with a single iron door and slitted apertures in the walls. He was unbound, alone, though his boots had been taken, and his weapons. He still had his uniform, worn and roughed up, though it now was. A wad of parchment in his breast pocket pressed against his chest. They had left those, too. Eyes slowly adjusting to the dingy chamber, Hauptmann lurched to his feet. A little light bled through the apertures. As he tried to peer through one and get some sense of his bearings, he smelled spoiled meat and ozone. Whispers, faint and rasping at first, then growing in their urgency and fervor, manifested in his mind and he recoiled. It wasn't a language he understood. He wasn't even sure it could be understood. But it felt, it felt hateful, harmful. Silence returned. The memory of Lennox returned, too. The lad's eyes had been fearless up to the end, though Hauptmann thought he remembered grief in them, too. Grief for what would never be, or could never have been. Another letter for his already burgeoning stack. He would gladly have offered himself in exchange, an old man for a young one, and wondered briefly what had become of Puck. The Talpa had been alive when Hauptmann had last seen him. It didn't take long for him to get an answer. The iron door to the room creaked open, and two packed soldiers thrust a scrawny, ragged-looking guardsman inside before slamming the door in his wake. Hauptmann caught him, the Talpa's body limp like a rag. They had stripped him to the waist. Puck's skin was deathly pale and glistening with feverish sweat. His tattoo stood out like a birthmark. His pupils had narrowed to pinpoints in the sclera of his eyes. Fear bled off him in a numbing aura. I thought you were dead, said Hauptmann, easing Puck onto his back. I have seen, he rasped, his eyes far away. Seen? Seen what? In the glass. I have seen... He began to tremble, gasping for air. I didn't want to. I don't want to. Please, please don't make me look. Don't make me. He reached up to his face, and for a moment Hauptmann thought he might try to claw out his own eyes, but instead he scratched at his forehead. Itching, blathered Puck. Ligature marks on his skin suggested he had been bound by the wrists, ankles, and head same straps as the machines where they had found Sacker and the others. Merciful throne, breathed Hauptmann as he caught a glimpse into his own future. Puck stopped scratching and turned over onto his side. Shaking despite the heat, he wept into the darkness. Chapter 32 The last of the outposts had fallen though they had been poorly manned and defended. A nuisance no more than that, 
but each one a small cut, a little bleed, to sap imperial strength and leave it weak. Or that had been the intent. After a few weeks, the South Army had swept away all resistance, imbued with a resilience and determination not seen in many months. Not since Vogue's catastrophe. It was nothing short of miraculous. Deep into packed territory, tall stakes lined Gannat Road. Men had been tied to them, set afire, and left for the raptors to feast on. The wretched Saurian birds fled at the sight and sound of the armoured column, flocking into the air with disconsolate shrieking and the flapping of leathery wings. The rugged terrain shook the chassis of the Salamander command tank, shook its occupants too, the armoured tracks crunching the debris of destroyed buildings and human bone. Not all the bodies were packed, either. Ahead of the vehicle column, a pyre had been raised across the road and was still burning. A cohort of diggers had set about it with shovels and picks. No corpse was buried, no rites afforded. The dead were left to smolder on the roadside, and in the wake of the tanks the raptors returned with squawking hunger. Darian could still smell the burning flesh on the air, though it was miles hence. As he stood up in the flatbed of the command tank, he breathed deeply to try to clear the stench from his nostrils. But Agria had changed over the passing weeks. Gone were the scents of wood and earth, of leaf and stone, in their place, smoke, the tang of char, prometheum and scorched human meat. It choked him, almost as much as the silver gorget around his neck, and the matching cuirass clamping his body. The thought of it, his fine trappings, drew his mind back to Lena. He hadn't seen her since that evening in the camp, and the look in her eyes of shame, even fear, still haunted him. What would she think of me now, he wondered, longing for his old life and the drudgery that came with it. He had entertained a fancy that he would take Lena with him somehow, fix her to the coattails of his advancement, and she would rise with him. Reality had revealed that as a fiction dreamt of by a boy, a foolish and romantic notion. Lena had her place, and Darian his. Ren Saint had taught him that, at least. Their orbits had shifted, parting like two celestial bodies never destined to realign. The sword rattling at his side brought him back. The weapon had belonged to his father, or so he had been told. A cavalryman's sabre, it had a chased gold hilt and an inlaid ruby pommel. A blue blood captain had given it to him, though he had no idea how she came to have it. In any event, it was his sword now, a part of his trappings as well as his rank. Both it and the sword hung awkwardly, but the thought was short-lived as the calls came back from the line, interrupting Darian's meditations. Agrian sappers ranged ahead, the last of the Orek and the paltry scraps of the Talpa acting as guards. A hefty-looking centaur pushed aside the largest chunks of debris, its ploughing dozer blade like a knife cutting through rock. The sapper swept for mines beforehand and cut the coils of razor wire that would otherwise have ensnared the centaur, shoveling aside the dead and the ruins of a sundered civilization. You should sit, Captain. Rensain's words were collegiate, but firm enough to be considered a command. Darian hadn't earned that rank, Privately, he wondered if his father had pulled strings from his deathbed. Ren Saint had told him it was nominal, but also necessary. The men would not aspire to a private or corporal. They would not follow a lowly trooper. But he felt it was dishonest, as wrong as the privilege the Blue Bloods enjoyed over their lessers. I am no hypocrite, thought Darian, eager to voice his discontent, but ultimately deciding not to. Instead, he asked, How far to Ganad? Eight miles, give or take. Then this is our last march before we reach it? Does that scare you? I don't fear war or death, he said truly, the stark evidence of it surrounding him. I only want this to be over. As we all do, 
But please, Wren Saint insisted gently, won't you sit? Are you worried a sniper's bullet will kill me? Frankly, yes. Darian sat down. The Lord Commissar had crafted a compelling narrative. The son of a beloved general of a noble house, claiming his birthright by winning the war for Agria. At every small victory, Ren Saint had been present, ready with a flag to thrust into Darian's hand, as he had done at Loddon when all of this had started. Back then, he had been a millserve, masquerading as a soldier, his thoughts awash with aspirations of glory. He had accepted the flag without question, and in a daze of self-adulation. That had changed, and now all Darian could see was the mendacity of it all. His deeds were amplified, transmuted by Ren Saint's cunning alchemy into hero worship by the ranks. An endless propaganda reel projected against reality and designed to obscure it. Worst of all, it was working, and Ren Saint knew it. Throne, the Lord Commissar, had told him what he would do, and Darian had agreed to all of it. It suits you said the Lord Commissar, referring to Darian's armor. A hefty belt cinched the waist, a gilded buckle in the shape of a griffin's head clasped it tight. Darian adjusted it, though it still didn't sit right. Belt's a little much, he remarked somewhat sourly. You are a talisman, said Ren Saint. I've told you this many times, and a vital piece of the war effort. Darian looked up from his fidgeting. I have to look the part, is that it? You have to be the part. I feel like a fraud. Aside from the crew who were inside, the vehicle's only other occupant was Gannica. Though the Commissar Cadet kept her own counsel, her eyes ahead and clear of judgment as she had been taught by her drill abbots at the Scola Progenium. Ren Saint patted Darian on the shoulder, his comrade, his mentor, his master. You asked for my help and I gave it to you. Purpose, a place. I know this is strange, but you lit a spark in these soldiers. You inspired them. A victory at Lawton, another at Myerland. Now this. Momentum is with us. I only ever wanted to serve, to fight, for Volponi, for the Imperium. And you have done well. You have your father's blood, Darian, said Ren Saint, wafting a small snuff-box under his nose to ward off the worst of the befouled air. He offered it to Darian, but he politely refused. Then why haven't I seen him? If I have fought well and now inspire these men he said, turning to Ren Saint. Why has he not asked for me? A part of him wished he had sought out his father's billet that night he had met with Ren Saint, instead of his aimless wanderings. The commissar's expression darkened. Illness plagues your father, Darian. I fear the emperor will call him to his side soon. But, he said more warmly, I know he is proud of everything you have achieved. Is he? Darian replied acidly. I have never met him to ask it of him. He faced forward, his gaze alighting on the tanks in the vanguard. Grussman rode out in front, the general's vehicle a few places further along the convoy. Whatever he thought about Ren Saint using Darian as the army's talisman, he didn't say at least not to anyone's face. Instead, he stared at the road ahead as if imagining his manifest destiny coming ever closer. Outriders in Tauros jeeps ranged either side of the column and behind the command vehicles. A long train of armored transports ferrying the entirety of the Volponi host and their auxiliaries. At the rear were the last of the Pavis, comprising a handful of conquerors, heavy mortars, and a reduced battalion of flame tanks. Several of the men straddled the outer hulls of the transports, hanging on guide rails or swathes of rigging. Few spoke, consumed with their own thoughts. 
But many did look to him, and in their eyes Darien saw something that terrified him more than any other horror he had witnessed in this war. He saw them regard him with hope. Overhead, a Valkyrie flew in low, drawing his and everyone's eye skywards. Another litter drop. Ren Saint had them making passes all over Agria, across every war front. Too late now did Darien realize his notions of war and glory were falsehoods. Lie, layered upon lie, every true and ugly deed mudded through the lens of propaganda. That vital engine that kept war oiled and filled men with as much hate and vainglory as they could hold. Burgeoning vessels, all of them, bound for the grind, and most a pointless death in a land with an unfamiliar sky. And here he was, the crux of that pitiless wheel. The leaflets descended like paper planes, fluttering and riffling on the breeze. One landed on the front glasses of the salamander, and Darien reached for it. A waxy scrap of parchment printed in grainy sepia declaimed, Liberation for Agria, victory is near. And then Darien saw himself, arrayed in armoured panoply, a Volponi banner snapping from the standard in his hand. An artist's rendering, idealized, distorted, and propagandist in the extreme. A halo shone around Darien's head, a laurel wreath crowning his skull. A cloak draped his shoulders like the mantle of a ruler, and beneath his slightly upraised boot, the why all heroes needed to be depicted as such he did not know, the decapitated head of a blood-packed Damagawa, its mask cracked down the middle. We shall overcome, it declared. He wanted to destroy it, to crush it in his fist. He would have shed these trappings, pulled on a trooper's uniform, taken up a las gun, and marched into the fields with the rest of the hopeful damned. Wars are won with the fist, said Ren Saint, watching him, but they are waged in the heart and in the mind. Darian didn't answer. He let the parchment go, and it caught on the wind, dragged around in circles, until it spiraled down and was ground underneath heavy tracks. Kulkis snatched a piece of parchment from the air and turned it over to look at it. They are saying he slew Valga with one blow, whispered Rake, peeking over the lieutenant's shoulder, fought the Damagawa single-handed. He half leaned from the open side hatch of the Chimera, the chill breeze lessening the heat of the inner hold. Why are you whispering, you idiot? snapped Dresk, the dim interior lighting contorting his face so it appeared even more irritated. I don't know, Rake replied, scowling. It sounds more scurrilous. Why is that better? I don't know, he repeated louder. Why does it matter? The Emperor's hand guides him, I think, said Hanmar, eyes down, rocking gently in his seat. His utterance prompted the others, even Kulkis, to make the sign of the Aquila. Almost thirty blue-blood soldiers sat in companionable quietude, their minds on the war ahead. Do you believe it, sir? asked Grice the burly sergeant glad to be back amongst his comrades, and they glad to have him, despite their protestations to the contrary about his snoring and general odour. His wounds had healed well, the medics had said, though Colchis had seen a slight tremor to the man's left hand that would be with him until he died. He could shoot, fight, kill, that was all that mattered. It doesn't matter what I believe, Colchis told them. It's glory, isn't it? And who would not want to revel in that? I was there, they will say. I was there when the son of Orator de Vere's slew Valga and won the Battle of Myland. Men worship heroism. That's a cold assessment, Lieutenant, Colchis cursed silently. Aramis had the ears of a felid. She turned her stern matriarchal gaze on him, and he tried not to wither before it. Perhaps these men merely wish to believe in something greater than themselves, some purpose at hand. Hope, Lieutenant, 
Colchis wasn't certain Aramis believed in any of what she'd just said, but it was an officer's job to maintain morale as well as discipline in her troops. Her troops, not Regara's. His demotion, for what other word could be used to describe what had been done to him, had landed like a frag grenade, causing confusion and spitting shrapnel everywhere. Schiller had laughed. In the three weeks since they had struck camp at Myerland, Kulkis had heard him chuckling to himself ceaselessly. A rival's misery, another man's balm to his own hurts. His mirth had lessened when he had found out Aramis had been promoted above him. But Schiller was a pragmatist and knew he had reached his ceiling. He took what he could get. I didn't say it hadn't done good, Major. The army is galvanized for the first time in a long time. The troops believe we can win. Will win, she corrected him. Will. Of course, sir he said, folding the parchment and putting it into his breast pocket. Imperious as the artist had made Darian look in the propaganda piece, something else struck Kulkis about the lad's eyes. Sadness. He had envied Darian at Loddon and could scarcely reconcile the affable Millserv who had stripped and reassembled Grice's lasgun in the barrack house. But now he pitied him. It doesn't matter much now, offered the sergeant, meticulously checking his weapon's scope and barrel. He is Rensain's creature. He belongs to the Prefectus. A morale officer will always seek that which motivates the troops around them, said Aramis. They will employ one of two methods, fear or inspiration. We should feel fortunate that the Lord Commissar has chosen the latter. It's been effective so far, Hanmar conceded, opening his eyes. We'll know soon enough, said Aramis, her own gaze fixed on Kulkis as if seeing his doubts laid bare. Ganad awaits. Chapter 33 A fortress loomed ahead, glimpsed between the plosive eruptions of a heavy mortar barrage. Regara could think of no more fitting an appellation for it. Thick, high walls surrounded it, and a wrought iron door, wide enough and tall enough to admit an imperial knight, barred immediate passage. It housed a well-trained garrison, if imperial intelligence was to be believed. That particular agency had failed them on several occasions during the war, but in this instance, it appeared the logisticians and their cogitation engines had the right of it. Ganad comprised both gatehouse and bridge, the latter also ringed by several gun emplacements and heavily barricaded defences. Dark rock had been used in its construction from the granite-rich hills west of Vigath's Moor. The miles-long chasm only spanned at this singular point. Its strategic value was therefore high, and Grussman meant to take it. The local quarry stone, its coal-black hue, also gave the gatehouse its other, more sinister name, the Burned Keep. Six battle tanks could cross the bridge abreast with ease, though the approach was much wider and easily double that, Imperial spotters confirming this from the air, but venturing no closer for fear of the pact's parapet-mounted anti-aircraft guns. Grossman had put this to the test almost immediately, discharging the last of the Pardas' armoured strength and hammering the outer emplacements and entrenchments until nothing remained but flattened earth and split rockcrete. The pact had withdrawn most of their troops by this point. Even the sanguinary barbarians, sagacious enough to know their ruinous gods couldn't protect them from the steel-cased mortar shells of the Militarum. Regara watched it through magnoculars, handing the scopes back to a Volponi corporal called Vernley, whom Grussman had deigned to afford him as his adjutant. Vernley was stout, slab-browed and hooded-eyed, like most blue-blood stock, but he was efficient enough. "'Pity they aren't able to breach the wall,' said the woman on the Major's other side. "'Then we could sit back and let the tankers do all the work.' 
They'll get their chance, Regara said grimly, nodding to Vernley to sound the muster. And now, so shall we, said Gulliver Macaulay, her grin as wide and sharp as a sickle moon when Regara turned to her. She jabbed a finger at his leg. Can you fight with that thing? It was a basic prosthetic of articulated plastic and polished wood. It bent and moved as a flesh-and-blood leg, but had none of the potency of a bionic. He also couldn't feel with it. A light rain had begun to fall, dousing some of the fires kicked up by the mortar barrage, and Regara winced at a returning ache. Even bereft of his old bionic, the pain lingered like an unwelcome guest. He was beginning to think it was psychosomatic. He sighed ruefully at the irony of it. I'll fight a damn sight better with it than without it. Ah, you could rest on my shoulder, Volponi, Macaulay replied, her gallows humor infectious. I may hold you to that, Regara told her. A look and a nod from Ithor signaled that the auxiliaries were ready to advance. The wizened commissar neither laughed nor spoke. As ever, he was a corpse-like husk, a skeleton in a long black coat and cap like some fantastic scarecrow erected on a muster field to terrify the troops into line. Truth be told, the Agrians needed little encouragement. They had built roads, swept mines, cleared debris and dug trenches. They had yet to fight in earnest, and now Grusman was giving them that chance. Regara saw it for what it was, and so he thought did the Gulliver. She didn't seem to mind, but then he could not swear by her mental stability. A rippling flag caught his eye, homespun by the diggers and held proudly. A shovel and pickaxe stitched in grey on a brown field. The auxiliaries numbered six hundred native soldiers, sworn in according to the agreement signed by the United Agrian Fellowship, and equipped by the Departmento Munitorum with standard-issue flak armor and M35 Galaxy short-pattern las guns, possibly the most ubiquitous weapon in the entire Imperial arsenal. It would serve, Regara reminded himself, the assurances of old briefings returning to him now in the seconds before the attack. He eyed the ranked Volponi more than fifty feet behind this false front, the rows of Pardas tanks a distant ridge of armoured hulls. An opportunity for honour, the note from Grusman had read, delivered to Regara's quarters under cover of darkness, the fact of his words being turned back on him, not lost on the Major. Orders had followed swiftly. The auxiliaries under his command would take first assault. A cripple cannot lead men, but Grusman didn't consider commoners to be men. Reach the gate, set charges, detonate them. Simple enough. Were one not to consider the blood-packed garrison determined to kill everyone before that happened. Oh, and they had to run like the hells once the breaches were in place or risk being caught up in the punitive imperial barrage that would follow. Grusman might as well have dragged Regara to that muster yard back at Lawton and let the firing squad have at it. I think you must have angered the wrong man, Major, said Macaulay, as if reading his thoughts. I've been doing it most of my life, said Regara, not missing a beat. No sense in changing now. She laughed, her mirth profoundly fatalistic, the assault clarions already sounding. Smoke thickened the air, making it hard to breathe. Jabs of light burned through, their brightness softened, but no less lethal. A heavy contingent were holding the gate, sixty blood-packed in armor, with man-portable siege weapons and anti-personnel guns. They had hidden during the initial barrage, dug in deep and shielded by several layers of ferroplate. Within fifty feet of the gatehouse, the Pactors had swarmed from their foxholes, taking up barricaded positions, shoving aside the broken bodies of their previous occupants. Vernley had died quickly, a shot through his left temple rendering any further service from the adjutant null and void. So Regara had the vox and was trying to restore order. No, 
Faint left, faint, take two platoons, sixty men. Head down, one hand cupped over his ear, he fought the urge to snap the vox in two. They had found some cover, though the Agrians were spread across the width of the gatehouse approach road. Above, just visible through the veil of smoke that had become more hindrance than help, the burned keep glowered like an implacable black fist of rock. Shots rained from the parapet, fired aimlessly into the grey obscuring cloud. Combined with the heavy fire coming from the front, the diggers had effectively stalled. I said sixty men! Sixty! Macaulay took the vox. Regara too dumbstruck in the moment to reprimand her. She spoke quickly, her Agrian dialect a slew of harsh vowel sounds and even harder consonants. When she was done, she handed back the vox and clapped the major on the shoulder. You are used to commanding your royals, Volponi. Agrians don't think like you, don't talk like you. What did you tell him? Sixty men around the left flank faint attack to draw attention. Regara stared for a moment, despite the whipping heat of las beams streaking not so far from their heads, and said, From now on, you take the vox. The Golova smiled, sketching a casual salute. A few moments later, the intensity of the packed fusillade lessened, some of it directed instead at the Agrian platoons harassing the flank of the embedded enemy position in front of the gate. Through Makali, Regara sent a second, larger flanking force around the opposite side, and then further troops to the left. He had to move them piecemeal, keep the pactors guessing. He wanted to create the illusion of a pincer, and he had to do it fast, because the smoke from the canisters launched by the three brace of chimeras had begun to dissipate. I need a fire team, six of your best, and you, he told Macaulay, as the flankers were moving into position. It happened fast, six battle-hardened Agrians that had the look of soldiers, if not the finest equipment. Each one carried a bulky debt pack on their back, lugged to the front line at Regara's relayed order. Macaulay had a seventh, and Regara took the eighth and final breaching charge as it was proffered to him. How far do you think? he asked, squinting through the smoke, willing his eyes to penetrate its depths, but increasingly anxious as it thinned. Maybe forty, said Macaulay. She dug an elbow in his ribs and gestured to the debt pack as Regara turned to chafe at her. You think to run with that? I'm going to bring down the gate with it. How fast are you on one leg? I have two, after a fashion, he conceded. You have one. Please disagree if I'm wrong. I'm also still in command of this unit. True enough. How many? Regara's frown asked an unspoken question. Macaulay patted her debt pack like an old friend. Of these boomers. As many as possible. I'd take all eight, if you asked. He pointed to a dial on the breacher's metal housing, then held up his other hand with three fingers splayed. Three-minute fuse. Enough time for us to leave before the barrage starts. Macaulay looked dubious about that, nodding again to Regara's prosthetic, a not-too-subtle hint that she thought his foot speed insufficient for the task. You're bloody mad, Valpony, she said, and sniffed at the air. Best be off? Regara glanced ahead. The heavy contingent still held the gate, but large gaps yawned in their defense as a result of the casualties they had sustained. An even larger one had formed in the middle. The pact's guns pulled left and right to meet the oncoming threat of the Agrian flankers. Fifty feet or so behind, Ithor waited with a Volponi heavy stubber battery. Ostensibly, the gunners were there to chew up any pact who slipped through the Agrians, but Regara knew better. I concur, he said, and was about to head out when Macaulay gripped his shoulder and he turned again. Know this, Volponi, if you die out there, I'm not bringing back your body for a shiny funeral. Noted. As one, they ran into the smoke. 
The first detonation trembled the ground under Colchis's feet, as a flare lit the smoke billowing around the gate in orange and umber. At the second and third, he heard an order shouted down the line, command signified, which meant it had come from the general. The fourth through seventh detonations rolled up the left side of the burned keep's gate, blasting hinges, and were followed by a six-strong battery of griffin-heavy mortars grinding into position. By the time the eighth and final detonation sounded, mere seconds later, the tanks had begun to elevate their main guns, tracking for range and accuracy. A commander poked his head from one of the cupolas. A pair of magnoculars pressed to his face like an extension of his goggles. Sir, Colchis ventured, the smoke beginning to clear, revealing the Agrian forces still engaged with remnants of the packed outer defenders. They had got clear of the breach explosion, but had become ensnared with the obstinate enemy. Somewhere amongst that morass was Regara. Aramis glanced over, her eyes shaded by the lip of her helmet, but from her expression she had seen it too. Palpable tension rippled through the Volponi ranks, at least those loyal to Major Regara. Vox, she commanded, and Corporal Hennessy was quick to provide. I need to speak with Colonel Grossman immediately, she snapped, barely waiting to put the receiver to her ear. The request was relayed, a Vox crackle announcing the communication had patched through successfully. The fiftieth, or at least four companies of them, lined up on the left flank of the assault, a sizable gap between them and the 86th, of whom Aramis also had operational command. Grossman's command Carda were further down, right in the middle, with the 101st on the extreme right. Behind all that, the rest of the pavis. Mortars at rear echelon, flame tanks at the vanguard with what was left of the conquerors acting as flank guard. They had a good vantage from where they stood in the line, the 50th, and Colchis hoped that the general's decision to prompt the heavy mortar was on account of the fact that he didn't. Facts on the ground, they called it. Officers had been known to change their minds for less. Major Regara is still in the field, said Aramis, her tone clipped and anxious, eyes squinting. Colchis listened, his breath caught in his throat as the griffins made final adjustments. He couldn't hear what was on the other end of the line, but assumed it was either Grussman or one of his aides that Aramis was talking to. That's not enough time, she paused, cut off by a response, then resumed, her mood agitated. With respect, sir, they cannot simply be expected to hunker down. It's a damn mortar barrage. Another response, Aramis reddening with anger. I understand the concept of suppression, sir. I know the strength of the garrison. The reply that followed saw Aramis grip her sword hilt. Yes, sir, she said through clenched teeth. Understood, sir. She didn't look back at Colchis, but fixed her eyes ahead. We're to hold here. Barrage imminent. Colchis let out the breath he hadn't realized he had been holding. He'll be killed, Major. Hanmar was on his left and murmured a prayer. They'll be damn well killed, said Grice. The sergeant, twisting his grip around the las gun, pressed close to his chest. We hold, Aramis reiterated firmly, though her frustration was not directed at her command squad. She snarled. And damn it all to the hells! They were taking too long. A glance back through the dissipating smoke told him the gate was done. One of the breaches had failed. A lot of noise, a lot of fuss, but no bite. That's why they had seven more, and each had made its mark. Hinges and bolts had been reduced to cord metal, radial scorch marks, stretching the length and breadth. Much like a pugilist that had taken one blow too many, the stout iron door rocked on its heels. One more hit would see it fall. That's what the Pardus were for, that and the horde of defenders ranked up behind the gate and ready to go tooth and nail. Grussman would spin it as damage limitation, he'd praise the dead annihilated by the imperial barrage, laud them for their sacrifice. A few slain so the many could be preserved, and the Militarum war machine grinds ever on. 
all of this went through Regara's mind as he saw the griffins line up into a firing echelon. The expulsion plumes from their cannons looked like the beginning of a victory parade, each a two-second interval apart, meticulously spread for maximum saturation. He calculated they had maybe ten or twenty seconds before impact, and then there'd just be fire and noise and nothing. Tough to reach safe distance in ten seconds, even without a crooked leg. Another las bolt zipped past, like paint smeared on canvas, except the paint was superheated light that would burn off your face. More followed, the air stitched with lethal incandescent threads. A handful of packed riflemen had them pinned, that and the heavy stubbers chugging rounds out like a damn forty-gun salute. Regara felt a tug on his shoulder, Makali beckoning as she ran back in the direction of the gate. That way was death, straight into the teeth of the packed guns on the wall, Laz coming down in sheets like lethal rain. But not all of it. Most struck outwards, towards the Volponi lines, as spiteful as it was ineffectual. He rose up onto his heels, heel, and ran after Makali. A few Agrians went with him, chasing his limping gait, seeing what the Gulliver had seen, what Regara now saw. Ten seconds must have lapsed, though time felt like syrup wrung out through gauze in those final moments. He heard, practically felt, the parabola of uncaring mortar shells as they arced through the air. It took another four seconds to reach the foxhole. Three more for Makali to kill the three packed soldiers with the same level of ingenuity as her. And three more for Regara to throw himself inside, pressed hard against plated rockcrete and packed earth, as all the fury of the Militarum's ordnance thundered down upon them. It roared, shaking the ground, rattling bones, Regara roared with it. He roared until he was hoarse, until all that came out was a rasping, red, raw croak of sound. He shut his eyes against it, against the dreadful and endless cacophony of death. Chapter 34 they were falling like wingless, suicidal fireflies, flailing as the flame tanks roved amongst them. The pact had no defense against it. Even their manic resolve split to breaking as the hellhounds took their fill, cleansing and burning to rid the bridge of all resistance. Pockets remained, instigating short-lived firefights, but were soon swept away, the cracks of their guns dying like defiant, doomed echoes. Entire platoons fled before the tanks, blinded by smoke and heat, running heedless and headlong to their deaths over the edge of the bridge. Like fireflies. Beautiful, thought Fenk. The gate had fallen to the barrage, smashed asunder by the sheer brute force of the Pardus Armored Division, or what was left of it. The conquerors rode in straight after, a slow-moving shield wall of ablative armor for the infantry to advance behind. Nothing lived in front of those tanks. The hellhounds came in after, once the gatehouse was secure, a pack of them hungry for retribution like all the Pardus. Fenk could understand that. He didn't really relate to the concept of an eye for an eye. He was self-aware enough to realize his emotions were so remote that vengeance and restitution didn't properly register. But he could appreciate the need to inflict pain and suffering. Unsworth had led the charge, of course. Fenk had difficulty in reconciling the silver-clad soldier with anyone other than the private whom he had met at Loddon. But he knew this was de Vere's heir, or his bastard, or some such in between. He stood atop one of the lead battle tanks, sword raised like a conquering hero. Fenk thought he seemed older, and yet also more adrift and alone. And he was very much alone singular in what he represented to the Volponi. Even the traditionalists, the ones who had derided him as an upstart and unworthy of raising, could not deny the potent symbol he had become. The sight of him there stood above the ranks in defiance of fear and doubt. He had become a rallying cry, shouts of Volponi glory, Volponi glory, pursuing him wherever he went. It stirred the men, of course, the Imperium ever the gifted propagandist. 
Fenk was second order, leading the kill and recovery sweeps in the wake of the armor and the spear tip of infantry that followed it. He had fixed his bayonet and roamed within the yawning arch of the gatehouse, stabbing pactors and gazing coldly at the purging of the Ganad Bridge beyond. A corporal called for him. Fenk couldn't remember his name. After Redfern, he had taken less of an interest in the men that served under his command, deciding it wasn't worth the effort when either he or they would be replaced imminently. Corporal, he said flatly, walking over to the officer. He was young, fair-haired and grey-eyed, a Volponi facsimile straight off the manufactory line. Fenk saw nothing remarkable about him. He was gesturing to a mound of rubble, packed and agrian bodies strewn within it. When the natives had signed up to fight for their homeland, they hadn't reckoned on the callousness of the Volponi aristocracy. The corporal was blathering about something, Fenk only half hearing, as he descended into the depths of his own thoughts. He waved him silent, though, when he saw the gap in the mound, the edge of a plated hatch peeking through, and the pale fingers of someone buried underneath, scrabbling to get out. Fenk began to dig quickly, snapping orders at the corporal to summon more help. A cohort of Agrians arrived, and the tools of the sappers were put to work. Bodies were dragged and lifted clear. Not all came away intact, and a macabre pile of limbs and parts began to amass. Few paid it any heed, though they'd revisit the site later in their dreams, focused instead on shifting the rubble. When at last the hatch was clear, Fenk and two other soldiers got fingers underneath and strained to lift it. Blue blood stood close by on station, las guns aimed into the dark beneath the hatch should the occupants be unfriendly. Dust raining from the flat plain of metal, it landed with a heavy clang, revealing a foxhole of imperial troops blinking with dirt-smeared faces into the light. Fenk was breathless when it was done, and so took a few seconds to address those within. It appears, Major, he said, that you may have missed most of the battle. It was over, barring the last gasps of a defeated foe. From his vantage on the battlements, Darian looked out upon a sea of fire. The flames rippled on his armor, trapped as vivid reflections. Blood tainted the silver vambrace and breastplate, none of it his. The red stains sent a shiver of unease through him. Such death, he thought, as the last of the packed resistance was chased down and destroyed. He barely saw anything beyond fire and smoke, and a haze of heat that shimmered the air. Relief and fatigue warred for dominance over his battle-weary frame. His shoulder ached. A bullet at almost point-blank range deflected by his pauldron had left a mark. It ached, too, from the swinging of his sword that hung like a sated beast in his loose fingers, the blade slick with gore. In his other hand, he held a banner that snapped and whipped on the hot breeze like it was alive, the griffin rampant strutting and snarling across its tightly woven fabric. They bellowed for it, the men below. They bellowed for him, though the fervor of their voices was lost behind the sounds of battle that rolled across the bridge ahead of them. He imagined this view might have been stirring once, even beautiful in its way. Now... It looked like a road only to hell and mankind's eternal damnation. He raised the banner, for it was expected. No, it was his duty. Wren Saint had intimated as much on several occasions, and they roared, voices peaking, a conjoined release of pent-up fury and fear expressed through the glorification of a flag. A flag. It had meant something once, to serve his world, his imperium. But this experience did not align to that of his childish imaginings. There was no glory in this, only more horror. And he knew, to his own profound dismay, that he was becoming inured to it. They had taken the gatehouse swiftly, Darien at their head, a host of first sons, tempestuous scions, acting as both retinue and guard. 
Ren Saint and his aide fought with them, the Lord Commissar never far from Darian's side, ever eager to hold his talisman up to the light. Darian had fought hard. He had killed many of the Pacted. Yet his victory felt staged, managed. Ren Saint had puppeted the narrative, throwing up a ring of ablative armor around Darian in the form of the Scions, who funneled and dealt with threats at the Lord Commissar's silent command. Twelve of their number lay dead, two with skulls crushed on the bloody debris-strewn courtyard below. How many had stepped into harm's way to protect him? How many had died for Ren Saint's propaganda reels? They risked their lives for me, said Darian, his voice not loud enough for the cheering masses to hear, but his words weren't meant for them. As was their duty, Ren Saint replied. He stood on a lower part of the battlements, a stone stairway cut into the outside of the rock between them. He was beckoning a tech priest, a servo skull held delicately in the Martian's piston-like fingers. And they performed it well. As did I? Darian asked bitterly. Ren Saint gave him a sharp look. An absent flick of the hand sent the tech priest on its way, as the Lord Commissar took possession of the skull. You sound disillusioned. I feel disillusioned. In spite of the great victory we have won, Carcass is within our reach, then Rakespur, and an end to war on Agria. The anger faded, an emptiness replacing it. It is a grim undertaking. All of this slaughter... War is not like the songs, Darian, said Ren Saint, taking on the mantle of mentor. It fits so easily, as did many of the commissars' adopted roles. I have heard none, but I was never that naive. He remembered the Medicaid tents, and the poor Talpa screaming as they wrenched the shrapnel from his body. He remembered Lena, then fought down the image of her face when he saw her last— how long ago his life amid the drudgery of camp now seemed. Then how may I counsel you better? asked Ren Saint. It's this, all of this. He shook the banner out of irritation, but so far up the soldiers adulating him in the courtyard only roared the louder, shaking their weapons in sympathetic unity. The banner? A prop. And what are banners but props symbolizing the fealty of a regiment, of a world? Men will die for banners. I have seen the propaganda reels, the leaflets. I know you have. I showed them to you, said Ren Saint, his tone collegiate as he mounted the stairs with servo skull in hand. They are lies, or at best half-truths, that paint me as some invincible hero. A saint in all but name. Invincible, is it? He raised an eyebrow, playful. Darian huffed. You know what I mean. What do you think propaganda is, Darian? At that, the anger rushed back, hot and burning on Darian's skin. Don't patronize me, Lord Commissar. I have not the stomach for it. Ren Saint held up a hand, his expression contrite. I apologize. You are right. The battle has left me weary, that's all. The cuts to his uniform, the abrasions against his armor, all testified to that. I only mean to say that a half-truth can serve a greater good. War is grim. It is slaughter. Your words, not mine. Truth, Darian, is what people want to hear— it is whatever fits best with their belief in what is real and what is right. Men don't want truth. They want something that feels true, that supports their notion of what the galaxy should be when it is in balance. They need something to believe in, but that thing must be what they already consider to be true. Do you understand? Darian nodded his fury ebbing as it always did when the Lord Commissar spoke his consoling rhetoric. A vid picta word, 
lodged in the eye socket of the servo skull, and he turned his attention to it. Anti-gravitic impellers groaned into mechanical life, and the macabre thing took uneven flight. Ren Saint releasing it like it was a dazed moth let back into the night. It whirled and drifted around Darien, its crude cranial engine clicking as the grainy light of the vidpicta lens strafed over him, absorbing every detail. He heard it magnify and retract, taking in the banner, the blade, even the look of cool disdain on his face. Ren Saint would add the politics later, fashion the narrative. This one shall be hollow cast, he said, and watched the servo skull keenly, a director at his art, before the troops advance on the carcass border wall. Have you ever considered, said Darian, what would happen if it fails, if in spite of everything we still lose? I haven't, Rensaint replied honestly, because I do not countenance failure. Have faith, Darian, in yourself, in what you represent to these soldiers. The Emperor is with us in this. He wills us to... A shot rang out. A cold crack of a hard round snapping on the wind, cutting Rensaint off mid-speech. The air fizzed around Darian, shimmered, and the smell of burning arose, of metal warped by heat. He reeled, the impact of the shot staggering him into the parapet. A bullet fell to the ground, clinking innocuously as it hit stone underfoot, a heavy caliber shell fashioned to bore through tank armor, and that would rip a hole through a mortal body and leave it gaping and ruined. Ren Saint's face had turned white as Darian's eyes met his, before the mask slipped into place again and the color returned. Are you hit? Darian stared, still shaken. Ren Saint advanced a step. Are you wounded? No. He looked down at the belt cinched around his waist. Not a belt at all. Refractor field generator. Insurance. Something like relief passed over Ren Saint's face before he addressed one of the scions. Take him down from here immediately. Then to Darian. Raise your hand. What? I raise it. A fist, he showed him. Don't question, act. He raised his hand, held it up for all to see. As the last dregs of the battle faded and the fires began to ebb, the sniper was found and killed, the shots drowned out by the adulation of the crowd. Now, said Ren Saint, a hungry glint in his eyes, you are invincible. Chapter 35 Brigara had barely left the medicae, the stitches still buried in his face, the small strips of gauze like off-white patches layering his skin. His ears had yet to cease ringing completely, the bombardment dull echo in his cochlei. He walked with a limp, needing a cane to steady himself, and not just on account of his leg. Having chosen one with a sword hidden in the shaft might have been a mistake, though. Every step sent agony up his spine, his back still badly bruised and scarcely healed. The pain meds could come later. He wanted to be raw for this, like an exposed nerve. He had a piece of folded fabric tucked under one arm. It was thick dirty, scorched, a battlefield leaving from Ganad, and as it turned out, a gift, one he would repay in kind. Regara found him in the Vox station, engaged in hololithic discourse with the grainy rendering of the Martian Magos, his manner brusque and unyielding, an argument. It proved brief, the meeting either nearing its end, as he had entered the Vox station, or curt to begin with. A handful of Vox operators busied themselves at the periphery, listening to the headsets cupped around their ears, turning dials to improve audio clarity, and otherwise heedless of the colonel in their midst. Grossman wore his uniform without panoply, dressed down with an unbuttoned jacket and no officer's cap to help mark his rank. Lost in his thoughts, he didn't notice Regara until he was standing in front of him. 
Major, he said, taking off his eyeglasses to massage the bridge of his nose. The hour is late. I'm surprised to see you up. He went to pour a drink, a round bottle of Conus brandy sitting on a desk and within reach. There was only one glass, but Grossman offered a pour to Regara, who refused. Grossman shrugged it off, pouring one for himself anyway. Taking a sip, he said, I've ordered reinforcements from the West and East Army groups. Stadish didn't like it much, but it's not as if he had much choice, is it? He grinned, comfortable in his power. Enghart was a good man, though. He could go far, that one. He took another sip of the brandy, sucked through his teeth as the alcohol bit. Sure, I can't tempt you? He cast around, looking for someone to procure another glass. Never a bloody dag around when you need one, eh? He puffed up his chest, smoothing down his jacket. Big day coming. Big day. Only then, as he was preening and imagining the coming glory, did he appear to notice that Regara had yet to speak. So, Major, he began idly, what can I do for... Regara tossed the folded fabric in front of Grussman, like an offering, and it rolled open, revealing the half-burnt flag of the Agrian diggers. Dust and dark flecks marred the shovel and pickaxe emblem. Then he turned as smartly as he could and stalked away. It's just war, Grussman called after him, too disinterested to remonstrate with him. Yes, it is. Regara said to himself, and left the Vox station behind. He felt their contempt as he walked through the camp, barely fettered, and not, he admitted, without cause. Though the dust had settled on Ganad, the ashes of an emphatic imperial victory still redolent on the breeze, other matters of much longer standing remained unresolved. Not for the first time since he began his walk, Kulkis regretted not bringing Grice or Hanmar. Even Drake and Resk would have been better than nothing, but they were all back with the other Volponi, making the most of their downtime before the march. Grussman had so ordered it. A rare respite that saw most troopers engaging in anything but, as they indulged in this unexpected freedom before the trials of what would follow. Kulkis could see it as he walked. It lay to the south, the next battle. The scouts reckoned on seven miles away, seven miles across sparse terrain, the border of Carcass. Fires lit the wall in a flickering candescence, white against dark, cold flares in the night like icy beacons. It had never been breached, and its gate had been sealed, entombed behind granite. A formidable barrier. Rumor around camp held that Grossman had an answer to that. But none knew what, save the general himself, and his hand of covenant stayed close to his chest. The smell of cook fires turned his head. The heady aroma of Grupper ladled into earthenware bowls and passed around tribal circles. Kulkis walked around them, staying to the edges. Muttered words passed between the Agrians, but none stopped him or voiced a challenge. He found her sitting alone, a bowl in her lap, a flask of something alcoholically potent, judging by the smell of her breath, held lazily in one hand. As her glassy eyes fell upon him, Kulkis guessed she had imbibed more than a little. What do you want here, Volponi? She slurred, but only a fraction. The flames from the cook fires danced in her eyes. Not good for you to be here. Nearly six hundred had perished in the bombardment, but that wasn't to what she referred. Better here than in a dark alley, he said. She glanced down at the weapons belt cinched around his waist. I would ask, are you headed to war? But we both know the answer to that. Macaulay set the bowl down. A few of the other Agrians stirred, but a glance from their Gulliver kept them at bay. Though I am intrigued, why you would come here to find it? Not to find it, to end it. Oh, she wiped her mouth with the back of her forearm. In my culture, it is called 
blood wage. Ah, she said, settling back down again, an easy smile on her lips as she took a pull of her flask. You want to balance the scales? Colchis frowned, momentarily confused. I didn't realize you spoke Conis. He referred to the native tongue of the capital, Conisberg. How? I don't, but I listen, she offered the flask. You want to partake, Volponi? You look like you could use it. I have no interest in your local grog. He sneered the last word without meaning to. It was a common word, unused to his tongue. Macaulay sneered in turn. I liked your superior better. You measure yourself to him, I think. Whom? asked Colchis, his eyes darting around the shadows, expecting trouble at any moment. This wasn't unfolding as he had thought it would. You know, she patted her leg with the flask. Major Regara? Macaulay nodded. Regara, yes. He is a good man, a wise man. I like him, even though he is a cripple. Colchis slid two inches of steel from his scabbard. She tusked and tutted, shaking her head. Come now, Volponi, what will you do with that? I'm not here for you. And yet you have me. End it, he stated flatly. End it, or I shall. End what? This vendetta. I have no vendetta. Your Cossacks, then. They are not mine. They follow your orders, attacked me like dogs in the street when I was unarmed. Colchis eyed the dark again, but no one moved, though all eyes were on him. So I come to end it, here, now, with honor. Macaulay moistened her lips as she reached the end of her indulgence. You, Volponi, and your honor. There is no honor in death or in glory. It is just death. Then why does the death of your man matter so much? Because you had no right to it. His death was not yours to claim. But I didn't kill this man, this Ozra, he said, struggling with the name. I know that. I've watched you long enough to know that, but I'm afraid that hardly matters, not to them. Then bring them out, Colchis demanded, and let us see this done. I cannot bring them out any more than I can stop them coming for you. I don't order these men. They have their own will. They choose to follow me out there. She gestured to the darkness and the plains beyond the border wall. That would be a battlefield come morning. They are not here, Volponi. None who care for your blood wage, she said, her pronunciation flawless. Recompense was promised. Justice. It has not been delivered. And so we are where we are. They will come for you when you are unready. They will kill you as he was killed, alone and unarmed. And if I kill them first, more will come. And if it's during the act, if I prevail and survive, then there will be two more dead Cossacks in the earth. But I doubt others would follow. You only doubt? I don't know their minds. She turned her face back towards the cook fires. You won't find what you're looking for here, Valponi. Be gone, and pass my regards to your major. I hope he makes use of his gift. He is a fine man, that one. I shall think of him later, she said, yawning as she brought the flask to her lips. You're a savage breed, you Agrians. Colchis left her behind, Macaulay and the cook fires, and barbaric culture he did not understand, but he felt the barb in her final words to him. And yet you failed to see your own savagery.
Aramis met him on the outskirts of the Agrion Quarter. You look like you could use a drink, she said, emerging from behind one of the tents. The section of camp designated for the Blue Bloods was clean and well tended. Mill serves roamed like silent waiters, attending to every task. Even the tents themselves were richly appointed, those reserved for the officers more like prefab structures, boasting furnishings, and ornate electrosconces. The scent of fine meats wafted on the evening air from a nearby refectory tent. You are the second woman to offer me that tonight, Colchis replied, his mood sour. Aramis pulled a surprised well-I-never face. Your charms must be improving. He scowled at her, and she raised her hands in a placatory gesture. That was uncalled for. I apologize. Her wry grin suggested she felt otherwise. Really, sir, I prefer to keep a clear head. Your head is anything but clear, Lieutenant. She caught his arm as he made to walk on, and their eyes met. No ranks, no agendas, just a drink. Is this a ploy? asked Colchis, squinting as if to see the truth of her intentions. Some jape at my expense? I have not the disposition for it. Not tonight. A drink, Aramis reiterated, and gently steered him in the direction of the refectory tents. I know so few of you in the fiftieth, and gathered his poor company around wine. Colchis raised a questioning brow, prompting her to elaborate. He doesn't drink. They laughed, and found the nearest refectory tent. It was dingy inside, a low hubbub of voices providing a subliminal hum to the bawdier exclamations of troopers deep in their cups. A gadolka was playing, a corporal Colchis recognized but couldn't recall the name of playing a lively song that a clutch of men sang along to. An inksmith plied their trade, having set up shop in one corner, where the sodium lamps blazed brightest. A brawny trooper gritted his teeth as the smithy tattooed his upper arm, the auto-needle and insect buzz in the background. He would do decent business tonight, the inksmith. A line had already begun to form. Every man wanted the same, the griffin rampant. It had become his sigil the hero of Lawton, the saviour of Myerland, conqueror of Ganad. Darian de Veres, son of Horator Danesk de Veres, Volponi glory personified. Tempted? Colchis smirked, but shook his head. I expect I'll be one of the few that abstains. It's said to bring luck on the bearer. He turned to face her. Then where's yours? Oh, she said knowingly, and gestured to a table. I don't believe in it. It or him. They sat down a little out of the way, and Aramis ordered a bottle. The mill serve brought it promptly. I saw him kill Vauger, you know. Colchis leant back, intrigued. It was not the stuff of poetry or song, she elaborated. It was ugly. And Ganza played his part in it, too, the poor dead bastard. But a headless corpse is a fairly ineffective talisman. You sound cynical. Just tired, and probably more candid than is wise. Morale has improved. And I salute the Perfectus in their cunning arts, she said. Colchis looked around. Several new faces were present with new regimental designations, reinforcements from the west and east, Stadish and Enghart doing their bit. One of the east intake caught Colchis's eye, young like a raw recruit, dark-haired, which was unusual for a Volponi. He sat alone and seemed to be looking for someone. When his gaze fell upon the lieutenant, he stared back, unflinching. Something about the raw recruit's manner felt awry. A soldier could usually spot another soldier in their carriage, in how they acted. This one had none of the usual hallmarks, and Colchis was about to mention it to Aramis when a crowd bustled in, a rabble of Talpa come to receive their ink. 
For a moment, he lost sight of the recruit, and by the time the tunnel rats had passed, the soldier who was not a soldier had gone. Kulkis briefly wondered if he had seen him at all as he massaged the bridge of his nose, grimacing. Everything all right? asked Aramis. Just need some sleep, he said, aware that he had barely caught more than an hour or two ever since the wire wolves. He regarded the bottle, hoping the peaceful oblivion he craved was somewhere near the bottom. It was of decent vintage, not cheap even by Volponi standards. Pushing the boat out, are we? he said, as Aramis poured two glasses and putting the strange encounter from his mind. What else are Militarum wages for? You know, I'm seeing a different side to you, Major. Ioni. Ioni, he corrected. The last time we spoke using our first names, you had a mind to put me in my place. You were an arrogant prick, Armand. I see some personal growth, though, so there's hope for you. Such a relief. She smiled, a little sad, a little weary. Her mood changed, became less frivolous. They say this might be the end of it. The war? Vogue said that about Loden. Aramis nodded. If you believe the talk, this is it. The border wall represents the last true bastion of the enemy. Rakespur will fall quickly after it's taken. The fortress is little better than a ruin. If you believe the talk. Yes, the talk. I don't think you brought me here to discuss tomorrow's battle. Are you a Konisberg man, Kulkis? she asked, her conversational dancing keeping the lieutenant on his toes. I have spent time in the capital before I shipped out. I studied there military history. Her eyes widened a little, and she leaned back, the glass cupped lazily in one hand. My, my, a scholar. Not exactly. The subject interested me, but the female intake at the Universitariat was prodigious. He gave a facial shrug, part apology, part insouciance. Aramis gave a snort of laughter. Of course, there are only women at the Universitariat now, barring a few of the lectors, of course. The men are all gone to war, singing Volponi glory, all the way to the departmental recruiters. You're here. My family is at Pascalon. If I wanted to keep the lands bequeathed to me by my late husband, I needed a military commission and rank. So I achieved both. But I don't relish either. I'm sorry. Don't be. My husband passed long ago, and I'm a damn fine officer. I'll make a difference in this war. By my sacrifice... My family back on Volponi is kept safe. I cling to that in the small hours when sleep will not come. But you know a thing or two about that, she said, and Colchis was reminded of their first meeting during one of his nocturnal wanderings. I saw it in your eyes, she explained, recalling that night. A man trying to mask his pain not a gadabout on the prowl. I could have been both. She drank, conceding the point, and poured another. Then one more for Kulkis, too. I feel numb, she said. Numb to loss, to pain. Thrown sometimes I wonder how I can feel at all. Anger is a feeling, said Kulkis, his quiet voice at odds with the words. I can't live by anger alone. A pause, and then, There will be no search, she said at length, and apropos of nothing. This was the root of it then, the reason for their drink, and Kulkis saw his own pain reflected in her face. Hauptmann and the others, he assumed, designated mortis relictus as of this evening. Hence, she held up the glass, already half-drained. 
I owed him money, he said, and felt stupid for doing so. You knew him? We played cards now and then, covenants. It had been a while. He was a bastard at cards, hard to read, always beat me. He was the first face I met upon redeployment. I gave him fuel. She smiled at that, but it was melancholy like all the others. Did you know his first name was Vilas? I always just called him Hauptmann. I should like to have known him better. I regret I'll probably never get the chance. She raised her glass. Vilas Hauptmann. Vilas Hauptmann, Kulkis replied. May the throne watch over him. A brief companionable silence fell between them until another voice intruded. Such a waste. Isaac Schiller stumbled into sight, wobbling the table as he collided with it on unsteady feet. Russet-cheeked, disheveled, he had been at it a while. His breath was so potent a chimera could have run on the fumes. A waste of what? said Aramis, her annoyance thinly veiled. Schiller pulled an ugly face, slurred, Can't decide. He leered at Aramis, seemingly unconcerned that she outranked him. I think you should leave, Isaac. Colchis scraped his chair back and stood. Let me escort you to your lodgings. Sit your ass down, snapped Schiller, dismissive, and you'll refer to me as captain. When your conduct is befitting your rank, he will, said Aramis, but gestured for Colchis to resume his seat, which he did. A waste of your station, Schiller slurred, as if the last part of the conversation hadn't happened. He smiled, a lopsided, sleepy curl of the mouth. Out here in these slums, it's unseemly, his lip curled. What makes you think you belong with any of us? Now see here, I don't care what bloody rank, Kulkis began, about to rise again, until Aramis gestured for calm and he sat still, simmering. You smell like you've drunk enough for the three of us, Schiller, she remarked, turning her attention to the captain, taking a measured sip. And it is impaired. You're already mediocre judgment. You see... I know your kind, the bullying hypocrite, the sort of man too afraid to face the ghosts of his lesser nature, and so he hides them behind some vice or other. The kind of man who beats on the weak and the frail and the ones who can't fight back so that he can feel strong, in charge. She barely moved throughout the tirade, save to take another sip. She didn't even look at him. I could pull rank here, chastise you in front of all these men, and do it noisily. I could reprimand you for being a piss-ass drunken lout who's forgotten his breeding and has mistaken vulgarity for presence. I won't. I don't need to. I see you, Schiller. I know what you are. Now leave, before I lose my temper and I really dress you down a peg. Schiller seethed, his face even redder than before, fists clenching and unclenching with impotent anger. He looked about to say something, but turned away instead and left without another word. Kulkis watched him depart, his turn now to make the well-I-never face. He also said, well, shit, that was quite something. I think I've had enough drink, said Aramis her eyes on his. At least here. What do you propose? I'm tired of feeling numb, Armand. I want to feel something else, or just something. I know what that's like. I have a bottle of risk, nicer than this one, back in my lodgings. I would gladly share it, if that's what you're asking, he said, she held his gaze. Well, I won't promise sleep. Aramis left, finishing off her drink, not waiting for the lieutenant. After a few moments, Colchis followed. 
Fenk didn't partake in the revelries. He haunted the fringes, the shadows instead. A massive intake of recruits and reinforcements had come in from the other army groups, and he watched them trail into camp in their perfect ranks. These soldiers had seen little of the war so far. He could tell by their bearing, the raised chins and unblinking eyes. So proud. Grossman was leveraging everything he had on this, pulling every string. He didn't want to be another Voke, but he spent men like coin, and he was an inveterate gambler on a winning streak. He liked risk, enjoyed the thrill of it. The grey host stirred, an itch rather than a compulsion, though the time was coming. He would have gladly killed Matthias Grussmann, given the chance. As if the thought of the man had brought him forth, Fenk's attention turned to movement in the dark, quiet, unassuming, clandestine, and definitely Grossman. He walked briskly and away from the crowds. None saw him, save Fenk, but the general was unaware he was being observed. A simple uniform, rest attire, nondescript. Fenk followed. He knew how to pass through a camp unremarked and unseen, but Fenk had to admit that Grossman knew his arts too, in staying hidden. After a few turns and a fairly circuitous route, the general arrived outside an officer's tent. It wasn't Grussman's, and that in itself was curious. A light burned softly within. Fenk sank back into the shadows as Grussman turned, looking to see if he was being watched. Believing all was well, he parted the tent flap, and Fenk caught the suggestion of other men awaiting him by the shape of the shadows within. Narrowing his eyes, he thought one of them might be Major Enghart, meeting his master at the door like a good lapdog. Fascinating, uttered Fenk, and slipped back into the night. Chapter 36 It appeared in the hour before sunrise, a plume of smoke indicating its passage south, stark and black against the faint pre-dawn light. Drizzle smeared the air on the outskirts of the camp, made it miserable and cold. But the delegation of officers and their attendants didn't grumble. They scarcely even moved. A stage had been raised to keep their fine boots out of the mud, a rare bit of pomp insisted upon by the general. A canvas awning cloaked it, but did a poor job of keeping out the wet and the wind. Banners fluttered, their fabric made heavy and sluggish by the rain. Grussman stood proudly, arms locked behind his back, chest out, a mill serve in a soaking uniform holding a black umbrella over his head. He looked like a man who had, until that moment, been uncertain in his works, but who now believed he had accomplished something no other could. Aramis turned up the collar on her storm coat. Hennessy in her peripheral vision, doggedly refusing to shiver. Rain dripped languidly from the rim of her officer's cap, and she breathed into her cupped hands, trying to coax a little warmth. She noticed Ren Saint a few feet behind the general. His cadet stood in his shadow, at heel, her bite considerably sharpened by the bionic serving in place of her severed arm. She brandished it plainly, the rain running off shiny plasteel in bright rivulets. Ren Saint was without his protégé, though, the bastard son of De Vere's, conspicuously absent from proceedings. He had a subdued air, the Lord Commissar, as if in deep contemplation about weightier matters. But Aramis had always found his kind in the Prefectus hard to read. Perhaps he was regretting giving the talisman of glorious Falponi the night off. Of the other officers in the crowd, only Schiller caught her eye. His slanted gaze in her direction slid away the moment he realized she had seen him, but the desire for retribution in his eyes and posture stood out like a flash grenade. Let him stew, Aramis thought. Another warm breath failed to stir much feeling in her half-frozen fingers, and she quietly cursed. 
I felt Valhallen winters with less bite than this wretched morning. Aramis turned, surprised to find Barbastian at her side. The man had a light tread. Lieutenant Colonel, she said, making a quick salute. Major, he replied genially. He was well attired as always, wearing a fine grey wool storm coat with gold thread piping and a high brocaded collar that encircled his neck like a gorget. A heavy cloak of vermilion kept off the worst of the weather, and he held a black umbrella in a velvet gloved hand. His skin was supple, well tended, he was immaculately groomed, and smelled pleasantly of musk and cinnamon. Barbastian had always struck Aramis as a foppish officer, but that didn't tell the entire story. She knew little of substance about him, but what she did know she liked. Despite his apparent vanity, he had genuine resolve that she found some Volponi lacked, on account of their comfortable lives and entitled upbringing. None of that from Barbastian, though she understood he came from a high-ranking house of royal Volponi, Konisberg, like Colchis. The thought sparked a recent memory. She had left Armand in the early hours, asleep in her bed. He looked like he could use it, so she hadn't disturbed him or left a note. She hadn't the heart for sentiment, but had been grateful for his company. He would find his way back to his own barracks, a moment of shared humanity between them, and nothing more. I should congratulate you on your field promotion, said Barbastian, pulling Aramis from her thoughts. We haven't had a chance to speak properly since Myerland. How are the 86th and the 50th? Despite the ostensible bonhomie, Barbastian looked distracted, even troubled, like he was going through the motions of polite conversation by way of a learned response rather than genuine inquiry. Lean and eager, sir, though I think the fiftieth won't be with me much longer. I had expected to see Regara here, but heard he was still in Medicae. Barbastian's expression pinched a little, as if reminded of a different worry he had tried to quash. It's a damn miracle he's alive at all, he said candidly, before immediately retracting his statement. I apologize, Major. This war has been testing on us all. Again, that darkness to him, a weight. His gaze fell on Grussman and hardened. The general was like an imperial statue, chiseled of arrogance and bombast. It was reckless, Aramis said boldly, assuming the general was the cause of the lieutenant colonel's distraction. The order. I saw it given. He did it heedlessly and without pause. Barbastian looked like he wanted to reprimand her for this descent, his eyes on her suddenly sharp. She withstood it, looked back, daring him to disagree. Be mindful he said, taking the milder course. We serve the Imperium, not ourselves. To all intents and purposes, the General is the Imperium. Yes, sir, said Aramis, allowing a mote of contrition into her voice. Of course, sir. But she didn't agree with that, in Grossman's preeminence or his fitness to lead, and neither did Barbastian, though the words remained unsaid. A shadow fell across him as his mind turned inwards again. A clamor arose in the distance, prompting them both to look forwards. A procession of warriors had begun to materialize out of the rain, silver and red armor glinting with icy droplets, the lantern glow of fusion weapons, and the copper gleam of volkites like beacons in the gloaming. They marched in perfect order, a cohort of robed skitari, the Mechanicus's own foot soldiers. Pale visors flashed in bucket-shaped helms, suggesting something cold and inhuman underneath. Equine Cerberus and lanky dragoon walkers loped either side in two cavalcades. Above, a flock of winged Taraxi whirled and circled. Aramis had dealt with tech priests before. They were often strange, 
and not only on account of their cyborganic appearance. She had never fought alongside their troops, though, and to her, the Mechanicus Skitari and their auxiliaries were like something created in a laboratorium and barely human at all. She reckoned on six hundred warriors. Martians did like ceremony, and this had every hallmark of one, but as impressive as it was, it paled into insignificance next to the weapon they escorted. It rolled on thick iron treads, immense and daunting. It had imposed itself on the horizon far in advance of its retinue, a slow-moving edifice of hard metal and softly glowing fusion capacitors. Towering, it dwarfed the stage and those upon it, the air thrumming with energy output. To have done this, to have wrenched it from the foundations of Lawton and fashioned tracks to drive it, an engine to move it. She balked at first at the sheer audacity, the terrible majesty. So did the other officers, and Grussman stood taller, as if drinking in their awe and finding it empowering. Godsword had come to Carcass. Chapter 37 Darian sat alone and contemplated the wall. Even seven miles away, it was daunting. A seemingly unending barrier of ferrocrete and granite, ten feet thick and much taller than the gatehouse at Ganad, it severed the Carcass region from the rest of Agria. Hard, grey mountains flanked it east and west like monolithic capstones, the place of their joining to the wall lost to the night. But it was still an incredible expanse. It had been raised early in the occupation, so the briefings claimed, and taken years to construct. He had never seen a fortification of its like, but tomorrow the Volponi would try to take it, and Darian would lead them. The men reveled at camp, joined by throngs of reinforcements from the other armies, whose transports had been arriving throughout the night. He heard their songs, their voices of premature celebration like ghosts on the early morning breeze. Few would sleep, few could. He was amongst them, but preferred solitude to revelry. How different his life had become. The yard where he had knelt awaiting the executioner's bullet had never felt so far away all for the crime of stealing a soldier's uniform and lasgun. It seemed petty in retrospect. His trappings had since grown more opulent than those borrowed garments, his armor alone worth more than an officer's yearly stipend. It was the finest thing he had ever owned, a near inviolable protection that fended off more than blades and bullets. It had built a barrier between him and Lena, too. That and his recently found noble standing. She had disappeared from camp, it seemed. Darian thought she was avoiding him after their last awkward encounter. He missed her. So the armor stayed in his barracks until he had to wear it, too painful a reminder of what he had given up, and too precious to be wasted when the propaganda machine wasn't turning. The politics especially left a foul taste in the mouth, it had turned him from a soldier into a spectacle and put a gulf between him and the one true friend he had. The desire he had once nurtured to belong, to serve and find a purpose, felt more remote than ever. I am alone, he said to the darkness. A man answered. In the end, we are all alone. The Major had some cuts and bruises, his usually handsome face a scar-threaded mess, but he would heal. He gestured to the stack of Munitorum crates where Darian had perched. May I? Of course, sir. Darian shifted up unnecessarily. Regara took a seat and let out a long, easing breath. He no longer wore the prosthetic Darian had seen him with at Ganad. In its place was a chrome-plated bionic, still gleaming, it whirred and growled as it moved. The Major winced, causing Darian to frown. It's just pain, Regara explained. 
fresh forged and still it aches like the nine devils. I blame the rain. A light drizzle fell across the camp in gentle veils, but Darian had barely noticed, so lost was he in his thoughts. Perhaps the Magos can make an adjustment? I doubt it, Regara replied, sanguine. The cold, the damp, the damn air itself. I think the ache is there to remind me of what I lost. At least, that's how I've come to think of it. An old, annoying friend, like a guest who won't leave, but I haven't the heart to throw out, and end up needing the company. I see, sir. Something about Regara struck him, not melancholy exactly, but a sort of weariness. Perhaps his injuries had taken more of a toll than he let on. That is to say, Regara continued, that we all must reconcile with loss. Remember it, cling to it, for it teaches us. The lessons are different, depending on what's been taken. For me, it's a reminder of humility. I've never had much to lose, I don't think. My mother died when I was young, and she was everything to me. The camp became my life, a mill serve without a house. He paused, considering. There was someone, a friend, maybe more. She and I, well, it feels like another world, a different life. Now, I just feel the weight of what others will lose if I fail. Regara listened, nodded. It's a heavy burden. One I never asked for. Of course you did. You asked for it when you put on that uniform, when you retook God's sword. Regara looked him in the eye, stern but not unkind. And when you saved me by dragging my sorry ass into a crater outside Lawton, heroism isn't a cloak you put on or a uniform you wear when it suits you. It's innate. He leaned over and tapped Darian's chest. In here. The pride in Regara's eyes warmed him, a feeling long absent in Darian's upbringing. Tears welled, revealing the boy behind the hero's facade. You remind me of him, though I didn't see it before. I don't suppose I was looking for it. Your father, I mean. You know him? I do. As well as any can, I suppose. He is a fine man and an even finer general. He gripped Darian's shoulder. But paternal instincts are not in his blood. Ren Saint says he is ill. Regara's face darkened, and he let his hand fall away. Grievously, I'm afraid. They had taken de Vere's back to Lanchetek, far from the front lines. Crusade command had wanted him removed from Agria entirely, but the old general had insisted. He would see out the war even from his deathbed, his puissance diminished, but not his influence. Eirik had larger problems, and no one else had the will or the authority to countermand the old war hero. Darian had learned all of this from Rensaint, absorbing the information without comment. Then it's probable... I'll never meet him. He turned away, emotions knotting like tangled ropes. I think I should feel sadness or anger, but all I have is an absence of feeling. To me, he was, is, a great man, said Regara. I will mourn his passing, for the Sabbath crusade will be the poorer for it. I should hate him, but I'm only alive because of his grace. Regara had no answer for that. His gaze found the wall instead. This throne-forsaken war, may the nine devils take it, he said at length, and rose gingerly. God, Emperor, I am stiffer than flackboard. For the first time, Darian noticed the cane Regara carried. Do you need some assistance, Major? 
No, just a decent bath and dry clothes. Maybe a strong drink or two. Are you staying? A while longer, I think. Regara nodded, as if giving tacit approval. Horator de Vere's casts a long shadow, but it needn't define you. I would try to remember that, said the Major. Regara gave Darian a last look, and then walked away, limping back to camp. Darian returned to the wall, lost in its endless expanse, and saw the sun cresting the horizon. Bound up in its light was his fate. Chapter 38 Puck had gone. They had taken him some time in the night, though Hauptmann found night and day hard to determine, time having lost all meaning in the confines of his cell. It could have been days, even weeks. He had no gauge. The first he knew of Puck was waking to an absence of the Talpa's gentle whimpering. He rose groggily, unsure of the hour and aching from having slept on bare rock. He was far from rested. Dreams had come to him during those fitful hours in the dark, bloody dreams of old wars and men long dead. They haunted him as grey revenants, cold-eyed and hollow-cheeked, demanding to know the manner of their demise. Hauptmann told them every one. Impaled on razor wire, dismembered by a mine, shot through the eye by a sniper. He relived every moment, every savage death, until they merged into an unending horror. Burned alive when the fuel tanks blew, shredded by a frag grenade, incinerated by a plasma misfire. Waking exorcised them, though the memory of their ragged faces lingered on for hours after, slowly fading like mist before the dawn. A pipe in one corner of the room dripped languidly, arresting his thoughts. Hauptmann shuffled to it, taking his fill. The water was brackish and tinny, but it was all his captors afforded him. He had considered it might be tainted, but not drinking it would condemn him as surely as any poison in the water. And so he pressed his mouth to the pipe and supped greedily like a lapping dog. After he was done, he sagged against the wall, squinting at the harsh light filtering through the apertures. It was a sickly yellow, but at least he could see and read by it. He took out the letters, the ones he had stuffed into his pocket, the ones the pact had not seen fit to remove. Wiry penmanship scratched across the page of one, revealed as he unfolded it. They all began the same, a line or two of empty platitudes, expressions of regret and sorrow, of pride and sacrifice. This one was for Private Venak. He had served as a voxman on the Lehman Russ battle tank Sunderer and died on the road to Kobor. Hauptmann had spared his widow the details, instead concocting a more palatable fiction by which to remember her husband. She didn't need to read about the skin burning from his bones or the desperate screaming before he finally succumbed. These memories were for Hauptmann to harbor, every gray-faced boy held within, crying for home, for mothers and fathers and wives. He stopped, closing the letter, closing his eyes as he fought to keep from crying out, not in pain, but in anger. The anguish of futility had never felt so close, but he forced himself to go on because it was better than the silence of his other thoughts and the reminder of where he was and what would likely happen to him. He unfolded another letter, and his heart pushed up into his throat at the name. Reynold Garrison, devoured by beasts. Ever happy to share a smoke if he had one, he had dirt under his nails, did Garrison, which to a Paduan meant he was a man of earthy grit and stoic humor. Hauptmann remembered a recon mission on Monthax. His unit had ditched their mounts at the jungle's edge and had to proceed on foot through swampland. It was heavy canopy, thick with foliage. An arcanate ambush would have done for them all, a four-man execution squad. 
except Garrison had caught wind of it first. Ambushers became ambushed. Garrison killed three himself, and Hauptmann shot the other. Quiet, fast, lethal. A finer scout Hauptmann had never known. It mattered little when the beasts took him and tore him up like so much meat. Then he thought of Roper, incinerated in burning Prometheum, and Mathis, atomized by a macro cannon blast, and Lennox, shot in the side of the head at point blank range. He didn't have letters for all of them, but he still saw their faces. Hauptmann crumpled up the paper, pressing it to his face, shouting into it until the shouting turned to convulsion, and he was spitting up blood and anointing the parchment pages in flecks of crimson, all because of that damned radstorm. A faulty breather he could never have known. Vilas Hauptmann. Radiation poisoning. The scrape of a bolt pulling clear of its socket made him look up, as the cell door ground open and two guards in packed armor and snarling grotesques hustled in. Hauptmann recoiled, scurrying back, kicking and clambering on his elbows. He lurched onto his feet, took a swing, and missed. A hard punch to the gut bent him double. He heard a guttural warning, something in their language he didn't know but understood. They seized him then, one guard for each arm. Hauptmann kicked, raising hell, but he was weak from the poison in his blood, from malnourishment and fear. Feet dragging, they took him. Once past the threshold, the light hit. Grubby lumens and flickering sodium lamps. But after the near dark of his cell, it burned. So much brighter outside, and the world tinged red, like light passed through blood behind glass. He couldn't look at it at first, but then he acclimatized. He was brought to a large room, reminiscent of the chamber below the old fort. Panic spiked, and Hauptmann struggled until a cuff to the head subdued him, nearly knocked him unconscious. Dazed, he saw prisoners, all militarum, each was bound to a metal frame. Edged and spiked like a torture rack. Every regiment was represented. He tried to find Puck, but there were too many, and his vision was blurring. A few were hooded, unmoving. Hauptmann couldn't determine if they were alive or dead. He heard talking, gibbering, an Arcanate officer in a long, dirty coat and half-mask, listening to one of the prisoners scribbling notes on a clipboard. Hauptmann recognized mission plans, tactics, engagements that had already happened, and then some things he didn't know, couldn't have known, because they were yet to be or might never be. He couldn't explain it, but there was something about the room, about how it seemed larger than it should be, a liminal space of strange angles and queer resonances. Several of the captured soldiers were gazing upwards, necks craned, they trembled in their shackles, softly chanting, Sentua me. I am a witness. Old memories returned like bad eggs, churning in his gut. A witness to what? Hauptmann lifted his head. It felt like an anchor was strapped around his neck, and he strained with the effort. A ceiling of stars was unveiled above, a firmament of cracked glass, of fathomless flecks. They had already bound his wrists, his ankles, his neck, imprisoned him in the metal frame like all the others, his eyelids pinned back. And as the stars unfurled, collided, merged, he saw and he knew, and at last he screamed. Chapter 39 Furnace heat swelled around the foot of the wall. Perspiration beaded Kulkis's face, his sodden uniform sticking to his back. His armor shimmered with reflected discharge from the refractor field. It had the look of something arcane and medieval, a literal mantlet on a wheeled carriage accompanied by six pavisors in red mechanicus garb. It lit the air, 
turned it actinic, made it stifling, but held off the deadly rain from above. Mounted packed guns hammered the Volponi, massive shells and energy beams battering the Aegis, generated by the man-portable shield array, as the troops ran for the wall and the blind zone, where the heavier weapons lacked the firing arc to target them. The refractor shield was large enough to cover a platoon in close formation, thirty men sweating and swearing beneath a barrier of violent energy. Dozens threaded the front line, swathes and swathes of Imperial soldiers crouched under flickering fields, awaiting the order to ascend. A horn blast rang out, augmented by a vox emitter, and a unit nearby threw mag grapnels to begin their assault. The iron teeth of the grapnels bit, the inertia of magnetic attraction ensuring they stayed that way. Cables tensed, and thirty men climbed. Then thirty more further up the wall, and another and another. Platoon by platoon, Volponi grey in abundance. Hundreds and hundreds, too many for the naked eye to calculate. Las beams snapped up from below, withering in their intensity, herding the wall defenders behind crenellations. Still they returned fire, washing the wall face with energy beams and solid shot, scything down attackers until they fell in an avalanche of bodies. A secondary cadre of attackers had erected ladders. The rungs spiked, so they tugged at stone and held it. Twenty had mounted them. As the deadfall of men from above collapsed every ladder, fifty or sixty Volponi plummeting to their deaths, or else crushed by the bodies that crashed over them. This was but one section. Hundreds more told grimmer stories. A grind is how the drill sergeants used to put it, the meat grinder of war, the leveraging of one number of men against another until attrition tips the scale and a bitter stalemate becomes a slaughter. Morbid mathematics, Kulkis had often thought of it. From his officer's training, he knew siege warfare was brutal, the trade-off between inches gained and blood shed, the meanest and most profligate. He hunkered down, awaiting the order. Schiller had the vox horn, and looked up with bleak resignation at the dire scenario they would soon face. His bloodshot eyes told the story of the previous night's indulgence, but no amount of risk could dull the senses to this. A shriek overhead had them crouching, shrinking into near-fetal position as the heavy mortars thundered another barrage. It struck a section of the wall, close enough to shake the earth and spill dust clouds either side. Kulkis choked, pulling up a scarf around his mouth to ward off the worst of it. Grice had turned white, his eyes wide with barely contained panic. "'Are we headed up, sir?' asked Hanmar, voice muffled by the echoes of slowly subsiding ordnance. Rake and Dresk stood nearby, hunched up, Promethean canisters strapped to their backs, a flamer hooked to the side. Kulkis held up his palm flat. Wait. Schiller raised his fist for them to hold, then put the voxhorn to his lips. Over a hundred men were on this section alone supported by a cohort of fifty Agrians digging trenches and filling them with seismic charges. The bombs rippled in a daisy chain across the wall mountings, trembling earth, heaving dust, but to little practical effect. The natives would remain under the aegis, sapping and undermining, though none had reported finding the base of the wall yet. A glance to Colchis's left revealed a clutch of Agrian auxiliaries over in the next section, who, unlike their sapper countrymen, carried las guns and had no picks or shovels. They would defend the sappers from enemy sorties. He recognized the Gulliver amongst their ranks, Macaulay giving him that enigmatic look she usually wore. They will come for you when you are unready, she had said. Maybe the Cossacks wouldn't wait for him to be unarmed and alone. Maybe they'd just try to kill him here. He couldn't see them, but soldiers milled everywhere, and the air was foul with smoke and dust. It was controlled chaos. Kulkis looked up instead, the tension like a knot tightening in his chest. He fought to keep his breath steady, though his heart punched like a piston hammer. 
one deadly step at a time. Another mortar barrage followed the previous one, the seconds in between stretching into hours. It hit the wall section nearby in rapid succession, a decent chaining of explosive shells that sent pactors reeling from their posts. This was it. The Vauxhorn blared, shrilling like an inhuman scream, and all thoughts of murderous Cossacks fled from his mind. Kulkis bellowed the order, though his cries were all but obliterated by the sounds of battle. They ran the short distance remaining to the wall. His mag grapnel found purchase, like a dozen others. The cable taut in the instant before he began to climb. Encumbered by lasgun and a grenade bandolier, every step took effort. The soldier ahead of him, Vedris, slipped and nearly took the others with him. They reached almost eighty feet, halfway to the summit of the wall, before the shooting started. It came from enfilading positions, the angle to the assault platoons too narrow for the defenders directly above them to draw a bead. Slanting las beams whipped in. Sedic fell, the trooper shot through the arm and losing his grip. He screamed all the way down, his body crushing two men beneath him who had been waiting to ascend. Two more were hit in close succession, then another and another. One of the dead became entangled, his foot looped around a cable, hanging by the ankle like a butcher's carcass. Hanmar, on the rope adjacent to Kolkis, cut the dead man free, and the body fell like all the rest. Climb, urged Kolkis, bellowing to be heard. Climb! Vedris got a better grip, and hand over hand clawed back a few feet. A shot to the neck ended him, blood spattering Kolkis's upturned cheek like rain. Then the dead man tipped back as gravity exerted itself, and the lieutenant pressed his body flat against the wall and shouted, Incoming! Vedris took out one other on the cable, a corporal too slow to react. They tumbled groundwards, embracing like lovers. Kulkis climbed. After nearly three shoulder-burning minutes, he gained the battlement at the summit of the wall. Hanmar had got there ahead of him, and Grice, the two men helping their fellow troopers over. Several more died in this moment, shot as they were leaping onto the battlements. Skirmishes had broken out across the length of it. An explosion a few sections over lifted men of both sides into the air, bodies flung outwards in ungainly parabolas. Billowing smoke occluded the rest. Kulkis scarcely had time to react, as a hooked blade swept in for his neck. He turned it, his sabre unsheathed on instinct, and shot the pactor through the heart with his pistol. At his side, Hanmar killed two others, his blade work as economic as it was deadly. Grice blasted another, the burly sergeant burning ammo on rapid fire as he fought to make a space to exploit. They were hemmed in, arcanate fighters either side. Sporadic gunfire cracked left and right. A bullet buzzed close by, hot and loud. All sound disappeared behind the tinnitus whine in Colchis's ear before rushing back. The fighting grew close, hand to hand. Sidearms predominated. Somewhere a chain blade started up. Until Rake gunned the flamer and turned the air in front of him into burning Prometheum, men became candles in its rippling light, smeared brown smudges lost to haze and fire. They collapsed, surrendering to smoke and heat. A few, blind and panicked, leapt to their deaths. Kulkis morbidly watched them flailing as they hit the ground. A momentary efflux of enemies bought by Rake's flamer gave a few seconds of relief. "'It's a bloody cauldron, sir!' shouted Grice, slamming a fresh clip into his lasgun. "'I think they've been saving themselves for this fight!' Kulkis nodded to his sergeant. He glanced to the side, several sections east, to where Darian and his cohort had just climbed the parapet. He led them like he was born to it, which the lieutenant supposed he was. Bring us victory, he uttered, returning his attention to his men. Leave them core, he said to Hanmar, the field medic having crouched to tend to one of the wounded. We need to push on. 
Hanma made the sign of the Aquila over the stricken trooper's chest and retrieved his sword, wiping it across his uniform until it shone. It's a heavy damn price, he said. Scattered throngs of blood-packed troops milled in the courtyard, which was strewn with half-raided ammo caches and supplies. Most of their strength was on the walls. They were throwing everything into this defense, a last-ditch effort to hold the Imperium at bay. They know they're beaten, replied Kulkis, and are testing our resolve. His gaze strayed to beyond the wall, and not so far away the grim shadow of Rickspur. It was an isolated and decrepit ruin, like a dead man's hand reaching from the grave. On the imperial side of the wall, flickering with grainy bluish luminescence, stood a hundred-foot hololith of Darian Devere's. Banner upraised, sword unsheathed, it had been carefully crafted by Rensaint and his propaganda machine. Perhaps the truth would live up to the story. Seeing Darian on that wall fighting as he did made Kulkis dare to believe it. Men cheered for it either way, a ghost rendered in light. A laz burst yanked Kulkis back to the moment as a trooper in front of him took a hit and peeled away, turning and then falling into oblivion. Reinforcements were moving up, peppering the Valponi attackers with heavy stubber fire wielded by jean bulked packed heavies. A platoon was driven off the wall, men flung outwards, some pushed, some jumping like sailors abandoning ship. Fire chased them as the enemy pushed their own burner teams to the front. A pair latched onto Kulkis's platoon, a masked surder jabbing an order towards Grice and a squad of blue bloods. The sergeant had taken a knee, Laz's gun braced into his shoulder, and was hammering shots into the burners but they advanced like human tanks, armoured head to foot, ponderous but inexorable. Their flame units were crude things, long-necked and with flared muzzles, black streaks across their heavy plate like war paint, the grotesque doubling up as a breather mask. Schiller was bellowing, the words lost in the tumult, fighting like a red-faced devil. He was trying to forge a path away from the burners, hewing down pactors with his sword, and showing Kulkis how he came to be a decent captain despite the fact he was a wretched man. It wasn't enough. The flame spurt plumed, expanding from a thin spit to a wide swathe. Screaming followed, Volponi burning, then falling. Grice had thrown himself flat, the heat searing his back before Kulkis put a lasbolt through the burner's fuel intake, and the tank went up in a fireball. It took out the second burner, too, the explosion shaking the entire wall section. Several pacted died in the blast, including the surder. Bones turned to kindling. Their bodies spread across a scorched black smear. Hanmar ran to help Grice, who was staggering back, singed but otherwise alive. The dead lay everywhere, their uniforms almost indistinguishable from one another, a growing hecatomb. "'Bloody throne!' gasped Schiller, his breathing laboured as he took a pull from a flask hidden beneath his breastplate. He snarled as Kulkis's eyes fell upon him. "'I'll let the Emperor be my judge, Lieutenant,' he said, and added sadly, "'Me protect us all!' The captain stormed off, barking and cajoling the men, asserting order. They were losing. Kulkis caught his breath, but respite was fleeting. A discordant clarion ripped through the air. More of the pact were coming. Chapter 40 Aramis gained the wall, heaving herself up and over through a hail of bullets and crackling las beams. A blue blood took a kill shot to the chest and fell back, pinning her beneath his dead weight. Armoured and laden with full kit, it was like pushing against an anvil. Fighting the urge to cry out, Aramis yanked hard on the trooper's belt to try to roll him, but the corpse barely moved. She pushed, grunting with effort, but it was like bench-pressing a tank. Breath hitching. She pushed one more time, muscles burning in her arms, and heaved. A sliver of light spilled into the crack between her and the body. 
hands reached in alongside her own, and together they hauled the corpse aside. She was met by Fink, who looked down at her without emotion as he offered her his hand. Lieutenant, my thanks, she gasped. It appears even the dead are against us. He smiled coldly. Well, we wouldn't want to make it too easy, Major, Fink replied as he helped her up. She nodded, stopping short of clapping him on the shoulder before he carried on. Two platoons of Volponi had formed a firing echelon and were shooting two ranks deep in perfect order. It effectively cleared the wall section and gave the rest of the troopers unmolested seconds to join them. Hennessy hurried over. Are you all right, Major? Should I summon a medic? He looked about, as if to do so until Aramis calmed him. She realized there was blood on her uniform and had been initially distracted, watching Fenk as he headed back into the fray, calmly discharging his sidearm, every shot a kill. He barely blinked, as if killing were as natural as breathing. For some men it was, those who in war had left a piece of their humanity behind, and Aramis saw that trait in Bertram Fenk. Not my blood, Corporal, she said at last, putting Fenk to the back of her mind and drew her sword. A glance west along the battlements revealed a fierce struggle for the wall's main command section. Through a scope, she caught a glimpse of Darian, refulgent in his silver armor, a beacon of glorious light. A banner rippled in his wake like a gonfalon announcing his presence. A retinue of first sons surrounded him, as well as a cadre of Volponi veterans. Rensaint and Gannica were his right hand, the Prefectus aiming to win the propaganda and the physical war in one emphatic blow. She pulled her eye away. Her forces were east of the main push, and the craggy mountains towered above them, casting a long shadow. Arcanate defenses were thinner at this end of the wall, and if she could breach and overrun them, then Dagger and Spear Company would sweep the courtyard. A long flight of stone steps led down to it, and was held by scattered packed troops clustered behind hastily raised barricades. That's our ingress, she said, aiming her sword towards the stairs. Volponi, glory! Aramis shot a packed trooper, cutting off the top of their skull as she charged. The corpse tumbled, and she surged on, stabbing another through the chest, before kicking them against the flackboard mantlet. The barricade capitulated against the impact, it and the dead trooper spilling down the steps. Like a mudslide, it swept up other soldiers caught in its manic swell. A pactor went to throw a grenade, but Fenk shot him in the stomach, and the close explosion tore enemy troopers from the stairway in a loud blast. Light shrapnel patted Aramis's armor, but she forged through it, leading her men without hesitation. A surda stepped forwards, cutting down two blue bloods trying to engage her with bayonets before she met Aramis. A bloody daubing across her helm marked her as section commander, a cleaver sword glistening wetly in one hand. Upon sighting the Volponi major, the surda drew a second blade, a falx, its hooked edge stained with old blood. Twirling both weapons artfully, she brought them together in a crash of steel, metal ringing loudly across the stairway. Aramis raised her jeweled sword in salute and attacked. The flurry of blades snapped like silver lightning, metal clanging shrilly with every collision of blades. Two swords against her one, Aramis fought defensively. She adopted a duelist's posture, her officer training extending to fencing as well as pugilism and turned her side towards the enemy to present a narrower target. For every attack, she countered a swift lunge that bit armor, skin, nothing but flesh wounds. Chaos raged all around, pactors and blue bloods engaged in savage close-quarter exchanges, but none interfered. She backed off as the Surda unleashed a chain of heavy blows, mindful of the stairs behind her, and conscious that one stumble would end the duel. Her sword darted, parrying attack after attack, her dauntless patience unswerving, until at last she drew an error, and the Surda made a hasty lunge. 
It overbalanced the packed officer, who was unable to recover, as Aramis stepped aside and stabbed her opponent through the heart. She withdrew the blade as swiftly as a whip, giving the surder a few seconds of boastful ignorance before the grin faded on her scarred mouth and she collapsed. Discipline, what little there was of it, broke down after that. The frenzied attacks quickly faded, the pact has taken apart by staunch Volponi precision and order. A rout followed, Aramis shoving the corpse with her boot, the dead Serda rolling like a barrel down a ramp. The barricades gave way, upended or abandoned, as the enemy accepted their futility and fled. The Blue Bloods took the vacated ground, moving with stoic efficiency and the courtyard in sight. Two platoons had set up positions on the edge of the stairway and fired calmly into the morass of blood packed below. Heavier troops diverted east to meet the threat assailing the Arcanate flank, killed the routers as they spilled into the courtyard and rallied whatever was left. They were death brigade, elites clad in thick crimson carapace, who showed a discipline and precision the equal of militarum science. The Volponi vanguard, with the major at their head, gained the edge of the courtyard. Supply crates and barrels provided scant cover for both sides, a short-range firefight erupting between them. Through the ferocious weapons exchange, Aramis saw a figure being herded through the enemy throng. She caught sight of Munitorum issue fatigues and boots, dirty with use, a man in chains, his head covered by a crudely stitched leather hood. Hennessy, she called, trusting her aide's eyes over her own. The corporal found her in moments, and was quickly by her side, hunkering behind a supply cache where Aramis had taken position, lasfire splashing against the crates and drums. God, Emperor, he said. That's Militarum. That man's a prisoner. Talpa, I think. Aramis bellowed down the vox, notifying all squad sergeants of the danger. Shots cracked either side of the hooded guardsman, who stumbled blindly into the firestorm. The Death Brigade followed, pushing the prisoner ahead of them. Others joined him, emerging through occluding smoke, a narrow phalanx of six human shields. It was sickening, and Aramis took no small pleasure in killing the Pactors, who fell beyond this perverted aegis. Closer they crept, always one man behind each prisoner, a long-hafted goad driving them on. Only when the disheveled Talpa was within thirty paces did Aramis notice the hook attached to the man's hood and the thin line of wire tied to it. Hennessy saw it too, and she felt his hands upon her shoulders, pushing her to the ground as the wire went taut and the hood pulled away. As if the light had roused them from awful torpor, the prisoners spoke, Sentiwa me! A vice of fear clamped around her gut as she was propelled back to the Agora when the mad first son had set off a grenade. There were no explosions here, but men died all the same. A blue blood fell as if polaxed. Aramis caught a glance at his face, skin drained to white, eyes milky orbs in their sockets. Then another, and another. There was maddened screaming, how many afflicted uncertain, their identities unknown. Hennessy, she growled, gripping her pistol, but Hennessy didn't answer, though he held her down, arms rigid. The rest of him was shaking, bolt upright, blood streaming from his ears, nose, and eyes. It took a few seconds for Aramis to realize he was already dead, bleached white and wide-eyed. Only when he began to shrivel like a carcass left over long in the sun did she understand. She had to prize his dead hands away, Gavid Hennessy, who she had known for years, who had been her aid and confidant. Then she stood, but kept behind the crates and drums, a chorus of deranged voices getting closer. Sentua may! To look upon them would be to invite death, Aramis knew it in her marrow, the flock of fallen blue bloods she could see staring into hellish oblivion. Their last sight. 
She felt the presence of the afflicted, for what else was it but some kind of chaos-bred infection draw near? Heard their breath, their wild chants, the edge of a scuffed militarum boot emerged at the end of the crate. Aramis shut her eyes, too afraid to look, and fired blind. A muffled grunt, and the body fell. She relaxed a fraction, but another of the afflicted had got behind her. She turned too slowly, the pistol bark a desultory echo before strong hands seized her arm and throat. Lashing out, she felt a jawbone snap, but the pressure increased on her neck, and the weight of her assailant bore her to the ground. A snarl. Sentua may. Warm spittle flecked her cheek. He stank of stale sweat and dirty cloth, eyes clamped shut. She wondered why she wasn't already dead, why the pectors hadn't slaughtered her where she lay, and realized she wasn't fighting the death brigade. They had merely unleashed the threat. The hoods, the goads, the arcanate troops were susceptible too. She rammed her knee into her attacker's gut, and the grip around her throat eased enough for her to unsheathe the knife from her boot. Reversing her grip on the knife, she waited for an intake of breath as her attacker made to chant again and jammed the serrated blade into his mouth. He gargled, a tumble of broken syllables, half drowned in his own blood, and fell still. Aramis hefted the corpse aside, now light and emaciated, without its feverish vitality to make it a threat. She risked a glance, one eye half open. A dead talpa lay on his back next to her, a smudge on his left cheek that might have been a tattoo. The dirt made it hard to be sure. His eyes had burned out as if by a fierce heat, and from within— a gash on his forehead had a similar ocular shape, also seared black and gaping. Her knife lodged in his mouth hadn't killed him, not outright. Whatever they were, these poor bastards, they didn't last long. Dead Volponi surrounded her, the vanguard whittled down to scraps. Fenk lived and was gathering up whatever was left and forming them into a fighting retreat. Aramis was about to protest, but quickly realized the parlor state they were in, almost half their number slain, with death brigade creeping through smoke and fog. Laz beams began zipping in her direction. She nodded to Fenk as she caught his eye, her expression thunderous as she bellowed into the vox, Fall back! Chapter 41 the pacted warrior died on the edge of his sword. Darian shucked the body loose, leaving a smear of gore against the blade and letting it tumble off the battlement into the courtyard below. Resistance was fierce on this part of the wall, the Arcanate warriors almost all death brigade, and thus well-trained and highly disciplined. At the outset of the Sabbat crusade, to see such a force amongst the supposedly barbarian sanguinary tribes defied belief for many, that the archenemy could learn and adapt to militarum tactics so effortlessly. After years of fighting the blood pact, the Imperium had learned the error of that assumption. They had singled Darian out, a host of warriors eager to gut him on their savage blades. He had dispatched every one, his own sword and azure fire amidst the battlefield gloom. Clouds had gathered overhead, potentous, as if nature itself sensed the import of the moment. Here we will end it, he had heard said, and on countless occasions. Grusman had a plan, or so it was believed. Darian saw that plan enter the field, far beyond the shadow of the wall, and the soldiers fighting ferociously to take it. God sword. It looked different to how he remembered it at Loddon. Then it had been an amorphous machine of cables and power conduits, of curved metal behind ramparts too close to properly comprehend. Here, beheld at a distance, it was destruction incarnate trundling on immense, segmented tracks. Its main cannon aimed to the sky. It was an engine of war to dwarf all others. Deific in more than name alone. 
A cohort of Mechanicus troops marched alongside it, both as religious devotees and defenders. As he fought, Rensaint and the other commissar at his side, Darian caught the flare of power building in its capacitors and knew it was being primed to fire. A shot lashed against him, spilling harmlessly across the refractor field. He had grown used to its protection. The strange heat wash of energy dispersion or the flash of rapid ignition as bullets disintegrated against its barrier. Only a few tried to kill him at distance, most preferring close quarters. Darian turned one blade, hacking down with his own and severing a limb. The smell of cauterized meat rose nauseatingly before disappearing behind smoke and metal. He stabbed another, a quick thrust that parted heavy armor with ease, tearing it open like canvas. Blood sizzled as it met the blade, the stench like overcooked liver. A scarred hand reached out to drag him down. Darian cut it off at the wrist. He parried a burring chainsword, shattering it in a blur of exploding shrapnel. It was a grind with much spent and little gained by either side. The pact too entrenched and well fortified to capitulate. The Volponi too determined to be repulsed. Darian found himself tiring, despite the advantages of his peerless arms and armor, and for a moment he began to doubt. A brief secession in the fighting, as the first sons bore the brunt of the arch-enemy counter-assault, allowed a moment's grim reflection. What if we lose? What if I am unworthy, after all? Rensaint's presence at his shoulder reassured him, as if the Lord Commissar had read Darian's heretical thoughts. The Emperor is with us, said Rensaint, though like many others he looked overtaxed and grey with effort. Only Gannica appeared undiminished. The Commissar, amidst the harshest fighting, her bionic arm, like a reaping metronome, gripped around her chain blade. Rensaint forged ahead, urging Darian with him as he disappeared into the battle. Darian took a few moments to catch his breath, bone tired from effort, before he reaffirmed the grip on his sword. He is with us, he thought, and ran after the commissar. But what if we are losing? An explosion rocked the battlement, sudden and ferocious. White light blazed, all-consuming, and Darian felt himself lifted and carried on a surge of heat and force before hitting the ground hard. Ears ringing from the blast, he found himself on hands and knees, a few feet from the wall edge. He had lost his sword and couldn't find Rensaint. The dead surrounded him, dismembered and ripped apart. It must have been a debt charge, something big. It had hit both sides, the explosion's potency enhanced by the close proximity of the combatants. An oily smear of slowly dissipating energy rippled across the refractor field, the only reason he still lived. Groggy, he struggled to his feet and found his sword. Darian reached for the hilt and felt something punch him in the chest. He staggered, reeling from the impact. It had breached the refractor field. The impossibility of that left him numb. A warm sensation was blooming in his chest, his fine armor split like a burst pipe, silver turning pink, then red, as his life spilled from the wound. Still backpedaling, the momentum slowed to dissipate, Darian was only half aware as a sense of dislocation stole upon him. I'm hurt. I'm dying. The wind whipped around him, tossing his cloak. Then came a lightness as of nothing, and the heat rushing through his body grew abruptly cold. Kulkis moved up alongside Schiller, snapping off shots with calm precision. In contrast, the Volponi captain huffed in his armor, beat red and sweating profusely. Shitting hells, I need a damn drink for this. He had since tossed his flask in a fit of pique, the liquor within drained and the empty vessel only reminding him of its redundancy. They were close to breaking through and joining up with Banner Company, attacking the wall's main command section. But it was like a cauldron, and Colchis felt their resolve fraying to its limit. 
he had nearly lost sight of Darian, who was in the thick of it now and trusting to Rensaint and the science to help him see out the battle. A sliver of silver shone still, a reminder of his presence. A sudden blast shook the battlement, felt all the way back to where Colchis and Schiller were trying to force a breach. It was bright, like a dying star, and Colchis turned away to avoid being blinded. He was still blinking back the harsh afterimage when he saw a lonely figure stand up amongst the dead, a silver beacon, its light guttering. The figure reeled, shot, perilously close to the edge, and Colchis looked on aghast as Darian de Veers lurched back and disappeared. The body fell with silent grace, like a kite abruptly starved of wind. Regara watched it numbly from the command line. As it hit the ground, swallowed by the morass of other bodies, the horror of what it meant seized him, and the breath caught in his throat. A cheer rang out, baleful and demoralizing. It reached Regara on the command line. It touched every Imperial soldier fighting and dying on the wall. The fulcrum of the battle shifted on its axis, he almost felt it on the air, as palpable as the growing actinic charge of God's sword. And in that moment, Regara experienced a revelation that left dread in its wake. God's sword had not been abandoned. It had been left behind deliberately for the Imperium to reclaim. Grossman felt none of this, apparently unfazed as Regara turned too late, as imperious as ever as he gave the order that would define his entire career. He uttered it calmly, and across the vox, deaf to the major's shouts, Fire! Cataclysm tore through the imperial line as God's sword ripped itself apart. Chapter 42 Enghart had died in the explosion, caught at the edge of a blast that annihilated the Mechanicus, reducing them to ash. Even the Magos had perished. The Martian contingent of the South Army had diminished drastically in a split second of apocalyptic malfunction. Inquiries would probably outlast the war, for the Mechanicus was nothing if not fastidious in its desire for overanalysis but the conclusion would be the same. God's sword had lain in archenemy hands for over three days. It should have been dismantled and decommissioned, never fired. None had been left unscathed by the weapon's self-immolation. Even the soldiers on the wall, who had only seen it and felt the distant heat prickle their skin, who had turned their eyes at the burning light of a false sun. It had left a mark, a near-fatal wound. It was the unseen wounds that dug deepest. Grossman wore the evidence of his openly, alongside the livid scar across his cheek. Unlike Voke, he did not acknowledge his failure, but rather tried to hide it behind anger and frustration. His gambit had been Godsword, his great strategic coup. It had betrayed him, betrayed them all, and now they had to sift through the aftermath for a means to move forwards. As Grossman pored over the map table, Regara noted the general had not moved or spoken for several minutes. The hololithic light appeared to drain him, a bleak grey cast over a dour and inanimate face. He could have been carved of granite. It had been a few hours since the mass retreat, and the camp was now filled with the sorry remnants of the South Army. Defeated, wounded, a twofold loss. The scale of it was difficult to countenance, and like any man who finds himself out of his depth and having overreached, Matthias Grussmann wanted to look anywhere but at his own incompetence. He slammed a fist down onto the map table, upending his recaf and causing the image to judder out of phase for a few seconds. A mill serve made to clean up the brown puddles streaking down the side of the table, but Grossman's scowl saw them retreat back into the shadows from which they had emerged. He returned to the hololith, brooding, impotency bleeding from every thwarted gesture. Still, he said nothing, 
but just stared at the grainy, tridy image of the carcass border wall, as if in this scrutiny he could wrench forth a plan. Except Grossman had had a plan, and that plan had failed beyond all reason. And so he stared, and the chrono ticked away the seconds in the background. Ren Saint coughed as if to clear his throat, meeting Grossman's hollow gaze as he looked up. Our hold here is tenuous, would you not say, General? Grossman's eyes darted to Barbastian, seeking an ally, but the lieutenant colonel said nothing. He seemed haunted, only half present, as if his mind still wandered in the aftermath of the explosion. Nothing has changed, Grossman uttered coldly to the room. Carcass will be breached. Rigspur will fall. Much has changed, said Regara, meeting Grossman's stone with some steel of his own. We lost almost three thousand of our troops, a third of that during the retreat. Another six hundred or so lie injured, the majority too severely to fight. Regrettable. But this is war. Granted. But surely you must agree, General, that a response is needed? I have a response, answered Grossman boldly. We attack the bastards again and rout them. Rigara frowned, wishing very much that he had a flask of resk and not a mug of recaf in his hand. We cannot simply tilt at the army manning the carcass wall and will it to capitulate? Why not? Are we not the Emperor's hammer? I believe we will overcome. Regara held his temper, the general's blunt and puerile logic, as infuriating as it was misguided. He changed approach. What of morale, then? What of it? Again he bit his tongue and breathed out before answering. The loss of De Vere's cannot be dismissed out of hand. He was... A deg, Major, said Grossman. That is the word you are reaching for. He was a servant and a bastard of noble blood. He is nothing. Regara felt his face redden. The desire to kill this man had never been more present in his thoughts. At least Voke had the decency to shoot himself. Grossman glowered, and for a fleeting moment Regara thought he had spoken his thoughts aloud. I will see to morale, said Rensaint, sensing their enmity. There's strength in martyrdom, if properly channeled. Devotion can be turned to wrath, and that will serve us just as keenly, perhaps more so. The other officers in the room, many keeping their own counsel, nodded at that. Again, Regara had to remind himself of how ruthless a political officer could be no matter what outward face they presented. He liked Owen Rensaint, found accord with much of the man's thinking, but he was still perfectus, and that made him other to an officer of the Militarum. It is settled, then, declared Grossman, as if this somehow amounted to actionable strategy. Barbastian kept his peace, still refusing to meet the general's gaze. There is another matter, said Aramis, the Major had fought at the wall along with Rensaint, and had a few cuts and scrapes. She had been instrumental in the retreat, ensured it stayed orderly despite the onset of panic, as word of de Vere's death had spread down the line like a contagion. Her pallor had greyed since the battle, and dark rings circled her eyes like coal. It was grief and she hid it beneath a mask of soldierly conduct. They all did, to a lesser or greater extent, those that had known Darian. At the southern side of the wall, part of Dagger Company gained the courtyard. Our advance stalled when we encountered an enemy asset, a group of captured Militarum troopers. She paused, trying to find the words. They had been altered, though not physically, not at first, turned into a weapon. It was unperfected and only lasted a short time before the troopers burned out. But if I had to lay a wager... Scylla, said Rensaint, nigh on confirming it. 
I believe it is, sir. I believe this is the weapon the archenemy has been trying to harness, a means of containing and unleashing warp magic. Far-fetched that may sound, but I can think of no better way to define it. Men died in droves with a glance. They simply expired. No wound, nothing to defend against it. They stood and then they fell. I cannot explain it. Our list of challenges mount, said Barbastian at last, earning a barbed glance from Grusman for his tone. Several officers in the room muttered to one another under their breath, Schiller amongst them, drawing their own conclusions. Colchis kept his eyes forwards, but his jaw was a tense line. Bragger held to the stoic silence that had characterized his tenure as commanding officer of the Pardus, whilst Kobal Ombi of the Orek murmured a quiet prayer before making the sign of the Aquila. Regara had reviewed the Major's report. It was sparse on detail, but he saw trauma between the gaps in her account, the things she hadn't written down, perhaps couldn't. Classified as a K-weapon, Scylla had proven ruthlessly effective even in what appeared to be its embryonic state. Respectfully, she said, if the Arcanate army has more of these weapons in its arsenal and they manage to perfect it, then our position in this war is greatly beleaguered. All the more reason to act now, to take the wall, and then Rakespur after it said Grossman, to reassert his authority. We have to renew our attack. The men are at the ragged edge, countered Regara, to thrust them back into the grinder, and with so much yet unknown about this new K-weapon. And what would you have me do, Major? Should we cower? Should I kiss every bruise and scrape until our wounds are salved? Perhaps you would like to do it. Or would you have us depart Agria instead and leave this war to another regiment? I understand the Vitrians are eager to have a turn. We should at least reconnoiter. If this weapon is more widespread and active than we believe, and our attack premature, before we even have a means of bringing down the wall, then our efforts will fail. The cost of that could be disastrous." Your lack of belief in the courage of your countrymen is disconcerting at the least, Regara. It is borderline seditious. Regara ignored the comment, seeing it for the goad it was. I suggest only a respite, an opportunity for a plan that amounts to more than a headlong charge. Have you ever considered that is precisely what's needed? In no historical account has such a tactic ever prevailed, Regara countered. Almost always they have ended in defeat and worse. Then we will make our own history, Major. All other accounts be damned. Grossman inhaled deeply through his nose, puffing up his chest like a vainglorious bird. Two days, he said, his final edict. Two days to lick our wounds, and then we attack again. His gaze swept the room like a search lamp, rooting out potential discontent. But when it reached the place where Barbastian had been standing, the lieutenant colonel had already gone. Evening was drawing like a grey cloak around the camp when Regara left the mess hall. Ordinarily, he would have taken a drink in his quarters, but he had craved the presence of others, even though he had imbibed alone. The low hubbub of voices in quiet conversation, together with the heady fog of smoke and liquor, had helped to lubricate his thoughts. A somber mood reigned, almost funerary, the tables of the mess hall only half full, and occupied by soldiers peering like lugubrious drunkards into the dregs in their glasses or else at their half-supped remains. The men wanted to drink, but found they had little taste for it. An army mourned, and could find no outlet for its grief. The muttered talk, 
a susurrus of maudlin voices, turned to strategic withdrawal and the abandonment of everything they had gained and sacrificed. A bitter pill for sure, like arsenic in the veins. It was with a certain finality, then, that Regara drained his glass, the conus brandy leaving a burn in his throat that made him wince, but wasn't entirely unwelcome. The time has long passed for this, he decided. Men were dying, and the graves would overflow until the dead outnumbered the living if he did not act. I must, although it is abhorrent in its way. He was halfway back to his quarters, on the other side of camp, when he met Colchis coming the other way. Lieutenant, said Regara genially. He noted Colchis had Macaulay with him and appeared agitated. She had that effect, he conceded, adding, Gulliver. Colchis gave a sharp salute, Macaulay a lascivious smile. Regara hadn't the heart to tell her she was charging at the wrong hill. This is fortunate he said. I had a mind to speak with you, Lieutenant. He kept walking. Caught off guard, Kulkis hurried into step behind the Major, an insouciant Macaulay trailing them both. Sir, a matter of some import has been brought to my attention. It concerns the border wall at Carcass. Regara looked askance at him, raising an eyebrow. An opportunity, sir, one we might turn to our advantage— it is our belief that... A crack, said Macaulay, pushing her way in front. She frowned in half-hearted apology. Left to you, Lieutenant, it would be morning by the time you finished. She turned back to Regara. A fissure in the rock. We found it a few moments before your defeat. Our defeat, Macaulay shrugged. We Agrians are just here to dig ditches, Major, isn't that so? Regara let it slide. Tell me about the fisher. She scurried to keep up. Despite his leg, Regara took long strides. It's to the west side of the wall, eighth section, my guess, a natural fault resulting in a weaker foundation. She grinned, pale and savage as a scythe. Those seismic charges pack a punch, eh? The slap to Colchis's shoulder was met with a disconcerting look, but Macaulay carried on undeterred. If I can get my hands on something really big, her eyes widened, before winking at the major, who stoically ignored the gesture. A debt charge, maybe two, maybe three, and... She whispered a long, drawn-out kaboom, whilst miming a large explosion with her hands. That, combined with a large enough seismic charge, should be enough. A bomb that size? They'll see it coming. How do you propose to get it to the wall, let alone prime it? A night attack with a small group could slip by unnoticed. Just enough to carry the bomb. Maybe a few to safeguard it also. No more than a handful of men, said Colchis trying and failing to reassert his position of authority in the conversation. And we will need a distraction, something to draw their attention, added the Gulliver. A damn loud one. Regara paused in sight of his quarters, considering all he had heard. Take what you need on my authority. Make every preparation. Colchis saluted about to go with Macaulay when the Major's voice chimed. Not you, Lieutenant. I have need of you with me. Chapter 43 The air smelled faintly of musk and cinnamon, but deadened the moment Regara activated the privacy field. It was a small, disc-shaped device that inhibited vox thieves and other listening equipment, softening all noise within its shallow area of effect. Colchis felt his teeth itch, grimacing at the low throbbing in his skull. Takes a little getting used to, but what I'm about to say must not be overheard, said Regara, pulling a scroll tube from a drawer in his desk. The lumens were low, 
the soft light playing across wooden furnishings and the rows of books. A phonogram sealed behind its protective case sat in one corner, a gadulka propped against it. What is this about, sir? asked Colchis. Do you trust me, Armand? Colchis felt a twinge of apprehension at the use of his given name, but answered, Utterly. Good. Then I shall say it plainly, and ask only that you listen. Colchis nodded. Matthias Grussman is unfit to lead this army. And there it was. Regara had said aloud what most of the other officers were thinking. His mistakes have cost us dearly, inflicted needless death and suffering. He is about to make another, a grievous one. I cannot allow this. I cannot let Volponi men and women die for the sake of that man's vainglory. He gently pushed the scroll tube across the desk. The wax seal at its join was purely aesthetic, a concession to the arcane. It would not open without specific biometric parameters first being met. A sealed letter, Regara explained needlessly. It must reach Orator de Vere's at Lanchetech and only him. Is he still alive, sir? I damned well hope so. This will end badly if he is not. I ask his backing for what must come next. No, he lives. If anyone asks, the courier need only say it is notification of the death of his son. A brief silence fell at the mention of Darian. Though Colchis wasn't his commanding officer, he could not help but feel partly responsible for what had happened. He saw in Regara's eyes that the Major felt the same way. I will see it done, sir. Not you, Lieutenant. That will raise questions. Use a mill serve, preferably one you trust. I need you to find Barbastian and Aramis. Bring them here, but do it quietly. Colchis frowned as the pieces fell into place, though the picture they suggested disturbed him. Sir, forgive the impertinence, but it appears as if... I am planning a mutiny? That is precisely what I am doing. Speak now if you have any objection, and know that I will not hold it against you. A pistol appeared in the Major's hand, aimed at the lieutenant. But... That I'll also have to confine you to these quarters until such a time as you can be released. Colchis heard faint movement behind him and saw Balis, the Major's manservant, unarmed but impeding his escape. It cannot continue, Armand, this profligacy and callousness. Another voke would be disastrous. Colchis had to moisten his lips before he said, what do you mean to do? Whatever I have to. A pause. An ill feeling forced its way into the lieutenant's gut. He knew what Regara proposed was necessary, but the mendacity, the plotting, it sat poorly, but there was no decision to make. Then what else must I do? Regara lowered the pistol, with a small gesture to Balis, who went back to his duties. Nothing more than I have asked for now. If this is to be a bloodless act, then I will need other officers who share my view on side. What about the Prefectus? This is a militarum matter. I don't believe Ren Saint will interfere. Then I should go at once. Quietly, Armand. Much depends on this. Colchis nodded, took the scroll, and left. Outside, Kulkis had walked only a short way from Regara's quarters before a voice stopped him cold. It took him long enough. Kulkis turned, feigning confusion as he came face to face with Bertram Fink. What are you talking about? He still hadn't put out of his mind what he had found in Fink's room, the mysterious box and its even more mysterious contents. A part of him greatly wanted to question the other lieutenant about it, but that would mean admitting to his illicit search, and Kulkis had no desire to let Fink have any leverage over him. You don't have to say it out loud. I know. A chill ran through Kulkis's bones, but he maintained his composure. Are you following me, Fink? Sometimes. Alarming as that revelation was, Colchis needed to be on his way and made to move past him. Stand aside. 
I haven't time for games, Fenk moved quicker, barring the other lieutenant's path. Will he kill him, he asked, and Kulkis felt his own heart stop in his chest. He caught a breath, and in a quiet voice said, I don't know. Then you'll need help. Better that you forget all about it. Armand, you are entirely too honorable for subterfuge. Believe me, this is something I know. I am an expert at moving around unnoticed. Kolka's expression turned sour. You can trust me in this. I do not trust you, Bertram, and that is the problem, he sighed, regretting his next words before they had left his lips. But it appears I have little choice. This was already getting out of hand, but nothing could be done about that now. Fenk smiled that adder's smile, the kind a predator gives to its prey. That's the spirit. I need Barbastian and Aramis, Fenk nodded, understanding immediately. I know where to find them. He grinned, eyes lightless and cold, as he produced a silver coin. Shall we flip, for who gets the pretty one? Aramis stood head bowed, hands clasped at her waist. A prayer eluded her, and she exhaled in frustrated silence, the air making phantoms of her breath. She had met Schiller coming the other way as she entered, and the man had not even acknowledged her presence, his hatred a cold and impotent thing that would see no satisfaction. He might be a bastard, she had reflected, but at least he pays his respects to the dead. Darian de Viers lay on the mortuarium slab, cold and unmoving. He looked peaceful in repose, a gilded laurel wreath placed about his head like a crown. It had become a shrine, his resting place. Soldiers had left tokens, a polished bullet, a tiny effigy of the emperor, a pile of coins, a strip of ribbon. It all meant something, she supposed, though Aramis had brought no offering herself. She had barely known him, but that didn't stop her feeling sorry for the way his life had ended. As with all beacons, he had eventually been snuffed out, and in his wake, only darkness. Though it wasn't the hero she had come to see, but a friend. David Hennessy had no laurel nor hoard of offerings. He had a veil, and the slab upon which he lay. It did not look like him. The dead rarely do. A shell remained, a twisted and broken shell that had known pain and fear before it died. So quick, she hadn't even realized until... Aramis made a fist, her jaw clenched. Then, taking a solitary coin from her pocket, she placed it reverently on the dead man's chest and quietly turned to leave the room. Only belatedly did she realize she wasn't alone. What are you doing here, Lieutenant? Tell me, Major, said Fenk, as he pulled away from the wall where he had been leaning. How do you feel about rebellion? The place looked quiet and Kolkis wondered if Fenk had been mistaken when he said the lieutenant colonel was here. He tried not to overthink how the other lieutenant knew this, or why he kept such close watch on the officers in the camp, though Kolkis suspected Fenk watched everyone. It was hard to shake the unease plaguing him about his suspicions, but without proof they were just that. He knew the other lieutenant had saved his life against the Cossacks, and Fenk might be many things, but a liar was not one of them. Though he didn't trust him, he did believe Fenk would keep his promise, and that would have to suffice. Regara's words tumbled through his mind, an act of treason to prevent a greater one. Sometimes what is right hides behind what is necessary. It might be unpalatable, even uncomfortable, but it didn't change that it had to be done. Turbulent seas lay ahead, with Colchis a sailor in a skiff facing off against a coming storm. All he need do was not drown. As for the earlier part of Regara's instructions, Colchis had left the scroll with a millserve called Trigir, who he knew to be discreet, 
and then made straight for the civilian chapel at the outskirts of camp. It was a plain affair, designated for the baggage train hangers-on and the mill serves, a prefab stone blockhouse with an imperial eagle engraved in the keystone above the arch. Candles flickered within, an illusion, for Colchis heard the hum of the electro-sconces that kept the lights burning. Two rows of ordinary wooden pews ran either side of the nave and led to a chancel where an altar stood, crested by a bronze statue of the emperor as the healer, his hand upraised as if to bless the faithful. The chapel was unoccupied, but for a single figure who knelt head against the pew in front of them as if in prayer. Colchis stepped quietly down the main aisle, aware of the sanctity of this place, regardless of how infrequently it saw use, and keen to leave the man's solitude undisturbed for as long as possible. Only when he drew closer did Colchis start to realize something was wrong. It was the odd cant to Barbastian's body, almost as if he had been propped against the pew and the stillness of his form. A light flare in one of the sconces hissed across the chapel and Colchis almost shouted in alarm. His heart quickened when he saw the wet shine to the clutched rosarius in Barbastian's hands. They had been pressed together in the sign of the Aquila, and far from being closed in prayer, the lieutenant colonel's dead eyes stared emptily at the blood pooling around his knees. It had left a stain down his jacket and shirt, the high collar disheveled, and underneath his throat had been slit. A knife lay to hand, stained with blood. Holy throne! That's when Colchis heard the footsteps enter the chapel behind him. He turned sharply and met the angry face of Isaac Schiller. What are you doing here, Armand? I might ask the same of you, sir. Schiller scowled, irascible from all the resk he had evidently imbibed trying to find a bloody drink. In a civilian chapel? Colchis was flailing. He needed to get rid of Schiller. Fenk was right. He was bad at subterfuge. Maybe I was looking for something else. What's it got to do with you, Lieutenant, where I choose to? His bleary gaze drifted over to Barbastian, and he drew his sidearm. What is this? Colchis raised his hands. I found him this way. Shitting saints, his throat, said Schiller. Did he kill himself? I don't know. It looks that way. I only just arrived myself. Schiller eyed him curiously. Why didn't you say something? You surprised me. Now can I put my hands down? Schiller lowered and holstered the pistol. Sorry, Armand, he said and came over to where Colchis was standing. He regarded Barbastian, the man obviously dead. God, Emperor, the great officers are committing suicide. We'll have none left by the time the war's over. Colchis murmured a quick prayer as he knelt down by the body. The skin still felt warm to the touch. Barbastian hadn't been dead long, but the chapel was empty, and he had seen no one leave. Did you see anyone outside, Isaac? Anyone watching the chapel? Schiller shook his head, staring at the gaping wound in Barbastian's neck. Poor bastard, he said, and licked his lips in need of a drink. For once, Kulkis could relate. Leaning closer, careful to stay out of the slowly widening blood pool, he noticed something catch the light, stashed under the pew in front, and reached for it. Something... Down here, Colchis's hand came out cradling a wax cylinder that shone dully in the flickering candlelight. Schiller's brow furrowed. What is that? It's for a phonogram, I think. Used to record speech, music. I've seen Regara use one. He turned his head to face the captain. Evidently, Barbastian did too. Why would he hide something like that? That's a good question. Colchis looked around, found the vox emitters either side of the chancel embedded in the mouths of two stone cherubim. 
They use it to auto-cast hymns for the digs, said Schiller, following the lieutenant's lead, as Colchis mounted the narrow stage and began searching for the machine slaved to the emitters. They found it quickly. Here, uttered Schiller, and after a few moments of trial and error, managed to get the unit open and insert the cylinder. It worked on the same principle as a phonogram, but was enclosed, encased behind plastic. Dead air persisted for a few seconds as the cylinder turned, then the needle found the groove in the wax. It began innocently enough, with the mournful strains of a gadulka, and then the music stopped abruptly and was replaced by voices, Matthias Grussmann's amongst them. Both men listened in silence, scarcely breathing until it was over. The dead air returned, compounded by the stillness of the chapel, until Kulkis remembered to move and turned off the machine. Schiller stared, first at the machine and then at Kulkis, who saw the slow inertia of cogs feeding into cogs in his mind. We have to notify the prefectus, he said, sobering quickly. He reached for the cylinder, but Kulkis, having taken it from the machine, held on to it. Now, lieutenant, urged Schiller. What about Regara? What about him? This recording must be heard by the Lord Commissar immediately. He's the commanding officer of the 50th Isaac, and Philip Barbastian was his friend. Schiller shrugged it off. Do whatever you need to. Have a couple from the ranks to watch the chapel if you must, but I'll have that cylinder. Colchis handed it over, numbness spreading throughout his body as everything began to unravel. Chapter 44 They were waiting for him when he returned to Regara's quarters. Colchis had needed to make a stop on the way to enlist Grice to guard the chapel. He didn't tell him why, but gave him strict orders not to enter. No one but he or Schiller was to be granted admittance. Grice looked confused, but behaved like a good sergeant and went to rustle up some help before he headed to the chapel. The memory of it played through Colchis's mind as he saw Aramis sitting in a chair and conversing with the major. Fenk leaning against the wall, half lost in shadow like a damn wraith. Colchis almost didn't see him. If Regara thought anything about Fenk's presence and his unlooked-for involvement, he didn't show it. Armand, the major began, an edge of concern in his voice. You're late, though your accomplice vouched for you, he added mildly, glancing towards Fenk. Something in Colchis's face must have betrayed him, because Regara's demeanor changed as soon as he saw it. Aramis saw it, too. What is it? What's happened? she asked. Regara said nothing, but his expression grew taut, like a stretched mask. He barely moved. There is a problem, said Colchis. I sincerely hope we aren't about to get arrested by the prefectors, said Fink, who had stopped leaning against the wall to pay attention. Colchis met Regara's hard stare and felt the weight of it like a pardus tank. It is a delicate matter. These are all delicate matters, Lieutenant, snapped Aramis, losing patience. Out with it! Regara spoke up, uttering the question on everyone's mind, but that no one had the courage to ask until that moment. Where is Lieutenant Colonel Barbastian? Colchis fought the urge to lower his gaze. He owed Regara that at least. I am sincerely sorry, sir. Lieutenant Colonel Barbastian is dead. Stunned silence filled the room, made heavier by the leaden privacy field. Aramis cursed under her breath. She stood and started to pace. Fenk did and said nothing, a statue in the half-darkness. Regara's jaw stiffened, his face having turned to stone and impossible to read. How did he die? I only found his body, Colchis explained. His throat had been slit. A nerve trembled in Regara's cheek, but still he didn't react. It appeared... Colchis swallowed back the dryness in his throat. It looked like suicide, sir. 
Philip Barbastian would never kill himself, Regara declared matter-of-factly, as if he was stating that ice was cold. Schiller had gone to fetch the prefectus. Aramis stopped pacing at that, her face a barely contained grimace of anger. How is Schiller involved? He's not, Colchis explained. At least, he wasn't. He arrived a few moments after I did. Barbastian was already dead. Regara nodded as if absorbing nothing more unusual than a field report. You should all leave, return to your quarters, say nothing of this. Aramis shook her head, her frustration boiling over. That's it? Grussman isn't fit to lead a marching band. His recklessness has cost countless lives. You said so yourself, Major. I am here at your request. I said say nothing. Regara snapped, his voice like a whip crack that stung the air. Regaining his composure, he added more quietly, It's over. Without Barbastian, we're done. Aramis swore loudly, then apologized. Fenk was already halfway to the door when Kulkis uttered, There is something else. Schiller waited outside to be granted admittance, then came at Rensaint's call. Enter, the Lord Commissar was glistening with sweat, and dressed down in sparring apparel, a simple pair of charcoal grey fatigues and a dove grey vest. A millserve was setting a well-scarred cuirass of flak armour onto a mannequin in one corner of the room. Rensain's foils and other blades stood next to it, arranged carefully in a black lacquered weapons rack. Do you spar, Captain? he asked idly busying himself with pulling off a pair of leather gloves. He sat them on the desk and reached for the wine that the mill serve had dutifully provided. There was something vaguely familiar about her, a small slip of a thing, waif-like and feeble. She barely met Schiller's gaze, which the captain thought was most assuredly for the best. For her. He only liked a mill serve to acknowledge him when he wanted something, at all other times they should be beneath his notice, as unremarkable and silent as a pauper's grave. On occasion, Schiller lied, or at least he had not done so in many years, content for war to keep him as lean as he needed to be, though even he admitted he had lost a step or two. The dead weighed on him, despite all of his caustic bluster. He hated Voak for the callous disregard of the soldiers under his command. Good, honest Volponi men of noble blood. They deserved better. It made what he would have to say next easier. I am here on a serious matter, he said. Ren Saint looked up from unlacing his boots. The mill serve had begun to towel off his body, but shrunk into the shadows at his slightest gesture. Ominous. Schiller's gaze followed the girl. It is of the utmost importance and secrecy. Ren Saint nodded, understanding. You may leave us, he uttered. Thank you, Lena. The girl bowed sharply before departing. What is this concerning, Captain? Schiller waited until he was sure the two men were alone, and then produced the cylinder. I have evidence of conspiracy. Ren Saint set down his wine. Conspiracy to do what, Captain? Murder, Lord Commissar, and it is already done. Ren Saint regarded the proffered cylinder in Schiller's hand. I have something here that can play that if your intent is for me to hear it. He gestured to the phonogram he kept on his desk. Major Regara recommended one to me, and I confess that I have found it pleasantly diverting. There is a secondary matter. Oh? Schiller took a breath, moistening his bone-dry lips. He yearned for a drink, something to take the edge off. Ren Saint must have seen him eyeing the wine. Take a cup if it'll hasten this moment, Captain. He did and drained it, then poured himself another, which he sipped more slowly. Philip Barbastian is dead, he said boldly, slain by his own hand. Rensaint gave away no emotion. And this, 
he nodded to the cylinder. The two matters are related. Then you had best play it, Captain. The recording began with Barbastian's playing, a lilting threnody giving way all too suddenly to the scratchy voices of three Volponi officers. It is for the greater good we must do this. That was Grossman, his bullish tone unmistakable. Rensaint looked up at Schiller, but the captain said nothing. You are talking about murder, Matthias. We have already been through this. He is a deg, Philip. Nothing to us. Must a man of breeding stop to think before he shoots a stray dog? He is the blood of Orator Donesk de Viers. A bastard, one of many, we all know de Viers' reputation. A third voice intruded, voicing his agreement but otherwise saying little of import. Rensaint gave him a questioning glance. Major Enghard, Schiller explained, East Army Group, to which the Lord Commissar nodded as he listened on, and also a talisman to our troops. There was a slight pause, as if Barbastian was seeking outside counsel. This cannot be the only way. You've seen the border wall, Philip. It is almost impregnable. The pact will fight like hellions to hold it, even with God's sword at our backs. That was Enghart again, his manner as oleaginous as his bombast. A toadying career soldier, determined to grease his way up the ranks. Schiller had known many such men and despised them all. Our faith must match their fanaticism, Grossman again. So you would make a martyr? Barbastian's disgust was almost tangible, although for the other officers or himself it was difficult to discern. I would make him into whatever he needs to be to win us this war. A boy cannot lead this army to victory. He dies at Carcass, Philip, and we will ride his sacrifice all the way to Rixburg. I need only your sanction to move forwards. Enghart has already pledged his. It is the Emperor's will, Philip. None are greater than it. Even you? Even me. The smile in Grossman's voice suggested he wasn't being entirely truthful. What choice have I? None, Philip, none. Here Grossman took on a darker tone. Barbastian let out a shuddering breath. God Emperor, forgive us. A low purr of activation hummed across the recording, only partly audible a device of some kind, though Schiller still could not place it. You are serving your Imperium this day, Philip. Tell me one thing, Matthias. Now I am bound to your devil's bargain. Name it. Once you have unleashed it, can you bring it to heel? Let me worry about that. There the recording ended, the cylinder having reached its terminus. Ren Saint listened without comment, his face studiedly neutral. Is that all of it? Schiller nodded. Who else has heard this? Only myself and Lieutenant Kolkis. He is Regara's man, isn't he? Schiller confirmed it. He has already gone to tell the Major. He and Barbastian were... Old friends, yes, I am aware... Rensaint stared pensively for a moment. Schiller, this is disturbing news. I assume I was right bringing this to you, Lord Commissar? Rensaint nodded, but his mind was already elsewhere. Speak to no one of this, Captain. No one. The door loomed like a gravestone, heavy with the weight of what lay beyond. Grice and Hanmar guarded the exterior, but possessed enough good sense not to impede Regara as he had approached the chapel. Both bowed their heads out of respect, Hanmar making the aquila across his breast, but Regara paid them little heed. His attention was on the door, knowing that once he crossed its threshold, nothing would be the same. His heart crashed in his chest like an erratic parade drum, and his breath snagged in his throat, swelling into a tumor of grief so large it threatened to choke him. Regara betrayed none of this. 
his stern mask intact, as he walked up to the door, pausing only for a second, and then went inside. At the soft thud of the door finding its frame, he was alone with Barbastian. Kneeling before a chapel pew, his old friend looked still and somehow bled of all his color, though the savage cut across his throat added a swathe of crimson. The blood had begun to darken in the air, reduced to a ruddy mark that ran the length of Barbastian's front, his shirt and jacket irreparably stained. Crouching down, afraid at first to touch him, Regara did his best to straighten the unkempt collar. Using a cloth and bowl of rose petal water, meant for penitents to wash their hands after confession, he gently dabbed at the bloodstain, the sheer length and extent of it abhorrent for reasons he could not articulate, even to himself. He worked carefully and slowly, and although it could never be cleansed completely, it looked better than it had. As he smoothed the shirt and jacket, he felt something tucked away in the inside pocket. His heart convulsed when he saw it was a note addressed to him. Dear Vasquez, please do not think ill of me for this, and let it be a matter of record that I always did love your wonderful music. Sincerely, your friend, Philip. Such an incongruous message, and not one that read like a suicide note. But Regara had no capacity for analysis in that moment. A cry rose up within him, a surge of emotion so raw that he had to clench his fists so that only its strangled remnants escaped his throat. Hot tears threatened and were quickly mastered, but the hollow inside him would be much harder to overcome. He rose unsteadily, reaching for his cane, though he didn't really need it. The leg worked fine. He just hid behind that cane, a metaphorical crutch as well as a literal one. Through the haze of his agony, as he stared down at the body, the sight of it somehow askew with reality, Regara knew one thing for certain. Philip Barbastian had not killed himself. He had been murdered. Chapter 45 After meeting with Rensaint, Schiller decided he was in no mood for company and eschewed the native stills and camp hostelries. His mind lingered on Barbastian like a vid picter stuck on freeze frame. No matter how hard he tried to banish the image of the yawning red chasm of the man's throat, it would not leave him. It felt wrong. Not the act itself, though Schiller had no truck with suicide, because he saw it as weakness. No, plenty of men suffering the rigors of a long war had taken their own lives. Brandreth, he could believe. That despicable worm had blood as thin as pale piss. The fact he had chosen to off himself dangling from some half-blasted stump at the edge of Lotton came as little surprise. That he hadn't done it sooner was the genuine revelation. But Philip Barbastian. The man spent overlong preening and owned more shirts and cloaks than the guard had lasguns. But he was no coward. So to see him like that, opened up by his own hand and spilling out all over the chapel floor, sent a tremor of unease through Schiller. A good officer slain, Another senseless loss to add to the multitudes. Schiller dragged off his officer's cap as he entered his own quarters, exhausted and in need of a drink. It was modest compared to Rensaint's accommodations, but had its comforts and spoke to the wealth of his bloodline and standing. Fine as it was, it could not distract from his current predicament. All manner of shit was about to hit the turbo fan, Grussman at the heart of it. Schiller had thought to ally himself with the general and perhaps find favor and advancement. That ended in the chapel, shattered in a few minutes of scratchy audio recording. A confession no man, save Barbastian himself, 
knew they were making. What exactly the lieutenant colonel had been pressed into remained elusive for now. Schiller had no doubt that Rensaint would find the root of it. Barbastian's exact words returned to him, the dead man's voice, as well as his deathly countenance, impossible to excise. Once you have unleashed it. Schiller pondered that as he slumped into a plush chair that cushioned his back and reached for a decanter. The vresque sloshed around, half gone already, and the captain saw his face reflected in the faceted glass. He was a shambles, worse than he had thought, not only disheveled and in need of a change of clothes, but unshaven and unkempt. He poured himself a drink. Dig, he called loudly, summoning whatever Millserve currently attended to him. A young girl stepped into view, having pressed the captain's spare uniforms and polished his boots. Or at least she appeared as if she had been at her labours. There was something familiar about her. But Schiller barely acknowledged the Millserves unless he was shouting at them, and even then only fleetingly. Warm a bowl of water, he told her. Find cream and my razor. I am in need of a shave. He leaned back in the chair. His thoughts adrift like motes of dust in still air. And after a few minutes, the girl returned with all the items Schiller had requested. A towel was wrapped around his neck and upper chest. Then the gentle splash of water as the blade was washed the light fragrance of the cream as the girl lathered it. Nice and close, you hear me? he said, taking a long pull from his glass. A flash of light caught Schiller's eye briefly, the lumens striking the unsheathed blade of the razor. Of course, sir, said the girl, and as the blade touched his throat, Schiller remembered where he knew her from. Fenk roamed the camp periphery, a welter of thoughts running through his head like little firecrackers.